a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Insightful Podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow. From politics and world news to media and technology, we discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow. This is episode nine, Entertainment a la Carte. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my co-host, Sam Whalen. Hi, everyone. How you doing today, Sam? I'm doing all right. How you doing? Doing all right. So aside for the landscapers that we're dealing with here, but that's okay. <laughs> Uh, so this week we decided to sort of ratchet it down a few notches. We've been having a last couple of podcasts we've done. We've been doing some pretty heavy hitting, timely subjects. And with the uh, election not too far away, uh, we knew we were probably going to be doing another heavy hitting one to cover that. So this week we're going to do something a little more lighthearted, uh, a little more fun and a little less dipped in controversy i guess i could say yeah so if you're filling out your bingo cards about how we're going to get to the end of the world by the end of this i don't know if you're going to win this time <laughs> uh, but we'll yeah, see. hopefully we won't have doom and gloom by the end of the show like we usually do uh so this week we're talking entertainment a la carte and when i say that there has been a desire by consumers for a very long time now to have entertainment the way they want it at their fingertips when they want it. We've had different false starts, different incarnations, different hopes that we've seen through the industry. So today we're going to take a look at sort of what the history of what we've had, uh, what we've got today, and where we think we're going to be going in the future as far as what our command over our entertainment is going to be. Before we do that, though, I did want to invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can catch us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and now on Amazon. So you can convince your Echo devices to listen to our podcasts. I would also invite folks to reach out to us, tell us if we're doing a good job, what you'd like us to talk about. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can catch high-res versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insightsintothings. We do stream six days a week, this week seven days a week, on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insightsintothings. You can catch our audio versions of the podcast at podcast.insightsintotomorrow.com. You can reach out to us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insightsintothingspodcast. Or you can get links to all of our social media on our website at insightsintothings.com. Ready to get into it? Yes. All right. <laughs> So 
So first up, I just wanted to sort of uh, kind of summarize what we look, what we're looking at when it comes to entertainment here, uh, and how important entertainment is in the home. But before we do that, let me ask you, Sam, what aspects of entertainment are important to you? Do you listen to music? Do you stream videos? Do you watch movies? What's your What's your prescription for your entertainment? Um, I'd say I mostly watch, uh, I watch a lot of YouTube. Like I follow a lot of channels and watch content on there. Um, and then from there, it's probably like Netflix. Um, I don't really watch live TV, TV at all anymore, unless it's like a football game or something. And even then I'm only watching 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so for me, it's definitely mostly YouTube, um, podcasts, like things on Stitcher. I listen to a lot of things on there. Um, and, uh, yeah, Netflix, they're like the big three for me. So what, what about radio? I know, you know, with the, the college and everything that, uh, you have, you know, you are, you have a presence on broadcast radio. Do you listen to broadcast radio yourself much? Um, if I'm in the car, like on the car road over here, I definitely listen to it. Like I don't, I don't have Bluetooth in the car or anything like that. I'll put on, you know, sports talk radio or, or, uh, MMR or something like that. Um, other than that, I don't really just tune on the radio just for fun. Um, like in the mornings when I'm getting ready, I'm usually listening to a podcast. It's not so much the radio. Um, when I was younger, I used to do that a lot until I got into podcasts. Um, sometimes, you know, if I'm taking a shower, I'll put the radio on. Um, but overall, I'd say not really that often. It's mostly in the car. Okay. Yeah. And and how about movies? Do you do you have do you own DVDs or Blu-rays or do you stream most of your movies today? I'm mostly streaming. I mean, I have, I'd say probably like 30 to 40, maybe Blu-rays and a couple, you know, 4Ks and things, things like that. Movies that I really want to have, you know, the physical copy of movies that I are special to me or movies that I just like a lot. Um, or movies that I got on sale <laughs> for right. Blu-rays because Amazon does Blu-ray sales all the time. Um, so things like that. I don't have like a, like I wouldn't say my Blu-ray collection is like my pride and joy. Um, but it's mostly just to have those physical copies just in case, you know, I can't get the Lord of the Rings on, you know, Netflix because they take it off all the time or something like that. Right, right. So it, it sounds like a, a good chunk of what you do is, is some of the more modern technologies yep. then. Mm -hmm. What about when you listen to radio, do you, is it talk shows you listen to? Is it music that you listen to? Or you listen to the sports radio? Yeah, it's mostly, I mostly do sports talk. You know, 94.1 for our local area. That's like the sports. And then there's 97.5 too. I'll alternate between those. Um, I don't really listen to music that much. I don't know. Something about hearing people talk and discuss. I just like to listen to that more than, you know, a song I can pull up on well, my phone. you know, as a podcaster, that's exactly what I like to hear. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's nice to not hear my own voice. You know, it's nice to hear other people talk for a while. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, we've had various forums and, and we're going to talk about the history of some of these forums uh, in a little bit there. But obviously, we, we, our entertainment started out as purely live entertainment. If you went, you know, back in the 1800s and in the beginning of the 1900s, if you wanted to be entertained, you either produced music or entertainment at home or you went to go see it somewhere. Uh, radio finally allowed us to bring it in the house. Then we moved from that naturally almost, you know, through my uh, evolution through to TV then we started to have home entertainment systems, VCRs, DVDs, and so forth, um, followed eventually by streaming. But it was basically force-fed to you. So when you would listen to the radio, you would have a schedule of things that you would listen to. And if you missed your show, you missed it, right? So we started getting specialized radio stations. That's where we get the sports talk radio. Yeah, formats. Yeah, you get your specialized formats. I remember, you know, as a kid back in the 70s, when you would listen to the radio, you would hear every genre of music on, on a radio station. You didn't even have specialized target audiences back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. You didn't start getting that until mid-80s, late-80s. And TV channels started doing the same thing. You know, I, I, I'm going to sound like my father at this point, but, you know, going back to when I was a kid, we didn't have cable. We had broadcast television. You had three, six, and 10 in our area, CBS, ABC, and NBC. And, uh, if you were lucky, you'd get a PBS station, but outside of that, you know, that was what your entertainment was. We've come a long way since then. Yeah. We've gone the complete opposite way now. Now people can have access to everything, which I think a lot of people realize is too much. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. 
And what happened was when we got to the point where there were certain things we wanted to watch, uh, the advent of the VCR kind of gave us that option where you could set your VCR. If you were, you know, a rocket scientist, you could figure out how to program your VCR to actually record on a timer, assuming the power didn't go out and it lost its time. (laughs) You know, there was a a lot of factors involved in getting this technology to work at the time. Um, So you would record your programs and then watch them after after the fact, you didn't have streaming, you didn't have DVRs even at the time. Yeah, and I think something that I'm sure we'll, I don't want to get too far in uh, ahead of ourselves, but one of the things we'll probably talk about is how, as a as a society, we've kind of, we all, like, when it was the radio, everybody would gather around and listen to the radio at the same time, all around the world. So you'd all listen to, you know, something at 8 p.m. on a Thursday, every week. Everybody would do that. But then as we kind of went further and further down the timeline viewing experiences became more individualized yeah. where now it's not everybody tunes in Sunday to watch something. I mean, you still get that with like sports, but for things like, like game of Thrones, right? I mean, that was kind of the last big thing that everybody would tune in and watch except for you know, things like reality shows, like the bachelor and things like that. Those are usually still watched live, but big entertainment moments like that are, getting more and more rare as you know people can watch and stream whatever they want whenever they want yeah and it's it's a very intimate experience mm-hmm. where you get to you get to build your entertainment yeah. consumption experience yourself and we didn't start being able to do that until we got technology like the VCR yep uh, outside of that it was you were watching stuff on a schedule we got smart cable at some point in time in the 90s where you started getting video on demand where you were able to go in through your cable box and say, all right, I want to watch a movie now, whatever time it is, and they would charge you for that and and they would send you a bill for the pay-per-view experience. So there's been a significant evolution and, and a lot of that's been driven by the technology. Nowadays, we have streaming and, mm-hmm. and everything is streaming now. This podcast is streaming. <laughs> uh, television streams. You have you have television networks, news networks that have no presence whatsoever on broadcast television. They stream entirely over the Internet. So it's a it's a almost a paradigm shift in how we get our entertainment and our information these days. So that's sort of the primer of how we want to approach this. We're going to come back after a quick break and we're going to talk about the history of some of these things. And we'll we'll look at some of the milestones and see just how far we've come from a technology standpoint. We'll be right back. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. We're talking entertainment a la carte today. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and Sam Whalen is with me today. So over the air, you know, for, for the longest time, broadcast radio and television was a community service. All the way back starting in 1926 when NBC first started the first national broadcast. It's not quite that simple anymore, is it? It's It's not... 
free open over the air anymore, is it? No, I mean, back then, even before the first national radio network, and I only know this because I took a class on this last uh, semester, so, you know, I got to make that education worth it. <laughs> um, it was only, there were two channels, um, AM, and one was for crops and weather reports, and the other was entertainment, which was mostly music and, like, Bible verses. So that was what radio was mostly for, and it was localized because there wasn't any kind of national network. So it was basically anybody could do it, and you could broadcast it anywhere. Um, but then when you had NBC come along, it sort of became that network and nowadays it's i mean it's so far it's still local in a sense because you'll have local stations but for most of them like um we have a local rock station here wmmr and you can tune to that dial 93.3 but also they have a streaming app right? right so they get all the time people all across the world tuning in and listening and you know they they archive their morning shows and you can tune in live and listen to their music so it's it's not you don't need a radio to listen to the radio anymore, basically. Exactly. And in, in fact, uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned that cell phones all have radio receivers on them. Mm -hmm. Most people don't realize that there are apps that you can get that will tap into the radio antenna on your phone and allow you to do it. And you know, we we'd had a hurricane come through a couple of years back and uh, we lost power. So we didn't have any battery powered radios. So we actually wound up downloading the app because we still had cellular coverage and we had an app that allowed us to get uh, weather radios basically built into our phone. So broadcast radio is still going very strongly out there. But it doesn't give us that personalization that I think we're looking for. Uh, a lot of radio stations that do stream, they'll stream multiple streams. And you can basically pick the streams that you want, pick the channels that you want. Because a lot of our radio networks are multi-format network. So you might have Clear Channel being one of the network. And that network may have 50 different radio stations across the country, but you don't have over-the-air rights to, to get most of those because of the limitations of the technology. But they'll stream all of those on their website. So you can literally listen to a radio station from Ohio or California or whatever. So technology has given us that ability to choose at this point in time. And, and as technology has evolved, you know, we've gone from AM to FM where we can broadcast further high fidelity and so forth. What do you think about satellite radio? Satellite radio XM first introduced satellite radio in early 2000s. The biggest deal that they probably ever had was when they brought in Howard, Howard Stern. Stern. How do you think that impact has had? Because it's subscription-based. Mm. It's not free. Right. Um, and most cars today, if you buy a new car, have an XM radio built into it. Do you think satellite radio g gives you that, that customization of your entertainment choice? I think it's definitely, it was, at the time, it was definitely a precursor to what we ended up seeing with things like Netflix and Hulu and things like that, just for radio. And especially with Howard Stern, because he wasn't censored, that was like the big appeal of it. But what a lot of people forget is before Howard Stern went to satellite, he was against it, like vehemently. He was all about terrestrial radio. But then when his fines like almost bankrupted his station, you know, he, he had really no choice. Um, but yeah, I definitely think it was a, it was a kind of a precursor and you can customize it to an extent, but I think that subscription sort of is kind of a barrier to entry to a lot of people. It's a barrier to entry to me because not only did I not want to pay the subscription, but I also don't have a radio that can use it. You know, I got it for free a little while, like a trial a while yeah. back and I was using it on my phone. But if I'm going to use my phone to listen to something, I'm probably just going to listen to a podcast. So, and without having it in a car, you know, there's that entry there. So if you're buying a new car and you get it for free for three months or, you know, included, I can definitely see you using it. Um, not to mention that you do have a lot of great personalities and great stations on satellite radio that there's most likely something for everybody. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, when I bought my new car, it, it came with that three months of XM free. And the problem that I had with that is the same problem that I have with cable television today. And we'll get into a little bit more. Yeah, it, it's 180 channels yep. and how do I find what I want to listen to? Uh, it was an overwhelming experience to have that much choice. And it's kind of ironic because it's that choice that we've demanded 
for years now, you know, I want the ability to make my entertainment selections the way that I want. And television's kind of evolved the same way that radio did. You know, it started out in its infancy. You had very few stations that you could see anything with, and everything was over the air. And then, you know, they came to the point where you were able to make money off of it. And most most contracts, most money that you get out of television, at least in the early days, was all advertising. Whereas you get into the cable uh, model and you you get into more of a subscription type model. But, you know, television was first introduced in the early 20s at the World's Fair. And then in 31, by 1931, you had 40,000 televisions in the United States. You had two networks transmitting at that time. And they were local stations. You had to be in those local areas, New York being one of the markets. Um, and somewhere out in the Midwest, I forget where the other market was. But it wasn't until 1936, and not even in our country, but in BBC, before you get dedicated programming. And BBC opened up with three hours of programming. Can you imagine a television station with three hours of programming? I mean, like, what do you do at that point in time? I mean, it's a pretty big three hours, right? I mean, if nobody had ever seen, nobody had ever seen anything like this before. So those three hours, people were probably, you know, enraptured by this thing. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of parallels between TV and radio and their evolution. Um, and you see that a lot with this because radio didn't have programming all the time either until much later. I think it was like the seventies when that became like, and, or maybe that was TV where it wouldn't just shut off at night. Yeah. I mean, as a kid, I remember yeah. midnight or one o'clock in the morning. You know, your your TV stations, you'd see a, a picture, a, a video of the American flag. Mm -hmm. They'd play the national anthem, and then he'd shut off until 8 o'clock the next morning when the news and started. For not, like for modern audiences, that's an insane concept because now it's, again, we're and we keep making this comparison, but it's the complete opposite where you're just inundated with content all yeah. the time. Yeah, and, and you saw some monumental achievements in television like in 67 when, when we get PBS where it's publicly funded broadcasting, you know, they mandated children's programming with children's television workshop in 1969 with Sesame Street. So you had a lot of positive things come out based on demand. And I think that's really the important thing is as people started to consume the media that was out there, they realized they wanted more. They wanted specific programming. They wanted specific shows. They wanted to, to watch their local sports franchises. And as a result of that, you started to see more specialized television networks come out. And a lot of that fell over into the cable industry as well. Because there's only a, cer a certain amount that you can get out of an over-the-air broadcast with television at the time. And really, the latest, the late, Latest, biggest innovation over the air television wasn't until 2009 when they went all digital, which I got to tell you, that was a real monster to deal with because you had people throughout the country who didn't have cable, couldn't afford cable, and they were getting all of their, their news and sports and everything over, over the air broadcasts. And with the, the mandate to move to all digital, and the reason for the all digital is because of how much more data you can put out over a digital signal than you ever could over an analog signal. And you see now with digital subscript, which with digital transmissions, you know, your local ABC station might be putting out five different channels over the bandwidth that used to use for one. So there was a definite benefit to it. But it also required everyone to replace all their equipment, which is expensive. So much so that when they went through this process, federal government actually subsidized it. You could go to the government and get a coupon oh, really? to buy a digital antenna wow. at the time. And the program ran for like 18 months or something like that. I remember when it, when it ran. And uh, they funded it with, you know, a ludicrous amount of money. And even after that fact, people still didn't have it because of how inaccessible it was for a lot of people. 
there's a lot of televisions that sit around right now that have no function whatsoever because nothing's broadcasting on frequencies they can receive. So then we move into, you know, the natural progression, I think, is cable television. And it's funny because in, in doing the research for the podcast today, I learned a lot about cable television that I didn't know. The fact that it's existed since 1948 blew my mind. Like, I came, my, when I grew up, I, I came from a, a fairly underprivileged house. We didn't have a lot of money coming in. So my dad did not subscribe to cable for a very long time. But uh, I kind of thought he was just sort of behind the times in the 70s, not realizing that cable's been around since the 1940s. So that was a, that was a big thing for me to realize it. But cable television progressed, I think, at a rate much faster than over-the-air transmissions did. Because you make a lot more money from it. <laughs> and that's, that's exactly it. You have people that are paying you, you know, it. In 1950, Tuckerman Appliance, an appliance store that sold TVs, started their own cable network. Could you imagine that today? One of the biggest radio stations in Philly was uh, originally was from a the appliance store. Right, the appliance stores were, were like they they had a lot of power. <laughs> yeah, back in the day. it was they would they would buy their feeds and then they would send it out to their customers. And people in Arkansas were paying three dollars a month for cable, and it was because they were. They were rural households that weren't close enough to a transmitting station. So they'd physically run a cable out there and then wire up the little, net, the little town. So in 1972, you start getting into specialized television channels. You get HBO. And then that sort of opened up the Pandora's box, you know, to use a bad pun there. You started in the 80s and 90s, you really started getting channels. You got channels for everything. You got channels for cooking. You got multiple channels for cooking. You got home shopping channels. You got multiple music television channels, none of which, ironically, play music anymore. <laughs> These were what were categorized as narrow casting channels. Um, and some of these, which was, which is kind of interesting, they started out as regional, like for instance, um, sports channel, New York started out as just regional sports broadcasting. And that eventually evolved in the spot, uh, Fox sports. So from humble beginnings to a yeah. major player in the sports franchise market. Now, um, you had other things like, um, BET black entertainment television. That's a channel all and of its own with its own award-winning programming today. Started out as a segment on USA Networks. So they had a, a couple of hours a week that they would broadcast it. And eventually there was such a demand for it that they came out with an entire network for it. And that's what I'm talking about. Like very specialized networks. Uh, you've got sci-fi network. You've got history. You've got multiple history channels. So the... The idea of catering to all of these entertainment needs was fulfilled in these specialized networks, these specialized channels on cable TV. But you still didn't have the ability to get what you want when you wanted. You were still bound to yep. a schedule. And that's really what's probably held cable television back for the longest time until the 19, late 1990s, early 2000s. You started to get your video on demand. You started to get more pay-per-view. So you could, if you wanted to watch a boxing match or a wrestling match or whatever it was, you could pay for it, one-time fee, get it, and watch it with all your friends. The real shift, I think, in cable TV came with TiVo and DVR, where you could time shift your entertainment now. So now TiVo, TiVo was unique in the business because it had a very intelligent algorithm. So as you would record certain programs, it would associate those programs with ones you're not recording and then offer you suggestions on what you might like. So then you can sort of pick and choose 
the shows that you want and get them a la carte. That was really the first a la carte entertainment package you had. The problem with that was that you still had to subscribe to all of those channels. And I think the downfall that cable has always had, when you go to your cable company and you want to get a subscription, there's multiple packages that you have to choose from. And yeah, you can pay through the nose and get the super deluxe and get everything, but you might want to just get one of the channels and one of the packages and you have to take all of them. So the, the, the cord cutters of the world in the 2000s got to the point of trying to find ways to not have to subscribe to all those channels and just get what you want. And that leads us up to sort of where we are today with all the streaming options. Yeah, I mean, that's that option, that ability to pick and choose channels is in the entire marketing platform for things like Sling, where yeah. you can pick and choose your channels, or I think Hulu Live TV does that too. Well, even Sling. So Sling and Hulu Live give you packages that you can choose from. You can't choose individual oh, okay. channels. Okay. So... It's not as bad as the cable company. It's still cheaper. <laughs> it's much cheaper than the cable company. But the problem that you run into now is all that's delivered to you is digital content over the internet. Yeah. So you have to worry about your internet speeds. Absolutely. So you have internet companies that are, you have cable companies that are becoming internet companies. And in doing that, you run into what is often referred to as the, um, uh, monopoly. <laughs> well, no, they've been monopolies for a long time. Net neutrality. Oh, okay. So, and with net neutrality, the concept behind net neutrality is data is data. Doesn't matter where it is, where it comes from, what it contains, it's data. It should all be treated the same. And the cable companies want their data to be treated better than others. And Netflix ran into this very early on with a lot of the cable companies, Cox Cable, Comcast, and a few others, where they were throttling the bandwidth that people were using for Netflix. So you may have an unlimited agreement with your cable company for data, but if they see that the majority of the data that you're using comes from outside their network from Netflix, they throttle it. You see a lot of buffering. Your quality goes down. And they're trying to push their own video on demand services instead, which they don't count against your bandwidth caps. So none of this has been resolved. This is still yeah. a problem. But what's happening is cable companies are becoming less about providing cable and more about becoming internet companies in general. And until all that sort of washes out, we're going to have a fight on our hands here because they're losing money. And, and they try to get it back by offering you bundles. So, for instance, if all you need is internet, it's cheaper for you to get internet, cable, and phone than just internet for the first year. After that, the rates go up. But they lock you into a two-year deal. Minimum, usually. So, you know, I can't blame the cable companies. They're trying to make a buck. That's their job. But in the end, it's the consumers that wind up paying for it. Yeah, and even now, I mean, we have Xfinity, and you can you can watch Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime all through Xfinity. So, I mean, I'm sure there's there's kind of handshakes there where they kind of meet in the middle and they say, well, okay, Netflix, we'll host your platform here. You'll get a lot more viewers, but you still have to subscribe to Netflix to access those services. Right. You, don't, you don't get any of that for free. I think with Xfinity, you only get like Peacock for free because it's NBC, Comcast, it's the same company. Um, but those kind of, they're kind of merging now and we're just going to have a big old blob of media eventually. That's just everything. <laughs> well, and it's funny you mentioned that because the solution that Netflix eventually came up with was they would implant caching servers in the cable providers and they would pay the cable providers a certain amount of money. They would put a physical box inside their network. So when you went to watch, if you went to stream Game of Thrones off of Netflix, it would download from Netflix's home server to the caching server there. You would watch it, but anybody else who went to watch Game of Thrones would pull it from that caching server. So the result of that was it didn't put a demand on the backbones, the internet backbone connections that the cable companies had. 
So that was an exclusive deal they offered to Netflix that they're not offering to other uh, streaming providers either. And I'm not even sure they're still offering. There's some debate whether or not they're still offering that service. I know Comcast was having a, a bit of an issue with that where they stopped offering it to Netflix. But it's all, you're right, it's you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, and we'll all make a buck off of the end consumer. Not to mention now, I mean, you've got Disney, in, which now effectively owns Hulu because they own Fox, right? right? So it's a lot of that programming too. So it's not just, these streaming companies are not like small businesses. <laughs> They're all, I mean, I don't think Netflix is owned by any major corporation. No, right? Netflix is still independent. Yeah, and then Amazon obviously is a mega corporation. So, you know, the streaming service is just a portion for the mo for most of these companies, just a portion of their revenue. Right. I mean, except for Netflix, but even then, I mean, they're still they've moved more into film produ and you know production in general too. So they're more of a they're not just streaming anymore. They're making a lot of their own content as well. And it, you know, it's interesting to mention that. So so we talked over the radio, television, and cable. The alternatives that we had to get our a la carte fix of entertainment were VCRs. You know, the, the VCRs came out in the 1970s. They became popular in the 80s. Blockbuster Video became uh, opened in 85. So if you wanted to watch a movie, you could, a la carte, on demand, go down and get a movie and bring it home and watch it. As long as you rewound, rewound it, you were fine. DVDs became the alternative. They were much more convenient, higher quality. First DVDs were released in 97. Blockbuster started carrying them in 2001. They, they kind of missed the boat on that a certain amount. Hollywood Video actually started DVD rentals as soon as they became available. But the one interesting thing with uh, Blockbuster was when Blu-ray came out, there was, as, just like with VCR, when, when VHS came out, you had Betamax as an alternative. When DVD, uh, HD Blu-rays came out, you had HD video. And when Blockbuster had such a huge portion of the market that they decided that they were going to go Blu-ray. And as soon as that happened, it basically was the end of life for HD DVD at that point. Um, so they had such a huge segment of the market that they could make that kind of demand. But then you see other services like Redbox pop up. You know, you see Redbox is all over the place still, even though a lot of people are streaming stuff. I think Redbox is a streaming service too. Like they I do. I think you can stream, and I think they make, they have their own original things. Like, I don't know if they make it, like, I don't know if they produce it like Netflix does, but they can definitely license or and stream a lot of stuff on their own site as well. Yeah. So... So, and, and then streaming, you know, streaming really started in, in the early nineties. The problem you had was your data connections. Um, the first practical codex for streaming, the compression algorithms for streaming came out in 92, but 92 was also when we had 33 K bald modems. You didn't have your high speed data connections, your cable modems, your DSL, even at that time. So that kind of killed a lot of what you could do with it there. But the real streaming services itself didn't start until 2005 when YouTube uh, opened up business. And, and at the time, it, YouTube and, and streaming was, you know, YouTube was where people posted their videos. It was the TikTok of today. That's what YouTube was. You didn't have professionally produced content that was going up there. Nowadays... Every streaming service, Netflix, Disney, obviously, YouTube, uh, Hulu, they're all producing their own television shows to the point that you have award shows that are controversial because you have TV awards for streaming services, streaming services yeah. that never appear on TV. Yeah. I think the Emmys, like the, I think more, maybe more than the majority was mostly all from streaming services. Yeah. So there was, there was really a fundamental shift probably 2013, 2014 to, to more streaming. So that, you know, that's a history. It's, it's important to know where we came from with our entertainment. You know, we, we get up to that 2015 mark there and we're still stuck with 180 channels with nothing to watch. 
And that's really where the problem came from. And the demand for cord cutters and the demand for a la carte entertainment. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back and then we'll talk about where we are today with cable TV and all these other outlets. See who's a player, who's not a player anymore. And then we'll take a look at where we're going. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. We are talking entertainment a la carte today. So we've looked at the history of it. We've sort of set the stage here. Let's take a look at where we are today as far as cable TV goes. So we're still running packages on, on TV channels today. So we haven't really changed much there, have we? There is an increasing push to cut the cord with different services. We've got enough streaming services out there, as long as you have a good internet connection. Uh, now, the one thing to mention here that I actually didn't put in the notes, that's the, the new satellite internet network that uh, Elon Musk is putting out. So it will be possible very soon to have low latency satellite internet, high speed internet, and not have to deal with your cable company. Of course, when that happens, God help you if you're an astronomer, because you're not going to be able to look at anything up in the sky now without seeing one of these satellites. Net neutrality. We mentioned it earlier on. One of the biggest problems with net neutrality is, the, is that the FCC determines what is and isn't net neutrality. And the FCC is traditionally chaired by someone from the telecommunications industry. So it doesn't look good for consumers from that perspective. What are your thoughts on, you know, net neutrality and, and whether or not it's an issue moving forward? Is it an issue today? Is it a non-issue? Should we not even worry about it now? I, I definitely think it's an issue. Um, and I do think, I mean, I don't, I think people underestimate how important it is really. And I, I know, Every time the, you know, the bills and things go up for net neutrality, there's always petitions online, you know, contact your congressman, things like that. But I don't think people take it that seriously. And I don't think they really understand how a lack of net neutrality will really impact them. You know, and I think it's, it's the more subtle ways that I find the most dangerous where we talked about before how you can manipulate the consumer to get rid of a product like Netflix or something like that because you can't stream it because of your internet, right? But it's so subtle that you'll just chalk it up to, oh, my speeds are just low, yeah. right? But there's a company behind the scenes that are that's pulling those strings and that is manipulating you and you might not even realize it. So I think that net neutrality is extremely important for those reasons because it it's just another element that can be used to manipulate consumers, which I, I get is the whole point of a business basically is to get people to continue buying your product. But I think when it's, something so universal like that where the internet should probably be a utility that everybody has access to but it's not that yet and it's not looking like it's going to go that way either um if the patterns that we're seeing now continue it looks like a lot of people are going to have restricted access where the internet should be a free and open resource for everybody yeah and I, and i agree and you touched on it earlier when you mentioned cable companies and monopolies and, mm -hmm. and this is really them behind a curve you know not not getting with the program here because there's a lot of things Te technology moves much faster than cable companies 
well, cable company lawyers can move. You know, we're looking at satellite uh, communications that have exploded at this point. You're looking at alternatives like uh, Verizon Fios, where you can get fiber run right to your house. You're looking at 5G now, where, you know, once the 5G networks are built out, you won't need to have a wired connection to your house, at least if you buy into the hype. Yeah, but it's going to make all our heads explode, haven't you heard? And cause coronavirus. Yeah, yeah I know. It's going to turn us into zombies. <laughs> um, but you can get cable, you can get over the air speeds for your internet now that are comparable to your cable connection that are more than enough to stream video. So I think, I think if nothing else, the cable companies have a real problem ahead of themselves. Um, they've got too many outlets that people have alternatives for because cable companies thrive when you didn't have options. And, you know, a lot of this started in the nineties when cable companies started gobbling up all the regional cable providers and you start having giants emerge like Comcast where you have entire regions of the country that don't have an alternative to cable phone or internet, but Comcast. So you don't have a choice, but to go with that. But it's not a monopoly, <laughs> but that, right, it that's not a monopoly because it's only regional. <laughs> yeah. But I think the problem is that they've had that level of, monopolistic protection for so long now that they don't realize that that they're really threatened at this point in time. So I don't know where cable's going to go. It's, it's an endangered species right now, but it doesn't realize it. Yeah, I think you're seeing a little bit of that with things like Peacock, where Xfinity, which is Comcast, which is NBC, is trying to get into that streaming market, but I don't know, maybe it's just me, but Peacock seems like it's really late to the game. And they don't really seem like they have a whole lot to offer other than things they already own, like reruns of like Cheers and Frasier, which used to be on Netflix, but it looks like they are they were just flexing that they own the rights to these shows, so they put it on their own streaming service. But it doesn't seem like it's enough to make them a competitor for something like Netflix or Hulu, because it's not making... What separates companies like our, our services like Netflix and Hulu and Amazon is that they're making their own shows, like we mentioned before. But with things like Peacock, if you're just rebroadcasting, essentially, content that everybody's already seen and just wants to watch reruns, I don't think that's going to make you enough of a competitor in the market. And I think that if it, if that's their attempt to keep their cable company status, but also dip their toe in the streaming water, I don't think it's going to be enough. And, and I think that's a great segue to the streaming services in general. So the, what really got me on this topic was there was an article on CNET. Uh, I, I think the, the person who did the research I wrote up was Ashley Esketha who, who wrote it up and she went through and ranked 101 quote unquote major streaming services. And she ranked them based on price, the number and quality of original programming, the number and quality of their back catalog their overall uh, variety, and what their availability was for subscribers. And it was kind of eye-opening to me that there were 101 <laughs> major streaming providers out there. Well, I mean, major, I don't know about that, because on this list we have, what is it, the top, we have the top 10 here. This is just the top 10. And I haven't one. heard of one of them, so I don't know how major it is. I've never heard of Acorn TV. I don't know what that is. Well, and that's like Acorn. So, like, if you use uh, Plex or Kodi or any of the media streaming service players at home, Acorn TV you would know. Acorn, okay. Acorn TV is a, like a free add-on that okay. you can get for it. And think of it like the me TV of streaming where it's like some of the nostalgic Oldies stuff. stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right. That makes sense. But a lot of them are like that. I mean, you had ones on here that were, they were rated much lower because they didn't have, they were so specialized. So for instance, NFL networks has a streaming yeah. service. NHL does WWE does all the sports basically. Right. So they didn't rate very high because they didn't have a, a very wide variety. But the fact that there's 101, this, this, this goes back to the, I want it, I want it now, and I want it the way I want it. So instead of having 180 channels with nothing on, 
we now have 101 streaming networks that we now have to sort through now. Yeah, and the argument used to be from cord cutters is like, well, if you add up all the streaming services, it's still less than a cable bill. But within like three years, that is not a valid argument anymore because, I mean, I personally have Amazon Prime, Hulu, Netflix, Disney Plus, and I guess whatever HBO has now, but I think that's included with my cable. So it's like that's... Like five right there. Well, and HBO has three different streaming <laughs> services that they offer. Yeah, yeah, they have HBO Now, HBO Max, and then HBO Go. Is that the Go thing? is the new one? Yeah, and I have no idea what any of them are. Right. Like I have HBO Max, and I I barely use it, but I have it, and I know where to access it, but I don't know what HBO Now and HBO Go are. Right, and that's the thing. Like we've gotten to the point now where we wanted to be able to to basically go to the cable company and say, all right. I want 50 channels. These are the 50 channels I want. Give them to me and charge me a reasonable rate. We never got that. Instead, what we got was you go to your cable company. Here is your boom. There's your package. Oh, and if you want all this other stuff because you have stuff that are exclusive to the streaming networks. So if I want to watch Star Trek, I can't watch Star Trek on cable anymore. I have to have a subscription to CBS All Access to watch anything Star Trek. And that's one of the things that, like, really bothers me about all these companies coming out of the woodwork and making their own streaming service. Because it just seems like, like I mentioned before with Peacock, it just seems like they're flexing their muscles and saying, oh, no, these are ours. Right. Like, that happened with The Office on Netflix. Who was that? Uh, was that Peacock or was that somebody else? I can't even keep track. I, I think it was Peacock. They had it on on someone. Yeah. And they pulled it. I think it was on Netflix. Yeah. They pulled it off and they put it on some. And, on and Friends network. was like that too. And again, it's the shows where you're just rebroadcasting green runs. But it was, it's a show that a lot of people like. And now they have to pay another $10 a month to watch it. And they're probably not gonna. And Disney did the same thing. Yeah, exactly. You look at all the Marvel TV shows that Disney had on Netflix that were, for the most part, good. They canned and, them all. And they canned them all. But they didn't even bring them over to their own network yet. Yeah, they're even though they, they tease people as if they were going to, right. and they haven't yet, and I doubt they're going to. Right. It's been too long. So so I don't think we're any better off today than we were 10 years ago. It's just everything that you have now, and if they're, they all price themselves at either 5 or 10 bucks a month. And it's like, okay, well, if I get the 50 channels or the 50 streaming services that I want, I'm paying more for my service now than I would have through cable. Oh, and I still have to pay for my internet. So I'm getting more because I'm getting on-demand back catalogs. I'm getting original content. The top 10 of these probably all, with the exception of Acorn, I don't know if Acorn does, they all do original content. So I'm probably getting more things to watch, but the price is going up exponentially at this point. Yeah, I mean, I know in my house, I've been a strong advocate of we don't need cable, right? But I'm not the only one in the house, obviously. Like my mom, she watches a lot of live TV and she records a lot of things live. But there are also things that I'm pretty sure are available on some of these services. Like she watches Big Brother and I'm pretty sure that's on CBS All Access because that's the network at Arizona, I think. I'm sorry if there's Big Brother fans out there and I'm wrong about that. But that's the thing too, because it's like, and like my grandma doesn't really understand how streaming stuff works, but she can get on her Roku TV and put on ABC and stream the live TV. So she doesn't need a cable box. And it's like, that's like a whole nother layer to it where it's, it's live TV, but then you're streaming it through a streaming service, which you then have to pay for. But some of these, you need a cable subscription to access like the live TV for the ABC. You need a cable service to log into it. So it's like all these layers of, of media and they're all kind of intertangled so that you end up having to keep all of it and pay for all of it. When I don't really think you'd need to, you know? You're absolutely right. And it's probably and, by design that way. <laughs> well, and and the amount of overhead that this creates now causes all of the bills to go up even higher because the cable companies now have to pay for the broadcast versions. They have to pay for the streaming versions. There are different revenue sources that come out of it through advertising now, obviously. But for the end consumer, you're not – better off you're not you're not getting what you were looking for you know we wanted to have everything on demand for us and and all these networks were like well this is what you asked for it's all on demand now you know you need to have 50 subscriptions if you want to get your 50 channels and i think the the appeal is with something like cbs all access well okay you 
you don't you might not want to get our streaming service because it's you think it's just reruns. So we're going to make something like Star Trek or like the three different versions of Star Trek. And okay, that's new content. You can come here and watch that. But not everybody might want to do that, right? And if they don't like the new Star Trek, then they're not going to subscribe to that service. But if they forget, which is I think what most of these companies count on, yep. forgetting to cancel your subscription, then they get that $10 every month, even if you're not using it and they don't care if you're using it or not. You know, it's funny you mentioned that Netflix actually got to the point where they had so many hangers on like that, that they introduced a service you know, without being asked for it, that they monitor whether or not you watch the service if you use it. If you haven't used it in a year, they'll notify you and cancel your subscription oh, wow. for you. I mean, they're making so much money, it probably is negligible, but they are. it's just to improve they their are. like public image. That's a helpful service, though, because I'm, I mean, I still pay for, and this is totally different from this, but like in terms of forgetting subscriptions, I still pay 99 cents a month for cloud storage. I haven't had an iPhone in like three years, but every time I go to cancel it, it's so many steps to cancel it that I just like, well, you can have my 12 bucks a year, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's Apple for you. Yeah. <laughs> so outside of cable and streaming, there are other options. Us being one of them, us being podcast being one of them. And there's a ton of sources for podcasts. There's tons of podcasts out there that, that cater to every possible desire for cons a media consumption out there. And there's apps, you know, we talk about Instagram and Facebook, uh, TikTok. Well, we're, we're not talking about it too much now because Trump's trying to ban it. Nah, Microsoft will buy it. Microsoft and Walmart. Yeah. Just, comp just corporations, just vomit yeah, money. Yeah, they just care. throw money at it. <laughs> uh, and then you had someone who tried to corner the market with, I'm not even sure what, seven minutes? segments i think it's like 15 minutes 15 minute segments but it's all shot vertically which is awful um quibi <laughs> yeah um who received a ludicrous amount of funding like two billion dollars in funding a lot of big names attached to it and and yeah they had a lot of celebrities and they had a huge number of people sign up for the free trial several million like 15 million or something sign up for the free trial and then when that free trial ran out, they had about 70,000 people stick on. I mean, Quibi strikes me as the kind of thing that, like, it makes it to the the boardroom or whatever. And they're like, oh, this is a great idea because people love – like, we looked at the numbers, right? We looked at the numbers and we saw that people are only watching in 15-minute increments because they're watching on their way to work on the train or something, right? Or they're watching with their family and, and their kid runs away so they got to turn it off. So what if we just – hyper focus on that but then you realize because you're so caught up in the analysis and the numbers that that's not really going to work as a format because you end up having episodes that are really just trailers right because they're only right. 15 minutes long and when you shoot everything vertically not only are you limiting the art form of like making movies and television most people aren't going to watch things vertically like even if you're watching on your way to work on the train you're still going to take the one second to turn your phone right like Quibi blows my mind. Well, and <laughs> it's still a thing. And you couldn't share it with anyone. Oh, really? I you never You couldn't share clips. You couldn't share links. You couldn't share anything. That's good. That's great. When like the number one thing to social media sites like YouTube, TikTok, Facebook is the ability to share it. All the like Netflix Hence too. Why it's social media? Yeah, yeah. I mean Netflix <laughs> especially has a huge social media presence. Yeah. So and that's so critical. And it's like, what are so, you doing? And, but I think, I guess my point is these options that we have here between podcasts and the apps, I think probably fill the gap of entertainment a la carte more than anything else right now, where we can go and find what we want. I can, I can download 50 different podcasts a week and pick and choose which ones that I want to consume. So I think that's probably more meeting the needs of the consumer than anything. Yeah. And I mentioned before that I watched a lot of YouTube and YouTube's just like that too. You can follow different channels that do different things, just like you'd subscribe to different podcasts. Like I follow a couple cooking channels. I follow a couple comic book based channels, um, you know, history channels. So there's something for everybody within each of these sections. Yep. Just like you can listen, like you said, to different podcasts. So I think if you want that a la carte, it's those places you're probably going to turn to because you can, because it's made by people, and it's not as heavily regulated. I mean, YouTube's pretty regulated, but 
something like a podcast. Anybody can do a podcast, right? So you can, there's always something wow. for somebody, really? literally anybody. <laughs> I mean, anybody can do it. You just talk. <laughs> no, but, um, wow. <laughs> and make sure to subscribe to our podcast on your local podcast Good provider. Good thing you're not in our advertising department. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we just free plug, shameless advertising. Um, but yeah, I think that's where you get a lot of that a la carte, right? Because yeah, it's, you, I can, agree. you can find any kind of channel or any kind of podcast to meet your needs. I agree a hundred percent. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back with our gloom, doom and gloom section where we look towards the future. <laughs> Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Entertainment a la carte, the future. How bad does it look? So let me ask you a series of questions. Is there a future for cable television? I don't know how long of a future it is, but I definitely think there is some. And, you know, I think it's probably just going to evolve. And you, you might not have a cable box, but I think especially Comcast is definitely trying to remain a presence in people's homes um, because they, you know, whether rebranding to a different name or offering more services based on tying internet and cable together. I think that's where they're going to most likely head is, is becoming both a cable company and an internet company and kind of doubling down on that. All right. I'll buy that. How about traditional network broadcasting and schedules? Um, probably that'll probably stick around on cable. Um, and I know you have, you kind of have broadcasting, sort of in the traditional sense and schedules on things like Twitch and YouTube where people will stream on a broadcast schedule. Um, so I think it might evolve into that where if you're looking at these new platforms, people will stick to a broadcast schedule, but instead of it being on three, six and 10, it'll be on twitch.tv slash, you know, whatever. Okay. How about commercial advertising and television? Are we still going to see million dollar minutes for Super Bowl ads? Oh, absolutely. That's the only reason a lot of these, like that's, like that's radio's most valuable thing too, is advertising, right? And it's where the money goes. So I definitely think that we'll definitely still see that because there's still people watching, even if a lot of it, if we're focusing a lot on streaming, they can still make a ton of money from commercial advertising. And the last question in is there a future is subscription television channels like HBO. Um, I'd probably have to look at the numbers for things like this to see if their subscriptions are going down. But I think with HBO, as an example, they're migrating over to streaming. So that's probably where it's going to go too. I mean, we had earlier Showtime was on that list too. So I think most of these channels, and I know WWE has one too. Um, so a lot of these channels are probably just going to go it, like, they'll probably keep their broadcast channel, but then also just, you know, improve their streaming side of things. Okay. So I wanted to ask some questions about streaming entertainment going forward. So TikTok was, was popular, very popular. Um, so popular in fact that, uh, they managed to tick off president Trump. What do you think about the precedent of Trump banning TikTok for reasons that were given that had no corresponding supporting evidence? That seems pretty par for the course if we're talking about Trump, but I mean, I never use TikTok personally just because I don't like care about that kind of entertainment, but it is extremely popular. And if I had to wager, he probably did it, you know, to try to make like, cause he's very anti-China most of the time. Right. Sure. So he says he tried to ban not just TikTok. There were a couple other things too, all owned by Chinese companies that he was trying to go after. But when there was such a backlash to it, it just came off like another smoke bomb, right? Another distraction that he was going for, especially with TikTok. Cause he knows that he's, that's mostly used by youth, right? So that's going to be the most vocal about it. And 
if you're calling out a streaming or a social media platform, that social media platform is going to get way more traffic because exactly. the users over it are going to complain about you. So it just seemed like another distraction on, on his part. I think it was like almost immediately. I mean, he's still waving threats and stuff, but it looks like, like we said earlier, Microsoft and Walmart, which I didn't know about, yeah. were um, are moving into buy it. So I doubt it's going anywhere. He probably just wanted to, you know, make a business deal or something. How about net neutrality? Do you think we have any hope of achieving net neutrality? Not with the current, I wouldn't, I would say not with the current administration. It doesn't seem like their track record does not show them leaning towards any kind of net neutrality. Um, it's probably going to take us a while and it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. And it would depend on the company's actions as well. Okay. 5G technology. It's everywhere. Everyone's talking about it. Do you think 5G is going to be the end all be all to give us the entertainment solution on our phones or in our homes that we're looking for? I don't think it'll be the end all be all, but I think it's probably the next step. I mean, we see that with all the time. Technology always progresses and it just seems like 5G is the next step in that. Um, obviously there's the conspiracies, which I made a joke about earlier, but I think it's just people. I mean, when people, when like cars became more mainstream, they said there was going to be the end of the American family. Right. So I think people are just always hesitant to new technologies, regardless of what they are. But I think it's just another, it's just the next step for getting, you know, more entertainment and better technology. First run movies. We have a lot of our streaming services are running movies online now because of COVID and the fear of going to the movie theaters. Do you think we'll be going back to the movie theaters like we were before, or is a new model of streaming it at home going to be the way to go? Yeah, this is this is tough. My personal tinfoil hat theory is that I think Disney's going to open their own theaters, and I think that would be, um, what is the word? It would violate some kind of law, like the Paramount decision or something like that. But I think that was recently repealed, so they can do it, where they handle exhibition, distribution, and production, which right. is what they would be doing, which is a monopoly, which is supposed to be legal, but it's Disney, so they can probably get away with it. So that's my personal theory is that they're probably going to start buying up theaters. But if not, I mean, a lot of them have already f- filed or are going to file for bankruptcy most likely. And I don't I don't know how much people are going to want to go back because there's theaters open now. But I don't think like big movies like Tenet are still making money but not nearly as much as they should be making given their production. Plus what a normal Christopher Nolan movie would take. Um, I think it's difficult, you know, and I think there's also a lot of hesitant to put a lot of these movies on streaming services, even though they'd make a bunch of money. Um, and maybe not as much as you'd make with a traditional theatrical run, but you'd make a significant amount of money back, you know, and you wouldn't just have to cut your losses. Yeah. No, I agree with you there. The last question I'm asking, it's, it's not in the notes, but the last question I wanted to ask was, where do you think, do you think we'll ever reach that entertainment a la carte level where we'll get to pick and choose what we want and it would be affordable? I'd say probably not because the whole reason it's not a la carte is so that companies can make more money because you're roped into buying things you don't really need, which is, I mean, that's the whole point of business too. I said that earlier, but I'll say it again they're not going to make it that simple for the consumer. It's not designed to be pro consumer. They'll give you what you think you want because you'll get, you know, this thing, but this thing will also come with all the other things that you're going to have to pay for. And I don't see that ever going away. It's if anything, it'll probably just increase. Yeah. I, and I, sadly, I think you're right. I think the packaging aspect of things is too cost effective for these distribution companies to move away from that. Yeah. And I mean that, method of packaging goes back to the beginning of modern entertainment, right? Of radio. I mean, you'd have formats, which yeah. are essentially packages because you'd listen to, you know, you might like sports, but you don't want to listen to sports all the time, but that's the format. And TV, again, what we talked about before, but with channels. So I think packaging is, has always been the way. And the reason it's been the way is because it works and it gets people's money and it, it furthers the industry in some kind of way. All right. Well, I think that was all the questions that I have. We'll come back. We'll get your closing remarks and thoughts and uh, end the show. So it wasn't too do- doom and gloom today, but what are your final thoughts on the entertainment industry, where we're going, where we're at, and is there hope for us? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think there's hope for us. I mean, <laughs> at least in this aspect of things, um, even if the world's burning outside, you can close your curtains and watch something on Netflix, right? Um, I think it's just like anything. I mean, I'm more focused. I 
in the radio industry, because that's what I'd like to go into one day. And I think with any industry, it's just going to evolve and it's going to change. I don't think they're going to go anywhere, at least not for the time being. I mean, cable might be a different story, but like I said, it's probably just going to evolve into something cable and internet, internet, you know? And um, I think that's the name of the game is changing and evolving and, and not being resistant or hesitant to a lot of these new ideas um, where like you wouldn't want to release a new movie on streaming because the theaters are closed and you insist on putting it in theaters regardless of the situation. I, I think that's, there's that friction there of resisting change, which I can understand from someone like Chris Nolan's perspective where he wants his movie in theaters because that's what he made it for. It was designed to be watched that way. But I think the tides are just changing too fast. And if you want to make any sort of, if you want your art out there and if you want the profit from that art, I think you're going to have to, you know, just go with the flow of things, honestly. And, and you know, I think that's very well said. And I agree with you hundred percent. I think we're going to continue to evolve. Technology is going to push that evolution and the people that are adaptable enough mm-hmm. to pick up on those things are the ones that are going to thrive in the future. So very well said. That was all we had today. I do want to reiterate, uh, for folks out there that we do publish our long form articles on medium at medium.com slash insights into things. Uh, and please do subscribe to our podcast on Apple podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon. Uh, you subscribe and you'll get our podcast, uh, the instant they're available, uh, Monday mornings at 8 a.m. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us at comments at insights into things. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. And I think that's it. Did you have anything else? Uh, just one quick thing. Um, if you have Amazon Prime, that means you have one Twitch Prime sum a bu- sub a month. And if you could help us out and support the channel that way, um, it does help us out because eventually we can help grow and expand our podcast, especially on Twitch, uh, bring it to you viewers out there. So Very well said. Another one in the books. Bye. seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 109 insecurities. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my inspiring and wonderful co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? 
I'm doing all right. How about you? I'm doing okay. How was your uh, week so far? It's been going all right. Um, kind of started off Tuesday with pretty much a quiz in every subject, but um, things have been kind of um calming down so far, so that's good. Well, at least we can start a week off like that. It can't help but get better, right? Yeah. So that's one thing. You did do something interesting uh, last night, though. What'd you do? Tell us about that. Uh, um, I actually went to the first rehearsals for a uh, marching band. And how'd that go? It went well. Uh, we kind of did some visuals on how and commands on kind of like what um, they talk about when they're marching and playing. Um, and then we got to play some of the music that I had played with my with my band teacher. Um, and then we kind of just closed everything out. Cool. So is it something you think you're going to stick with for a little while? For now, at least. I'll we'll kind of see how the rest of it goes and, you know. Okay. But that's not what we're talking about this week. This week, we're talking about insecurities. What does it mean to be insecure? What type of insecurities are there? What are the signs of insecurity? We'll discuss all this and we'll take a look at how to deal with insecurity in this week's episode of Insights into Teens. But before we do that, though, I would uh, invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. If you want the video versions of all of our show's podcasts, you can subscribe to Insights into Things. If you just want the audio versions of this podcast, you, su- you can subscribe to Insights into Teens. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, and any place else you can get a podcast these days. Uh, we would also invite folks to give us some feedback, write in, give us some show suggestions, tell us how we're doing. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can give us feedback on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast or on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things or right through our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Are we ready to get started? Why not? All right. So the first thing we should do, I guess, is what we normally do, and that's define what we're talking about here. And today's definition uh, was found by you. You did the research for today's topic, and you used WebMD for this one. So why don't you tell us what does insecurity mean? Insecurity is a feeling of inadequacy or not being good enough and uncertainty. It produces anxiety about your goals, relationships, and ability to, ha- to handle certain situations. Everybody deals with insecurity from time to time. It can appear in all areas of life and come from a variety of causes. It might stem from a traumatic event, patterns in previous experiences, social conducting, or learning or learning learning rules by observing others or local environments. So with that in mind, and before we get into any more of the specifics, do you think you have any insecurities? Um, I definitely think I have a few insecurities. Um, would you like me to specify or? Well, only if you're comfortable talking about it. I mean, I have, um, some pretty broad insecurities, like, um... Do I actually think I'm good enough to be in all of the advanced classes or the academies or stuff like that relating to my academics? That makes sense. And, you know, I, I'll be honest, I have my own insecurities. Um, a lot of it has to do with body image. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a big guy. I have been my whole life. So there's, there's social insecurities with that. Um, probably my biggest insecurity is actually – being in a crowd and having a conversation in a crowded room. Mm. Um, and the reason for that is I have issues with hearing. So when I'm in a crowded room and there's a lot of voices going on, it's very difficult for me to distinguish one voice from another. So if you and I happen to be at a restaurant and the restaurant happened to be loud and you were talking to me, I'd have a very difficult time understanding what you were saying because it sort of blends into the to the background noise with my hearing issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it makes me very insecure to be in 
uh, a social environment like that. So we all have, everyone has insecurities of some form or another. I think the biggest thing is identifying them and addressing them more than anything else. But there are specific types of insecurities. Why don't you tell us about what the specific types of insecurity are? So the first type of insecurity that we have is called relationship insecurity. One of the most common kinds of insecurity concerns relationships or attachments. Attachment theory originated out of the desire to connect the attachment patterns of early childhood to later relationship patterns and reliability available and supportive. The child often feels insecure for forms of negative self-image and relationship models and experiences greater emotional distress later in life. Relationship or attachment issues don't need to begin in early childhood. They can arise wherever previous experience of per- or personal identity undermine someone's security in their closest relationships. So now do you think you <clears throat> suffer from, based on that definition, relationship insecurity? I mean... I'm pretty sure people have always kind of, like, I'm pretty sure plenty of people have had that instance where, like, you message with your one friend, you text your friend something, and they don't respond in a few hours, and you're kind of wondering, well, do they not like me anymore? Is something going on? Like, I sometimes have that insecurity about some of my friends. Um, uh, I, um... I also don't know if this pertains to, like, actual romantic relationships. I'm guessing it does. Sure. Why wouldn't it? Um, um, I definitely had my fair share of being insecure about, well, people my age are already kind of figuring out who they like and are even dating people. And I'm here, still not sure who or what I'm interested in, uh, and... I really don't know um, what to make of it. I've gotten a bit better in abs- in accepting the fact that it's fine to not know yet, but there's still always something like that in the back of my mind that, well, this person my age already has this figured out. So, yeah, I'd say I have a bit of it. You know, <clears throat> I'll, I'll give you a little bit of insider information. Nobody at the age of 14 has anything figured out. It takes you, you know, I'm much older than that, and I still don't have everything figured out. So don't ever think that that's that's a factor there. Um, But at age 14, I don't think you have anything to worry about. I had relationship insecurity. Um, Most of the relationships I've ever been in, I've had relationship insecurity. But it didn't stem from my partner so much as it stemmed from my own sense of self-worth and a lot of that stems back to the the body image issues i've had and the insecurities i've had about that like you know why would this person want to be with me you know when i look the way that i do type thing and you know sometimes that's been an issue in relationships that i've had in the past i'm very fortunate now that that you know mommy see beyond the surface, you know, the skin deep type thing. Uh, and, and mommy sees, you know, the person that's inside and no, I didn't need someone. (laughs) Um, (laughs) but you know, they, they, they tell you, you know, there's, there's this, that phrase that people say all the time that you can't judge a book by its cover. And, and that's true. I mean, the person that you are, you could be an incredibly attractive, beautiful person on the outside, but you could be rotten to the core on the inside and the way that you treat other people and you could be selfish. Um, or you could look like an ogre like me and be a pretty decent person on the inside. Uh, it just, you know, it, it took finding mommy to, to see that person on the inside myself because I didn't see that person for a long time. Mm. So a lot of times the people that you're around can help you with your insecurities. What's the next type of insecurity we have? So the next one probably doesn't apply to many teens, but it can kind of be interpreted in different ways, I suppose. This one is job insecurity. 
Job insecurity occurs when you are anxious about your continued employment or about the continuation of certain benefits attached to your employment. It can be triggered by anxiety over your own job performance or anxiety over factors beyond your control, such as the economy, industry trends, workplace conflict, or the danger of company restricting, restructing, restructuring, restructuring or failure. High rates of unemployment and temporary work increase job insecurity on nat- on a nat- national scale and contribute to widespread mental health problems. Yeah, and this is a big factor now because of the way um, the pandemic has affected <clears throat> so many businesses. You've had so many businesses, especially in the service industry, like bars and restaurants that have had to shut down. And as a result, you have massive unemployment. I mean, you've got unemployment numbers that have been approaching Great Depression level unemployment. Um, And it's no fault of the employees. You know, it's not like you're not doing your job. But if the company itself can't continue to work, it's going to be a problem. Uh, Mommy and I have been very fortunate that our companies have not been as affected by the pandemic and we've been able to continue working. Mommy's work... Um, her company has allowed her to work remotely. I've been going into the office. But um, there's always some level of insecurity there, especially when you have a family to take care of. You know, if 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 I didn't have my job, the biggest concerns that I have are making sure that, you know, we've got a house, we've got a roof over our head, we've got food on the table. You start to think of those very basic types of elements in environments like this where the luxuries and the nice to has become less important and you start to appreciate the fact that I can pay the mortgage at the end of the month or I can go grocery shopping and I can make sure we have food. Um, So it's a significant driver of anxiety when you have job insecurity, especially in times like now. Yeah, and I can actually kind of see an indirect relation to it with teens. Like, like, there was a point um, on Monday when you went in where Mommy had mentioned that you might be losing your job. You say you're coming around to the point where you might have to look for another job because you might end up quitting or they might end up firing you. Right. And I can definitely see teens in similar situations like that worrying about these larger issues. Of course, they're probably not worrying about whether they're going to work the ne- go to the work the next day or if they... Um, need to leave work, but more or less the effects of one of their parents or relatives or guardians leaving work and how it will affect their lifestyle in a way. Absolutely. I remember as a kid, my father had retired from one job and he started working another job because we just didn't have the income to not have him work. And they wound up letting him go at the job. And there was a significant amount of worry about whether or not we were going to continue to be able to live where we were. Were we going to have to move in with other family until we got back on our feet? And and a lot of that stuff, it's, it's very scary for kids. For me at that point, it was like, okay, well, if, if we can't afford to keep the house because we were renting at the time, then we're going to move in with grandmom and grandpa. Well, they live in a completely different town, which means I have to go to a different school now and I have to go through all that process. And you experience anxiety and stress, but it's different than the anxiety and stress that the adults are experiencing. But it's no less real for you as a teenager either because it does have a direct impact on you. Yeah. So that's that's important to keep in in mind. What's our next type of insecurity? The next type of insecurity is one you've already mentioned, body image insecurity. A common source of insecurity is body image. Many people feel insecure about the way they look and question whether they measure up to an imposed ideal. There is no necessary connection between actual body body health or appearance and body insecurity. People of all body types can experience this type of insecurity. I like to think I've kind of grown past my insecurities here. It's been to the, it's to the point now where I'm kind of set in my ways. So as long as I'm healthy, I think I'm happy. I don't think I have some unrealistic, unrealistic expectation that I'm going to be 
30 pounds and slim and, and athletic at any point in time in my life. Um, and there comes a point when people make fun of you long enough because of the way you look that it just stops bothering you at some point. And, and I came to that realization probably 10 years ago, you know, there wasn't any specific, uh, incident where it happened, but it was just like, yeah, I'm fat. I, I get it. Thanks for pointing it out. You know, if things don't work out with your current job, you can be a, a detective for figuring that one out and you just move on. Um, but for teens, it can be overwhelming. I have to imagine Well, it was for me when I was a teen because everyone looked at you because of the way that you looked and they still do, you know, teens can be very mean when it comes to your appearance. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have any, have you had any experience with, with body shaming or insecurities around, you know, the way you look, the way you dress, your hair, anything like that? I mean, I don't think I've directly experienced people saying that I, well, shaming me for how I look, but I can definitely say that there are instances where I kind of look in the mirror and I think, well, you know, maybe if things looked a little differently, I'd be a little more, a little bit better. Of course, um, being a teen, some of this stuff's normal, like pimples. I really can't, um, control that. Right, you that can't much. avoid that. Yeah, um, but pimples have somewhat co become an insecurity for me. Um, and although I'm more than likely not overweight, um, there are some times where I kind of wish I was a little thinner. Uh, like, I have, um, a sizable stomach, um, uh, but, and a lot of times I really don't like admitting it, so I really kind of try hiding it sometimes. One of the main re one of the reasons I actually wear hoodies is, um, because it makes me think I'm a little skinnier, but I don't really, I don't think I have it as bad of an, of a body insecurity as other people do. Like, sometimes I accept the fact that I'm like, okay, I look this way. Oh, well, um, I just try to fix myself up as best I can. Um, but this, I can definitely say the insecurity's there. It's just not as prominent as others probably have it. Yeah. And a lot of times it's self-imposed. It, it's not necessarily something that society imposes on you. More often than not, we're our own worst critics, right? You know, we look at ourselves in the mirror every day and we make a judgment call every day. Do I need to brush my hair different? Do I need to, uh, wear different clothes? Does this, you know, does this shirt make me, do these pants make me look fat? And my conclusion usually is no, my fat makes me look fat, but <laughs> that's why I stopped worrying about it. You know, there's only so much, <laughs> I only have so much to work with here. So there's only so much I can do. So you kind of have to accept what you've got and you, and you work with it. You can't beat yourself up about it. Yeah. What's the last insecurity we have? The last insecurity is called social insecurity. Another common type of insecurity surrounds the way that we are perceived by our peers at the ease with which we interact with them. This insecurity can be a reoccurring, low-level problem, or it can blossom into full-blown social anxiety or social phobia. Now, this is that's a very good point about the social phobia here, is that you have people that they have to interact with people, but they have this crippling fear of doing so. Um, I don't interact with people all that much. Um, I don't like people and it's nothing personal. It's just that I deal with people a lot with my job and all of my patience in dealing with people goes into that. So when I get out of work, I'm really not a particularly social individual. Part of it has to do with the hearing insecurity. Part of it has to do with the body image insecurity. Um, part of it has to do with my interests and the things that I like and can talk about are not anywhere near the same kind of categories that other people that I would interact with. Like 
I'm not a sports person. You know, I'll watch football or this or that, but I'm not the type of person that can go to a party and, and sit in a room full of guys and talk about football and, and this athlete and the draft and all that stuff. It doesn't work for me. Um, I'm a technology guy. I'm a, I watch documentaries primarily on TV, so I'm pretty boring. So <laughs> it's difficult for pe- for me to interact with people like that because not that many people are as boring as I am. Um, and that's the, the honest truth about it. Now, do you, do you experience social insecurities on any level? I mean, in certain ways, yes. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm a full-blown introvert or that I have social anxiety, but I definitely experience a lot of things that introverts typically do. Like, I don't really go outside that much. Nobody does now. I mean, yeah. (laughs) Before the pandemic, I should say. Okay. Um, before the pandemic, I never really went outside that often. I only really spoke with friends, and I rarely ever made new ones. Um, and for the most part, I kind of kept to myself. Um, I didn't hate interacting with people. Um, uh, I could definitely socialize with people, especially if there was a topic that I could talk about, because you know how I can monologue, and that kind of yes, gets... You can. And that gets conversations going pretty quickly. Um, but I still had issue, but my main issue was starting conversations. I was never really able to make the first move when it came to talking to people. And there were very few instances where I actually was the one that, um, spoke first. When meeting my one friend, I did end up speaking first, but when meeting another one of my friends, I ended up speaking first. It was kind of... I know I can talk to people, it's just I don't have much experience with starting the conversations. If they can start up... If they start up the conversations, I'll typically be fine, especially if they do mention a topic that I know and can talk about for hours on end. Um, So, overall... I'm an ambivert. So maybe what you need is you need like a cheat sheet of topics that you walk around with so that you can figure out a topic that you can start a conversation with and that'll get you going. Yeah, that's just the thing. Um, I never entirely know how full on extroverts start conversations. Like, I don't know which conversation would be best for which kind of person and in which kind of instance. And it's kind of like I kind of take it into more of like a strategic level in a way and I kind of wonder how extroverts are able to start conversations pretty easily and it makes me kind of wonder like what goes into it. So maybe then what you need is you need your cheat sheet of topics and a die and you roll the die and whatever number comes up that's the topic you're going with. Maybe. I don't know. Just a thought. (laughs) Anyway, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and we're going to look at what some of the signs of insecurity are. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights in the Teens. Today we're talking about insecurities and what are the signs of insecurities. So the first one we have to talk about here is low or superficial self-esteem. One sign of insecurity is low self-esteem or negative self-image. 
particularly when that image seems to be inconsistent with external observation. Low self-esteem means you think badly about yourself or your abilities. It can lead to other problems, especially concerning mental health. Because the measurement of self-esteem generally relies on self-report, insecurity can lead to superficial self-esteem. People with insecurities often want to appear secure. Deliberate misrepresentation or false behavior or information on social media can also be a sign of social anxiety. The act of faking then reinforces the social insecurity. So in this case here, I would, I would probably say that I definitely suffer from a certain amount of social uh, insecurity when it comes to the superficial self-esteem because a lot of times you see even what I'm doing here in the podcast here is a little bit of self-deprecating humor to kind of break the ice and, and ease into things you know, while still staying on topic. Do you think that any of your securities have led to or been caused by a low or superficial self-esteem? Probably, yeah. Um, there are certain parts of me where I know that I'm good in certain things, but then there's always that one part of me that's like, well, what if you're not? And that's probably the part of me that causes most of my insecurities. I can also kind of relate to the feeling of wanting to appear secure. Like, I don't really, I don't really try and hide my insecurities that often, it's just I really don't talk to people about it that often, and it's not like it's ever really come up in conversations, and even on the podcast, when I have talked about my insecurities, they really haven't gone, I really haven't gone too much in depth. Right. Like, there's a part of me that's like, um... That's like wanting to get it out, but also there's all there's the other part of me that's like they probably don't want to hear about your problem, so you can probably just forget about it. Well, and I think there's another aspect of that where it's the vulnerability of it. You know, talking about your insecurities and the things that bother you requires you to let down your guard and it requires you to make yourself vulnerable. And our human instinct is to sort of put up our, our hands and to defend ourselves when we feel vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that need to drop those defenses in order to talk about it is probably one of the things that's causing some resistance as well. Yeah. The next thing they talk about is perfectionism. The inability to be satisfied with progress and need to control and refine projects until they're perfect can be a sign of insecurity. It stems from the sensation that you or your performance is never enough. It could appear as a manifestation of insecurity in any area of life, but is frequently found in cases of job insecurity and body insecurity. Eating disorders, for example, often appear along with both harmful perfectionism and attachment insecurities. Now, I have to ask, because I don't think this applies to me because there's nothing that I do that I strive for perfection in. My motto is good enough is good enough. But you, on the other hand, are tend to be a bit of a perfectionist in some of the things that you work on. Do you think that that is an example of insecurity or is that just your ability to excel at the things that you try to do? Bit of both, I guess. Okay. Um, I definitely always try and succeed whenever I do become a perfectionist. But in some of those instances, um, I have been known to be unsatisfied, even if my work was good enough and satisfactory. And a lot of times I try pushing myself further and sometimes I'm just never satisfied and I'm trying to get better. I have gotten a little better, but still not exactly perfect if you get what I'm saying. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, the, the desire to drive yourself to be better isn't a bad thing unless it gets out of control. Yeah. And I think they're talking about here that this is when it gets out of control, 
where you're trying to control things that you can't control or probably shouldn't control in order to compensate for those insecurities. I don't think that's where you're at, though. I think you you want to succeed because you, you like success. And that's probably the best motivator out there. Yeah, but the times when I don't entirely succeed is really when those insecurities kind of set in. Absolutely. You are very rough on yourself when you don't meet your own expectations. Mm-hmm. Self-isolation is the next thing they mention. Social insecurity can lead people to avoid social interactions, isolating themselves. Sometimes these people prefer to interact virtually in internet situations. They feel they can control. Now this one, I'm, I, I raise my hand and, and I plead guilty on this one because I tend to self-isolate largely because of my social insecurities. Uh, and other people have suffered as a result of this. For instance, you know, mommy's much more social than I am. And early on in our relationship, my insecurities and inability to interact functionally in a social environment meant that we didn't do a lot of the things that mommy wanted to do, or she would have to do them on her own and I would stay home. Um, so one of the things you have to watch out for here is the effect that it's having on other people. Do you feel, I mean, you mentioned that you don't go out much or didn't go out much before the pandemic. Do you feel that you're self-isolating as a result of insecurities or is it something else entirely? I mean, I actually don't think I can entirely relate to self-isolation, despite the fact that I never really went out much. I still interacted with friends, especially at school, and there were instances where I would visit my friends on the weekends. Um, so I wouldn't really say that this entirely applies to me. I did do a bit of self-isolation, especially now, but we can't really compare it to that. Um, but I actually don't entirely think this applies to me um, that, all, that much. Okay, well that's good. Anxious or avoidant is the next Symptom. Attachment insecurities often result in problematic attachment styles or dysfunctional approaches to relationships. The two most common are anxious and avoidant attachments. Anxious attachment styles are characterized by emotional dependence, relying on someone else for your emotional well-being. A fear of being alone and fantasies of perfect relationship relationships that can never be fulfilled. Avoidant attachment styles also stem from insecurity, but go in the other direction. People with this style tend to keep relationships superficial and disengaged from more intimate connections. I, I, I'm kind of on a fence on this one here. I have a very small group of core friends that I hold close. And outside of that group of four or five people, everybody else I have referred to as an associate. So I think I'm kind of a mix of both of these. Do you think this applies to you? I mean, I can definitely say that I'm pretty dependent on a lot of on people, especially with you and Mommy, um, since we have been stuck here for a while and the fact that you guys have that we're very close and that you guys probably have more experience than I do. I depend a lot on you guys whenever I have my problems. And sometimes I do think and wish that, um, I didn't entirely depend on you so hard because I can't imagine the emotional toll it's actually taking on you guys seeing your child, you know, insecure, worried, and just overall having lots of negative emotions. Yeah. That's really not that big a deal. I kind of expect it, you know, as a, as a parent, that's kind of what we do. You know, we're there to support you. We're, we're there to teach you the right path. We're there to help you get over these, any of these insecurities or issues that you have. Um, the absence of that, I think, makes me feel almost like a, 
I don't know, like I'm not a good parent, you know, like if I didn't have that to do, I don't know if I would be able to have that, that feeling of, of, of being an active parent. Um, you know, Sam, for instance, when he was your age and, and growing up, um, we only had him part time on the weekends or every other weekend. So I missed out on a lot of stuff and I missed out a lot on these things and having these talks with him and helping him work through these issues. Usually the time that he was with us, it was his recreational time, his relief time. You know, we'd play video games or go out or something like that. So we never had this kind of interaction with Sam and I didn't realize how much I missed having that until I had the opportunity to, to help you through some of these. That's why I, you know, the whole point of this podcast was, was really to help get you through these so we could have these focus sessions. Um, so it's not a burden, uh, at all on me, uh, nor do I, I don't want to speak for mommy, but I don't suspect it's a burden for mommy either. That's what we do as parents. Um, so that's not something you should ever be concerned about. Yeah, that was also probably one of my other insecurities, feeling like I was a burden on you guys, and I'm pretty sure you are pretty well aware of that at this point. Yeah, we joke around that you're our, our little burden, but <laughs> kids are supposed to be a burden to their parents until they reach a certain age. That's socially acceptable. Um, but that's what being a parent is. It's It's not just hanging out with your kids when it's fun, right? It's about getting through those hard times. It's about guiding you and teaching you and and going through those things with you. Because I can tell you one thing, as a man, you I've gone through more things with you than I, I ever would have if I didn't have a daughter. And it's been a learning experience for me, and it's enriched my life going through these things and understanding these things and seeing things from your perspective. Um, so it's been beneficial for me to go through these types of things. And, and I'm grateful that I have a daughter that I can do that with, you know, the fact that you're, you're that trusting and you're that open to, to talk to us about it, I think is fantastic. So don't stop that. Okay. Uh, moving right along, we have, uh, poor job performance. Uh, job insecurity, not having a stable job, can work to motivate some people, but it more often results in poorer performances. It can lead to you avoiding work, wanting to change jobs after you start at one, disengagement from colleagues and in-group projects, and work attitudes. Now this one is it's really not one that's a team-related one, but this is one that I can definitely... Uh, speak to here because I've been in jobs where, you know, I've been underutilized or I've been underappreciated or I've been put in positions where I'm not qualified to be in there, but I've had to do it anyway. And th the overall lack of confidence uh, mm -hmm. tends to make the job frustrating or scary in some cases, like going to work, knowing that, oh my God, the entire company resides on, on me fixing this issue. And I don't know how to fix the issue right now. And that can be very overwhelming and very anxiety inducing. Mm -hmm. Think of it almost like, um, a project at school and you have a team project and you've got a bunch of kids on the project with you and you have to do your part and you just don't understand how to do it or you don't think you don't have the confidence that you've done it yourself. Is that anything you've ever gone through? I mean, I don't think it wasn't. I mean, I have experienced group projects, um, but I've never really been in that situation too much. Like, I've always gotten my work done in the projects and sometimes, you know, I've been the one person who the only person on the group who's actually done anything about it. Um, but I've never really been in this scenario where, like, every, where, like, I had a really major part and I didn't understand it. For the most part, I understood most of the projects. And 
even if I didn't understand something, I normally would just give it to someone who did. Um, but I can definitely um, picture what that situation would be like. Okay. So the last thing they talk about here is depression or anxiety, which is, you know, they, they, they say the signs of insecurity. Well, depression and anxiety are the signs of so many other things, too. <laughs> so yeah. if, if this is what you're suffering from, it could be one of many things, just, yes. just to be clear. All types of insecurity can lead to decreased mental wellness. Depressive or anxious behavior or thinking is often an effect of insecurity, particularly when in that insecurity produces or is accompanied by wrong beliefs or patterns of thought. Um, have you experienced depression or anxiety that was a related that was related to insecurity at any point? I mean, yeah, I've definitely experienced anxiety, especially when it came to my my academic insecurities. I've never really experienced depressive states that often, um, but anxiety has definitely been something that's come up multiple times, and it is normally a result of mainly my insecurity about my academics, so... And I'm pretty sure it won't stop until, you know, I'm actually out of school. Then it'll probably just be re replaced with job insecurity. You never know. Well, there you go. At least the tradition continues on, right? <laughs> so that was all we had on the signs and symptoms. We're going to take a quick break and come back. And we'll talk about some suggestions on how to deal with insecurities. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today, we're getting insecure. Let's talk about some things about how to deal with insecurity. Occasional insecurity is a natural part of life. For deeper and more long-lasting feelings of insecurity, however, professional therapists can help you sort through your emotions and develop strategies of life. Dealing with insecurity, here's a couple of tips. What's our first tip? Our first tip is that social networks matter. Broad and meaningful social networks, friendships, relationships with coworkers, and more help to lessen both insecurity and its negative effects. There's an inverse correlation between healthy social networks and insecure attachment styles. Having a wide cycle of friends and many close connections allows you to develop the tools and confidence to engage in deeper relationships. And I honestly have to say, this is probably the one thing that has helped me more than anything else is this, is the, the friendships that I've been able to, to call on, um, especially now. Um, and ironically enough, none of them are my friends cause I don't have any friends. Oh. It's, they were all mommy's friends. Um, you know, our friends up in, in Bethlehem. Uh, and other other friends and coworkers that mommy associates with that we've been very fortunate to have interactions with uh, have been very helpful in dealing with insecurities for me. How about you? Do you have a core group of friends that you rely on when you know you're feeling insecure or feeling any of those symptoms? Yeah, I have a group of friends that I typically talk with whenever I feel a bit insecure or need someone to talk to. Um, I definitely think um, the kids my age, I can definitely talk 
with about with more of my insecurities, um, because they can more than likely relate to me. With the slightly younger kids, I kind of hang with them, um, so they kind of give me a bit of entertainment, you know, they kind of de-stress me in a way. They don't entirely, like, I don't entirely tell them all my insecurities, there are points where I do tell them, but normally they just try and help lighten the mood, and I'm thankful for that as well. Yeah, and I think hanging around with the younger kids kind of elevates you to a certain point. You're kind of in that role model position, and having the younger kids look up to you is a confidence boost that that helps you get over that insecurity a lot of times. Yeah. What's our second one? Our second one is that trust takes practice. While having an overly trusting behavior creates its own problems, ask yourself if you have any reason to distrust expressions of affection or liking from others. People with insecurities sometimes express doubt and can perceive re- rejection in everything from a partner relationship to new acquaintances. These expressions can be self-fulfilling. Practice taking displays of interest at face value, something that can ap- that can be easier in more casual relationships. You can build up the confidence to accept deeper affection and intimacy. So, how easy is it for you to trust? Um... I'd say I'm not a hundred percent untrustworthy. Well, not untrustworthy. I know. Untrusting. I don't think I'm a hundred percent untrusting, but I definitely know that the lesson don't trust people. Like, I'd like to think that certain people that people are nice and not entirely bad. Um. And I try not to think badly of people, but there are instances where um, I sometimes trust someone's honesty. Sam, this is is one of those situations where I think you're wise beyond your age. Um, Me, personally, I'm not a very trusting individual. In fact, I don't trust very many people at all. Um, And the people that I do trust are those people that are in my my core group. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's experience. I've been burned a lot of times. And every time you trust someone and get burned in that trust, it makes you a little bit more gun shy to, to give out that trust. And, and I've developed the philosophy over time that trust is, and we've talked about this trust is like currency. It's very easily, it's very difficult to earn it, but it's very easy to squander it. And if people want me to trust them, they have to earn that trust. And my expectations for people in general, and this is probably a kind of a jaded view, but my expectations for people in general are very low. And unfortunately, they seldom fail to meet those low expectations. Uh, so they, a lot of people don't give me reason to trust them. Yeah, and I think my reason for not entirely trusting people is, one, the fear of having something bad happen to me because I know that's happened before. Other people have had experience with it. And there are definitely people who I know I fe- who I feel I can't trust. And the fear of being wronged by people um, is enough to make me more or less cautious of them. Another reason, I'm guessing, is kind of the effect you've kind of had on me. Like you said... (laughs) Gee, thanks. Like you said, you're not a very trusting individual, and you always tell me, trust no one um, but yourself. And um, in a way, I've kind of kept that... Um, I think that also might be one of the reasons I'm not the most sociable person. Um, but I can say I've, I definitely have more trust in people and more, and a bit of higher expectations than you have of people. Um, so you haven't affected me that much. That's good. (laughs) But I definitely am not the most trust. I'm definitely not the most trusting person you'll meet. Well, that's good. I don't. I want you to be wise beyond your ears, but I don't want you to be a miserable old man like me. 
The last thing I did want to talk about, and, and we don't actually have it in the notes here. This is kind of an ad lib. And that's courage. You know, having courage to confront your insecurities or anything, your fears, um, the, the things that make you cringe, I like to say. Um, having the courage to confront those is a major tool. And a lot of people tend to shy away from these things. They shy away from the things that make them uncomfortable or the things that take them outside their comfort zone. Um, and the people that confront these things, you know, your body image, your job insecurity, they're the ones that can make a difference about it. If you're afraid of what it is that you're insecure about and you never confront it or you never address it, then you don't have control. It has control of you. And that's even more frightening, I think. When I have an insecurity, you know, if my insecurity is my body image. And I take to heart everything that people say about me. And people make fun of me. And, and believe me, people have made fun of me my whole life about it. I've been a big guy since, since I was born. Um, little factoid i was actually the biggest kid in the hospital when i was born um which for some reason my mother was very proud of that fact i'm not really sure why but she spoke of it with a great deal of pride when she told me about it uh, so my whole life i've been like that and for a large portion of my life i let people tell me how i felt about myself and i realized later in life that that was a mistake and it wasn't until I took control of that situation and I took control of my own image of what I thought of myself. And I do that with the self-deprecating humor. I'm fat. I get it. I know I am. You know, people, one of the things that kids used to say, you know, oh, oh you're fat. I said, well, I'm fat. You're ugly. I can die. You know, you know, there's something that I can do about it. And, um, and when I realized that, and when I started to take control of those things, it was very liberating. You know, it, it allowed me to have control of that portion of my life back. And I think a lot of people experience that when they've got the courage to confront those insecurities. You know, the first thing is you have to acknowledge that you have the insecurity and why you have it. And then once you do that, then you have the, the choice. You can make the act of choice to do something about it. And even just making that choice, even if you're not successful in dealing with it the way that you initially choose, just the choice to do something about it is liberating. And it it's self-motivating. And it gives you a level of confidence knowing that I'm taking control of this aspect of my life that I didn't have control over. Even if I'm not 100% successful, just the fact that I'm doing something about it is very liberating. So is there anything that you've had or in insecurities that you've had in your life that, that you've chosen to confront and to take on rather than to shy away from it? How, if, you, if so, how did that make you feel? Well, probably the biggest one right now would be my academics. Um, I had insecurities about not being able to get good grades, um, whether or not I was good to be whether or not I should have joined marching band, and exactly how high school was going to go. But it was one of the ones where I'm like, okay, let's try confronting this. For getting better grades, I made sure that I studied more. I checked my answers, and I made sure that I knew what I was doing. Um, I ended up confronting the whole marching band fear by seeing what it was like and checking it out and seeing if it was something I was going to do. Um, while I haven't been fully successful, I've definitely felt a lot better about my academics and, um, confronting them and going to the marching band rehearsal and checking my answers and studying and getting those good grades is very fulfilling and I don't entirely have as large of a, um, fear about it. Yeah, that's great. It's very empowering. You know, when you take control of that situation 
Now, you might not always win the battle with that insecurity, but at least now you're fighting it on your terms and it's not controlling you. So that was all we had for insecurities. We're going to take a, a very quick break and come back and we're going to get your closing thoughts on the topic. Go for your closing remarks. All right, I just wanted to say to everyone that insecurities are normal. Everyone's going to have them. Everyone more than likely has had them. And you're more than likely um, going to have securities your whole life. But there are ways that you can deal with those insecurities. And they can't, and just know that they, they don't have the ability to empower you, to take control of you, as long as you do something about it. Try some of these tips, and if these tips aren't helpful, try seeking, um, you know, higher, great, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> professional help. Try seeking professional help for it. Um, and just know that it's all right. Everyone has insecurities, and you're not alone. Okay. Sage advice, as always. Thank you. Uh, so that was all we had for the show today. I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get video versions listed as Insights into Things. Audio versions of this podcast can be found as Insights into Teens on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Amazon, etc., etc. All in one breath, too. Nice. I would also invite folks to uh, contact us, email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. Get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get high res versions of all of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. We do stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you do get a free Twitch Prime subscription uh, monthly. Uh, if you threw that our way, we'd appreciate it. Audio versions of this podcast can be found at podcast.insightsintoteens.com. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast on Instagram. We're at Instagram.com slash insights into things where you can get links to all that stuff on our website at www.insightsintothings.com and you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights into Entertainment, hosted by you and mommy and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast hosted by you and my brother, Sam. That's it. Another one of the books. Bye, everyone. Bye. into entertainment a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom we'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week we'll talk about theme park and pop culture news We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, 
Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights and Entertainment. This is episode 109, celebrating a return to normal, kind of. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my energetic and understanding co-host, Michelle Whalen. Not feeling very energetic, but thanks. I was running out of adjectives. <laughs> need to get you a thesaurus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to look look some stuff up here. <laughs> That's okay. Anyway, how are you anyway, doing today? I'm doing okay. This seems like the longest week ever that just won't end. Yeah, it just keeps getting longer and longer. <laughs> yeah, they sure do. So, in today's episode on Disney Detective, we're going to talk about Disney World reducing some of their social distancing requirements uh, in select areas of the theme parks. And we'll talk about some stage shows that are back at Walt Disney World. Mm -hmm. So, a little bit of a return to normal there. Yeah, just a little. And our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy Star Wars Celebration 2022 is coming sooner than we expected, but we won't be there. And Disney's Gina Carano is uh, up for Emmy nominations for Mandalorian, so she's kind mm, of... No. No. That's not it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess... When we'll, we get to the story, I'll tell you. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to it. Right. In our entertainment news, James Gunn says Guardians of the Galaxy 3 is the end of the story. Dun, dun, dun. It's interesting. I saw an interview uh, with... Uh, Dave Bautista, right. who plays Drax, and he's pushing for a Drax solo movie, oh, but with someone else as Drax. Oh, okay. So he thinks that there's some story that, can, that okay. can be milked out of that one. So, okay. Also, NBC is canceling the Golden Globes for 2022. Mm -hmm. They've got a bit of a reputation they need to work on there. Yep. Uh, and then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. We didn't mm -hmm. have any afterthoughts this week, it looks like. No. Unless you slipped a minute at the end no, there and didn't, I didn't. tell me. No, okay, no, good. Nothing there. Before we get started, though, I would uh, invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get video versions of the podcast, of all of our show's podcasts, uh, if you look up Insights into Things, or you can get just audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment. We're available on Google, Apple, Pandora, Amazon, Stitcher, any place you can get a podcast these days. We would also invite folks to uh, write in, give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We're at Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we're at insights into things. Or you can get all those links on our website and give us feedback through there at www.insightsintothings.com. Shall we get started? Sure, let's do it. All right. Go for Disney Detective. So uh, this news story actually came out on Wednesday. Um, obviously, today we know there were a lot of CDC uh stories that came out uh, about different things uh, as opposed to masks and social distancing. But Walt Disney, they actually came out with their updated um, uh, announcement on, uh, on Wednesday. Uh, so this article actually came from clickorlando.com, but a m bunch of different news sources uh, were, were talking about it, um, saying that Walt Disney World has announced plans to relax physical distancing measures in select areas of its park. So since the Orlando area park, uh, parks had reopened last year, guests have been required to maintain six feet of distance between one another to prevent the spread of COVID. Um, also, there were other measures when parking your car, they were parking every other spot and every other row to kind of keep the cars uh, separated while people were getting in and out. And then they were going back in and filling up the spots after the, the row and all of the guests had already been in. Um, so now it seems that on Wednesday, the company website had indicated that um, measures would kind of be relaxed in certain spots. So they said, 
Temporary adjustments are still in place to promote physical distancing, while we will reduce physical distance distancing measures for guests across many areas with a gradual phased approach. Six feet, di- uh, six feet distancing measures will continue in all of our dining locations, merchandise stores, and in areas where guests can temporarily remove their masks. One of the things that was interesting was one of the websites did a screenshot of how you know the the policy had changed and it was very minute changes uh where the one showed two people with a little line saying six feet now it just showed two people but it didn't actually have like a measurement so in most cases they're saying people can get a little bit closer um but again in certain areas they'll they're still keeping the six feet apart um Excuse me. So again, so they still have, you know, signage and and ground markings, um, you know, to keep guests, uh, you know, apart while they're waiting in line uh, in certain queue areas. They do still have uh, physical barriers uh, to separate people um, when they're on transportation vehicles or on certain rides or breaking up the queue. Uh, They do have uh, a notice about um, party size that if you're traveling in 10 or more, you will be asked to split up into smaller groups for certain things. They are asking if you're paying for parking to use a cashless pay system. Uh, They were talking about how cast members are going to be trained to engage with guests and promote physical distancing guidelines in common areas and queues. Um, And again, they've already... Um, you know, been doing a lot of this. One of the things that they stopped doing, which we briefly mentioned last week, is as of May 8th, cast members were no longer getting their temperature checks when they re- were reporting to work. And as of the 16th of May, guests are going to stop being screened before entering any of the parks. Um, face coverings, as of this point, are still required. Uh, you're only allowed to take them off when you're actively eating or drinking, or if you're taking an outside photo, as long as you're that you remain still. So if you're on the move, you're still at this point supposed to be wearing a mask. Um, and it seems Universal had already made some of these similar changes as well, where they've now reduced uh, six feet distance to the three feet distance. So I, I think the problem you're going to run into at this point is as we gradually roll these mm-hmm. these um, guidelines back, people are going to get very confused by this. Right. You know, what are the rules this week? How far can I be this mm-hmm. week? Where can I take my mask off? Right. It, it's almost, I think it would almost have been better if they had kept full guidelines until they could just remove them all. Right, right. As um, opposed to going you know, backwards of, okay, now you can do this. You yeah. Know. Like how do you we just got that? used to right. doing everything one way. Why not just kind of. Right. And how it? do you convey this in a way that's understandable to people? Mm-hmm. Especially when you're like, you know, they took one step last week with temperature checks. Now they're taking a set, a set of different checks here. They're not doing away with stuff. They're just changing right. the way. And and that's the thing is, like I said, when you look at the two screenshots that that various uh, websites have posted of what it was and what it is, it's really kind of hard to see where sure, yeah. where the difference lies. Because if you're still splitting up your group of 10 or more, you still can't all sit together at a restaurant and you're still separating everybody six feet in a restaurant what difference does it make if you're on a right. ride? Right. Like, and that's how the problem, is that? Is that you're mixing right. your uh, standards here. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's three feet, if three feet's okay in one instance, why isn't it okay in all right. instances? Right. Um, it, it's just, I don't, I don't think this is going to work out too well. And hopefully we'll be able to pull the plug on all this stuff very right. soon. Right. Um, but good thing we're not going to Disney anytime soon. <laughs> exactly. So as, you know, kind of a, another sign that things are changing and getting better, we, we're getting some shows back, right? Right. Let's so, talk about that. So this was uh, a, a nice uh, surprise because obviously when everything shut down and, and things started to open back up, a lot of the live entertainment was – they were one of the first ones that were hurt by it all that – 
couldn't come back um, because they had no idea how to do any of the the live stage shows. Uh, so it seems that they're trying this out to see how how it goes. So it's actually a celebration of the Festival of the Lion King. So it's actually a modified version of the Festival of the Lion King show that is performed at Disney's Animal Kingdom. Um, and so what they're doing to accommodate the COVID-19 restrictions is the theater's capacity has been greatly reduced to accommodate one third of its actual capacity. So you have to leave empty rows um, between different groups. Uh, parties are seated in groups of four. So if you have a group of four or, or more than four, you're going to be split up so that this way they're making sure everybody has, um, you know, some distance. Uh, there's no virtual queue or fast pass in the operation. So there's just a standby line and they basically have it where it snakes throughout Africa, uh, a bridge over to Pandora and then kind of back to, to Africa. So you're kind of spread. And that's one of the things you've seen numerous times is the queue lines look really huge for a lot of these things when really it's not it's just because they have to space everybody out and it's you know right. where do we go now um so the show itself uh being a little bit modified it's only about five minutes shorter uh because of it um they did uh one of the air uh one of the acts used to be tumble monkeys and another were uh, was a flying bird segment. So those have been cut as of right now. But they're hoping that as things get a little bit better, they're able to bring those aspects of the show back as well. Also, another aspect of the show is uh, guest participation. That's been elim uh, eliminated as well. So they used to, at the end of the show, kind of get the kids all to come and do a little parade um, around the the theater. That obviously isn't going on. Um, so right now the show is doing unannounced previews, but it's officially going to debut on May 15th. So, you know, here's at least the first show that's coming back. So hopefully, you know, more will be coming back. And the other thing, too, is they've modified the show so that this way they can spread out uh, the guests as well as the cast members, the actors that are in the show as well. So that this way they're not right on top of each other either. So so now what rules apply here uh, under the circumstances of it being the show? Are you six feet apart? Are you three feet apart? Well, they have everybody, you know, you can see from, from the video here, this was a video of the show. Everybody's kind of, you know, spread out in some cases more than six feet, um, you know, in, in most cases. So they're leaving, you know, rows in front, rows behind you, and then leaving so much room in between the row. And even if, you know, I'm guessing maybe the people that are a little close to each other are probably people that are within the same party. Right. So they probably, you know, group them, um, you know, together. So, uh, you know, it's a step in the right direction, yeah. right? And again, you have to wear your mask, even though you're at the theater and, and you're not moving, you still have to wear the mask. So, right. so if you had a choice of what show you'd want to bring back next, what would it be? Phantasmic. See, and I don't know why they don't do that now. Cause you can spread out pretty well in Phantasmic if you don't pack everybody in like they usually well, do. And that's the thing is and unfortunately they, they always, you know, pack everybody. And well, technically this is kind of, it's not really indoor. It's just kind of covered. Mm. Um, you know, the Beauty and the Beast show would be nice, too. And and that's the thing is a lot of them, they have very large theaters. Right, and right. really, besides Fantasmic, most of the shows, depending on what time of year you're going, don't get fully packed. So you could space people out. Uh, you know, sure. a little bit more. Yeah. Um, Fantasmic's one because they usually only do it once or twice a night. That's where you get standing room only. Well, so you, you just get... you limit your capacity. Well, yeah, you and that's what you have to do. The, yeah, know, if it's for public safety, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, all right. So that's all we have for our Disney detective. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back with our tales from the edge of the other side of the room. I'm Galaxy. <laughs> For over 
For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. that intro shorter it's too long okay anyway go for tales from the edge <laughs> of the galaxy so this was something uh that you actually had sent over to me um it was news that star wars celebration anaheim 2022 was actually changing their dates uh so they had released today that the dates of star wars celebration are actually moving up originally they were going to be august 18th through the 21st and now they're going to be May 26th through the 29th. Uh, so in their press release, they said, we can't wait to welcome fans back safely. Current ticket holders that wish to keep their existing tickets will have their orders automatically transferred to the new dates and will receive a new confirmation email. And if fans uh, want to keep their ticket, no further action is needed. If you already had your ticket and wanted a refund, you need to do it before June 11th of this year. Um, so no word on when you can start buying tickets for it. I'm, you know, obviously everybody that had tickets already uh, are kind of already in the queue, I guess. So we were actually thinking about going to it and now we're not sure. So we'll kind of wait and well, I see. I think we're, we're pretty sure we're not going. That we're not point. going now. I don't think I'm going to be comfortable flying at this point by then. By next still, year. So. Okay. Yeah, well, and we're not driving. So. <laughs> right, because that's a really long like drive 3, for us. 3,500 miles. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think But we'll hopefully, pass. you know, there'll be. We'll wait for Celebration to come back to Orlando. To Orlando and, and, and do that. that. But hey, if it was a D23 convention, you'd be flying out. Yeah. So yeah, that I, we're still I not sure about. Do. Well, yeah, see ya. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> One day I'll make it to one. So, um, so, yeah, so some good news for people looking forward to, to Star Wars Celebration. Did they say why they moved it up? No, there was it, nothing. Was it a scheduling conflict or something? Because usually, you know. If anything, you move it back. Yeah, you never move it. Yeah, under the current conditions. It just seemed odd. Yeah. Maybe it was, I don't know, convention yeah. center wasn't available. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, tell us about our favorite uh Mandalorian <laughs> actress. Yeah. So it seems that despite Lucas um you know Lucasfilm stating that they would no longer work with her, it had uh it they included her in their Emmy for your consideration awards push for the Mandalorian. So on Sunday, a poster surfaced from Disney, which owns the Star Wars production company, promoting cast members, including Pedro Pascal and Giancarlo Esposito for awards contention. Uh, Carano is listed under the best supporting actress category. Obviously in February, we had the whole, backfiring of everything where she had posted a now deleted uh, post on Instagram that ended up, you know, getting her fired. Um, but again, it was kind of funny that with all of this, she's listed as, you know, one of the people in contention, you know, for, hey, for your consideration, nominate the <laughs> <laughs> funny people. how she's the only supporting actress nominated right well because the other thing too is in most cases everybody else was a guest actor that was only yeah, in but she didn't appear in that many episodes though right but everybody else pretty much only appeared in like one or two she uh i i guess there has to be there's probably something where how much screen time 
You I have. Guess, but I would have thought Ming Na Wei would have been in there as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of surprised that she. Well, she is. As she's guest actor. She's as a guest actor. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know what, you know, what the, um, uh, you know, guidelines are for, you know, what makes you just a supporting actor or what makes you a guest, right? You know, star because. Really, you know, Mark Hamill was listed. <laughs> he well, technically he didn't wasn't... even actually appear on screen, so I don't know how. Right, he got so it's kind of yeah. Like, do you just kind of hey, Mark Hamill's likeness? Well, and it's almost like it's a list of this is everybody that was in this season. Right, nominate right. somebody, <laughs> please. Like that, it, yeah. it's kind of yeah. So we'll say you know uh, the Emmy Awards are scheduled to take place September of this year. So we'll see uh, who actually gets gets the nominations. So on a side note, related but not related. Okay. Uh, they had decided, um, National Geographic decided to air the episode of oh, Running Wild right. with Bear Grylls. Which we knew. With Gina Carano in it. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, after watching it, I have a very different opinion of, of her now. Okay. Um, she does not, like... So the controversy that that kind of got her in bad standing with Disney was about her social media posts. Mm-hmm. And she had some, let's call them obtuse statements or insensitive statements, mm-hmm. um, which gives you a certain impression of of the attitude she, she might have towards other people. Mm-hmm. And... She came across very different on the show itself. And the, the one the one thing that that's I like about the show is as much as a lot of the adventure stuff they do is staged, one of the things that they do is they interview the person who's participating with Bear Grylls. Okay. And you're being interviewed under duress. So you're you're there confronting things that are terrifying to you you're being put in a very uncomfortable position sometimes literally very uncomfortable you're being forced to face your fears and you the real you comes out under those stressful circumstances and she came across as a very sensitive very vulnerable individual and you can tell that it was real because there, you know, she's conveying stories. Uh, like one story she conveys in the episode is um, about her sister. Bear asks about her sister, and her sister had an addiction problem. And they didn't go into real details about it, but she was in pretty bad shape, and they thought that, you know, she she was probably going to wind up killing herself as a as a part of that. And they talked about how almost like an intervention they. She helped her sister out, and then her sister had her first child, and it saved her life. And to see that that sensitivity come out and that vulnerability come out under very honest circumstances um, re- gave me a very different impression of her, um, where I think the controversy that came out of her social media stuff probably wasn't an accurate reflection of who she is. Mm. It it may have been external influence. It may have been any number of things, but seeing her on the show, you know, running wild really gave me a a different appreciation for the type of person that she is. Um, And I, and I, I came across where I have a lot more respect for her now. Um, anybody that goes through the stuff that on that show that they do, I have a lot of respect for. Right. Um, but she, I don't look at her in the same negative way as I did prior to that show. So I think from an image standpoint, it was an excellent idea to get that out there and to let people see a little bit about who she really is Mm -hmm. and to, to get a glimpse of that, that inside personality that she has. So, because she talks in the show about being cast in these strong leading roles all the time, and she's this strong, tough person, and in reality, she's not. You know, she, personally, she has 
all these insecurities and, and you know, self image problems and, and all this other stuff. And it really humanized her. Hmm. Um, so if you haven't watched the show yet, I think it's worth, even if you're not into watching the adventure shows and stuff like that, it's worth watching to kind of get a glimpse of what the real Gina Carano is to watch that show. Well, and maybe that was kind of, since they allowed it to air, maybe that was almost some of their PR cleaning up. Absolutely. You know, I would, I would not put that past Disney. You know, to say, well, because maybe some of those other rumors that, you know, we talked about in previous weeks about, oh, she might still be coming back. Maybe they're trying to save face and whatever. Maybe that. Well, and Disney's the type of organization that's very calculating. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to put something like that show out. Right. Then they're going to see what the fan reaction is. Mm-hmm. And if the fan reaction by airing out our dirty laundry is positive. Then we'll see what the next step is to to bring her back into yeah, the fold. And maybe that mm. it's a great character that she portrays. She does a fantastic mm-hmm. job doing it. Mm-hmm. I'd love to see the character in the show more. I just wish she would play by the rules of of Disney in order to do that. Yeah. So that was all we had for our tales from the edge of the galaxy. Mm-hmm. We'll be back in a minute with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Dude, stealing my thunder. Go for entertainment news. <laughs> so James Gunn says that Guardians of the Galaxy 3 might be the end of the story. So James Gunn loves to interact with fans on social media. And when somebody asked him about potentially working on a fourth Guardians of the Galaxy movie, he was incredibly candid about the franchise's future. He said that, you know, although he's open to anything... Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 was kind of the bookend to the story that started the first movie. He said, me, never say never, but I see Volume 3 as the end of the Guardian story that I started telling back in Volume 1. Um, as you had mentioned about Dave Batista, Gunn's post also came um, as... Dave Batista has suggested that his contract was going to be up at the end of filming of Galaxy 3 and that he insisted, again, that Drax could still live on, but in it with another actor. But then Gunn kind of wrote back and said that he really only sees Batista in that role. Uh, so will Guardians 3 be the final movie? Um, we, you know, I guess we'll, we'll have to kind of wait and see uh, what happens. Obviously, the movie was very successful. It was a welcome sign for Marvel because it gave, uh, you know, people a chance to see lesser known heroes and, you know, and a different type of Marvel movie than we've been, you know, seeing over the past years. And, you know, then they even got, you know, Disney transformed the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror in Disneyland into the Guardians of the Galaxy mission breakout ride. And there's also another Guardians of the Galaxy ride that's coming to Epcot. Um, I 
guessing probably next year because of all the the de- delays and whatnot. Um, but then again, as you were mentioning, Batista had said that you know he's been with the franchise from the start. By the time Volume 3 is going to be released, he's actually going to be 54 years old. And he said that he's ready to kind of hand it over to somebody else. So maybe that's where the whole tie-in was. Hey, you could still do a story with Drax, just have, you know, somebody else do it. So I guess we have to kind of wait and see. I believe Guardians doesn't come out until next year, I think is what the uh, the Marvel uh, trailer had yeah, it for. Right. So. We'll have to, you know, wait and see. So maybe it is. Maybe they just do Guardians as a, a trilogy or if they, you know, do another version, maybe it's a different group of, of characters. Yeah, and I and I have to confess, I was not a big Guardians fan of the comics. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what direction they ever went in the comics itself. It was always kind of a fringe comic. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't one of the mainstream. So it's it kind of shocked me and it shocked a lot of other people that, that Disney turned it into such a big franchise. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I'll be honest when we, when we saw the first guardians of the galaxy and everyone said, Oh yeah, they're going to be folding this into the Avengers Marvel cinematic universe. And I'm thinking, how are you going to do that? Right. Like, it, it, like did not even make sense to right, do that. Right. But they did. Um, but and they it, did and they did a good and job. And it worked. It. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know where you're going in the third movie though. I mean, right. after fighting a celestial, Right. What do you fight now? You fought right. a Celestial, you fought a Titan. What's next? God? Is it Guardians of the Galaxy versus God now? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Okay, so Golden Globe news. Yeah, so this came out uh, earlier. Uh, it was actually on Monday. So it seems there's been some growing Hollywood pushback against uh, you know the scandal-plagued Hollywood Foreign Press Association And the avalanche of it all on Monday came as NBC announced that it would not broadcast the Golden Globes award ceremony in 2022. So the network's decision comes after there was an array of top flight film and TV companies, including Netflix, Amazon, Warner Media, who have all been distancing themselves from the Hollywood Foreign Press and the Globes in recent days. So the Hollywood Foreign Press has not said whether it'll try to hold the Globes, you know, ceremony next year. So they haven't even mentioned anything yet. So it seems the 87 member group is made up of critics of overseas media outlets and has been engulfed in uh, by issues ranging from preferential treatment sought by its members to lack of racial uh, representation in its ranks, which includes no black members, according to the Los Angeles Times investigation last year. So some of the problems, you know, have kind of been an open secret for year for years among Hollywood insiders, but everybody's kind of just looked past it and just kind of gone on with it. Another blow to not only all of this is that um, as of Monday, Tom Cruise has now returned three of his Golden Globes uh, that he got for Born for the for- Born on the Fourth of July and Jerry Maguire, according to Variety, um, and that follows criticism of a group of other opulent A-listers, including Scarlett Johansson and Mark Ruffalo. So, you know, it's not only hey, we're not even showing your show. There are people that are like, I don't even want your award anymore. That's that's pretty bad yeah. when you know people are, are giving back their awards. Um, so they say we continue to believe that the Hollywood Foreign Press is committed to meaningful reform. However, change of this magnitude takes time and work, and we feel strongly that the Hollywood Foreign Press needs time to do this. As such, NBC will not air the 2022 Golden Globes, assuming the organization. Ex- executes on its plan, we are hopeful to return to air the show January of 2023. And that was a statement from NBC. Um, so it's kind of interesting to to have everybody go against them, you know, for the first time in, you know, I don't even know how many years it, it's been. Um, so... Well, see, and my response to that is, well, it's about time. Right. Because... They've got a pattern of this mm-hmm. abuse and and yeah. neglect for for years, right? 
why all of a sudden are these actors waking up and doing something about yeah. it? Tom, when did Tom Cruise get his well, first Golden Globe? And, that, and that's the thing. You know, it wasn't even like, like they were recent ones. They were all right. from the 90s, born on the 4th of July, and Jerry Maguire. Like, yeah, so geez. he's held on to him this long, and all of a sudden <laughs> right. he's now decided he's, to do something now, about it. Now, you know what? I'm, I don't need him. Maybe they were taking him to spit. Maybe he was purging. Maybe, I mean, <laughs> See, I think <laughs> he, he, hasn't had a, he hasn't had another Mission Impossible movie in the last six months, so he needed to <laughs> he get... He needed something. He needed to get some he needed, attention. Right, right. So... Yeah. I, I don't know. It, 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 don't participate. You know, right. this is, everyone complains about cancel culture and well, it's not cancel culture. It's consequence culture. Right. Right. You know, but the problem is, is that people have looked, turned a blind eye all these years now, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, now we're going to do something about it. No, it's a, it's a bit hypocritical. I think. Well, at least they're waking up now. Well, yeah, I guess it's about time. Mm -hmm. Better better late than never, right? Yep. So, all right. That was all we had for our entertainment news this week. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Yep. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick this week is Marvel's Agent Carter. Um, now you might be saying, wait, didn't that already air well yeah it did it just so happens that now with marvel and disney you have a lot of things showing up on disney plus that you haven't seen in a while um so uh marvel's agent carter happens to be on disney plus um so the first season takes place in 1946 with peggy carter having to balance the routine of office work that she does for the SSR in New York City with secretly assisting Howard Stark, who finds himself framed for supplying deadly weapons to the enemies of the United States. Carter is assisted by Jarvis, um, by Stark's butler, Edwin Jarvis, who, uh, to who find those responsible and to dispose of the weapons in the second season, Carter moves from New York city to Los Angeles to deal with the threats of a new age, a new atomic age by the secret empire in the aftermath of world war II, gaining new friends, a new home and a potential new love interest who isn't, um, Captain America, just FYI. Um, so the first season consists of eight episodes, which originally aired um, January to uh, February in 2015. And the second season consisted of 10 episodes, which ran uh, January, uh, March, January to March in 2016. Both seasons actually aired during mid-season breaks for uh, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And even though it did really well. NBC canceled them after two seasons, which we were kind of upset about because we really enjoyed the show and it was a nice little tie in, um, you know, to Captain America and, you know, the other characters. And then what ended up happening was later on, uh, if you watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., one of the characters, the other characters from, um, Agent Carter, he ends up becoming a character in in Shield. So, and it's one of those things we started watching it, or I started watching rewatching it again with our daughter because we did Falcon Winter Soldier, and she's up on all of the Marvel things. So now here's you know to give you a little backstory in Peggy's life, and you know why mommy you know likes her little agent carter pop so much okay cool pick thank you so my pick this week is not a documentary oh my god really it's not a crusty old show or or movie that i dug up this is actually fresh brand new hot off the presses this week's uh insightful pick for me is the bad batch now, they call themselves the Bad Batch, but the motley crew that makes up Clone Force 99 boasts an astounding 100% success rate and skills unseen in any other clone troopers. Adept at working together, even after the end of the Clone War, Hunter, Wrecker, Tech, and Echo continue to operate as a unit using their unique talents and specialized physiology 
to survive at the dawn of the Empire. Star Wars The Bad Batch follows the elite and experimental clone troopers of the Bad Batch first introduced in the Clone Wars as they find their way in a rapidly changing galaxy in the immediate aftermath of the Clone War. Members of the Bad Batch, a unique squad of clones who vary genetically from their brothers in the clone army, each possess a singular exceptional skill that makes them extraordinarily effective soldiers and a formidable crew. Uh, cl- 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 crew. So they kind of telegraphed this in the last season of Clone Wars when Disney had brought the Clone Wars back to finish the last season. Okay. There was a couple of episode arc that had the Bad Batch in there, and it kind of left everybody scratching their heads as to who are these guys? What are they doing with them? Why are they showing up here? It has nothing to do with the overarching story of the season. What's going on? And it turns out it was just a preview of their own show. Because, like, with Disney, everybody gets their own show now. Of course. Um, I was not excited about this. Um, I was not particularly enamored by them when they showed up in the Clone Wars. I, Being the Disney, the Star Wars purist that I am, um, I, I, I didn't like the idea that you had these clones that were unique. Because then they're not clones if they're unique. Um. And the storyline behind them was a little extraordinary. And I don't know. I just didn't, I didn't like it. So I was hesitant to watch the show itself, but I finally broke down and I watched it and it it works. Surprisingly, well, it works. The first episode starts off right when next uh, order 66 is, is executed. And what was very interesting was the very first episode brings another character in from rebels who you don't get to see them in this light as an actual Jedi okay. in, in rebels. So it's a little bit more backstory there. You get to see other characters. Tarkin shows up in this and he's going to be a protagonist here. Um, the dynamic between the team is very interesting the way they do it. And they introduce another um, character who's another oddball, you know, from the, from the clones that uh, I'm still a little kind of the jury's still out on whether or not I'm going to like this character or not. Um, but the first episode, you know, I got that under my belt now. It was was very well done. And again, it's one that's the show's run by Dave Filoni. So it's going to be good. So, you know, you're going to like it. Right. <laughs> like, even if I didn't want to like it, I'm going to like it no matter what. So anyway, The Bad Batch on Disney Plus uh, streaming now. And we'll be right back. Awesome. So that was all we had this week for insights and entertainment. Did you have any parting words or anything to, uh, what are we doing this weekend? Didn't we have an event this weekend that sold out that people can't go to? Or is that next weekend? No, that's in like two weeks, two weeks, the, okay. um, monster mania, monster but mania. there was something that, uh, for the, uh, colonial theater, I think it is in Phoenixville. They usually do like monster movie things or whatever. They were doing, um, the fog and that's a good movie. Something else. They were doing like a double feature. I think there were still tickets available. And it's the weekend of Memorial Day. It's like that Saturday oh, okay. night. Oh, I can't remember what the other movie was. If Urgh. there's tickets available next week, we'll have to well, throw it in. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll mention it uh, next week then. Before we go, though, I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get video versions of all of our shows listed under Insights into Things, right? <laughs> Things, yes. Things. Things. Entertainment. Uh, sorry, brain fart. Uh, it's the end of the day, end of the week. Exactly. You know? uh, then you can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights in Entertainment. Into Entertainment. I mumbled there. Um, Mumbles. Yeah, I'm getting tired here. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, all of our podcasts are listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Amazon, any place you can get a podcast. And we would also invite you to uh, contact us, give us your feedback. 
You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us at Twitter at insights underscore things. On Facebook, we're at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things. You can get audio versions of this podcast at podcast.insightsinentertainment.com. You can find us on YouTube at youtube.com backslash insights into things. We stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things things and then you can also find us on, i'm was, not the only one <laughs> you can find us on the web so if you forget any of those other links go to our main website to find links to everything at insights into things.com go to them there's interwebs right. <laughs> that's it another one in the books have a good week everyone bye bye For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow. This is episode 10, Decision 2020, Trump vs. Biden. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my co-host, Sam Whalen. Hello. How you doing today, Sam? Doing all right. The weather's kind of lame, but, uh, you know. Yeah, it is pretty rough out there, isn't yeah, it? Cold and rainy, but, um, you know, inside's warm, so. That is true, and I don't mind the cold. I like the cold. <laughs> So we've danced around uh, politics on this show for a little while now. We've touched on it a little bit as impartially as possible. Uh, last week we delivered, or last episode, we deliberately avoided talking politics and opted for a, a bit of a softball topic. But I don't think we can avoid it this week. No, we are shooting this on Sunday, the Sunday before the election on the 3rd on Tuesday. So Indeed. Um <clears throat> Given the number of early votes that have been cast, I don't think anything that we say here is going to change anyone's mind uh, any more than any of the candidates campaigning out there are going to change anyone's mind. However, I do think it's a worthwhile discussion for us to have comparing the candidates. Um, and I think we're going to kind of go about this in a kind of a different way. We're going to do it scored sort of like a boxing match. Uh, we'll do a tale of the tape between the two candidates and look at some of their key vital information. And then we're going to do five rounds that are based on a couple of uh, surveys that have been done over the past couple of weeks. And we'll score on a 10 point must each round. What each candidate uh, 
how they perform in these polls. And then we'll give our opinions at the end of who won, why they won, and so forth. Good to go? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, before we start, let's get some uh, podcast business out of the way. Yeah, so some of the rigmarole, your uh, various subscriptions, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcast, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and on Amazon. If you have Amazon Prime, that means you have Twitch Prime, and we would appreciate it if you would help us with those. Uh, you get one free Twitch Prime sub a month. Uh, it would really help us out if you were to give that to this channel. Uh, you can contact us at, uh, you can email us, sorry, at com- comments at insightsintothings.com. On Twitter, we are at insights underscore things. Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. And if you missed any of these links, they're all on the web at insights into things.com. Awesome. And we'll be right back with the tale of the tape. <laughs> So we have two candidates that will be vying for the candidacy for president of the United States for the next four years. The first is the incumbent, the defending champion, uh, Donald J. Trump. Uh, we're going to look at their political affiliation, their age, where they're from, a little bit about their um, history, their family history, uh, some education, and some military uh, status uh, history that they have. I'll go down Donald Trump, and how about you go down uh, Joe Biden's record sure. for us? All right. So Donald J. Trump's political affiliation currently is Republican. He was previously a reform-minded um, individual. He was a Democrat, registered Democrat, and a registered independent. Uh, he is now Republican, has been Republican since at least 2016, when he bought, I mean, when he won the uh Nomination from the Republican Party. He is 74 years old. He is, as he has mentioned several times in his rallies in Florida, a senior citizen. He is from Queens, New York, originally. He has been married multiple times. Uh, His first marriage was to Ivana uh, from 77 to 92, which ended in divorce. And he was married to Maria. From 93 to 99, and currently married to Melania since 2005. He has four children? Five children. He has Don Jr., Ivanka, Eric, Tiffany, and Baron. Tiffany, we don't hear too much about these days. Uh, Don Jr. and Eric are very active, as well as Ivanka in his campaign, and uh, Baron is uh, under 18 at this point, so he kind of stays below the radar. Uh, his alma mater is uh, Wharton School of Business, which he transferred to from, um, I forget where he originally went. It was in uh, Bronx, New York. I know that was where the school was, but he's a product of the Wharton School of Business. He has a BS in economics. Military service. Uh, this has been something that was kind of uh, controversial for him in the past. Uh, he had four student draft deferments while in car- uh, college during the Vietnam War. Uh, in 66, he was deemed fit for service. 68, July of 68, he was classified as eligible to serve. In October of 68, he was medically deferred as a 1Y, unqualified for duty except in case of national emergency, which I guess Vietnam didn't constitute a case of national emergency. And then in 72, he was reclassified to 4F due to bone spurs and permanently disqualified from the service. And that is the tale of the tape for Donald Donald J. Trump. Tell us about Joe Biden. Okay, so Joseph R. Biden Jr., uh, his political affiliation is a Democrat. Uh, He's been Democrat his entire uh, career, his political career. Uh, He is 77 years old, so three years older than Donald Trump. Uh, He's from Scranton, PA, which I didn't actually know that. Um, Local-ish, kind of, you know. Uh, His spouse is Jill Biden. They were married in 1977. He was previously married to Neil Knight, uh, Neilia. Neilia. Sorry about that. Uh, they were married from 1966 to 1972, and unfortunately, she passed away. Uh, he has two children, uh, three children. Sorry, uh, four children. 
<laughs> and the count keeps going. I know, I know. They're hiding in there. Uh, Hunter, Bo, who unfortunately passed away, Ashley, and Naomi, who also unfortunately passed away. Uh, his alma mater is Syracuse University. He got a degree in law there. Uh, his military service, he had five student draft deferments while in college. And in 1968, he was medically deferred as a one y due to asthma. And he, much like Donald Trump, unqualified for duty except in case of national emergency. And that is Joseph R. Biden. So they are our candidates that will be vying for president. And uh, we'll be right back for round one. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. So round one of our showdown here between uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden, we're going to be talking about the key issues. Uh, this information comes from a survey done by a website called yougov.com. And we have a couple of different issues that will kind of go down the route of where these candidates stand on the issues and where America, Survey of Americans, actually falls. So the first key issue that we talk about is nominating the next Supreme Court justice. Um, obviously, this has been done already. Uh, she's been confirmed. Trump, uh, his stance was to confirm the nomination immediately. Biden and the Democrats wanted to wait until after the election. When America was polled on this, 53% of Americans said they would rather wait until after the election for the confirmation. So the majority of Americans sided with Biden on that one. What's our next category? Uh, so our next category is handling the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, President Trump said he declared victory and wants to move on. He had the virus himself and proclaims to have been cured of it. Uh, Biden wants to implement mandatory masks, social distancing, and other recommendations from medical professionals. Uh, America, uh, 45% of America was confident in Biden, while 37% were confident in Trump. So it looks like most people uh, side with Biden uh, on that issue. Yes, they do. The next is the economy and fixing the economy. Trump th thinks the economy is doing great and it's the best there ever was. Biden acknowledges the impact of COVID on our workers and our families. America thinks 37% think things will get better under Trump and 32% think things will get better under Biden. So America is siding with Donald Trump on this one. Uh, the next category, race and violence in our cities. Uh, Trump doesn't think there's systematic racism in the country and condemns any violence. Uh, Biden acknowledges racism in the country and condemns the violent protests and uh, supports the more peaceful ones. Uh, Americans, 39%, think they are mostly violent. Riots, well, 32% think they are peaceful protest. Uh, so it looks like most people are swinging towards thinking they're violent riots um, and are against that. Correct. The next we look at and the last... Uh, item we look at in this round is integrity of the election, which has been quite controversial over the past few months. Trump is attacking mail-in voting as ripe with fraud. Biden encourages people to vote any way they can, uh, especially considering the conditions we're in under a pandemic. America was asked if they have confidence in the election. 
16% have a great deal of confidence in the election and the electoral process. 8% have no confidence at all in the election. Now, it's interesting to point out that there were a number of other uh, levels of confidence that were in this survey. I took the top and the bottom here. So the vast majority of people did fall in the middle. I was kind of looking for those extremes here to see where people had that high degree or complete lack of confidence. So it looks like by a margin of two to one, people are siding with Biden saying that this is they are confident in the election and process itself. Now that does bring an end to round one here. And it was pretty well divided, I think. Uh, what are your opinions on round one? Yeah, I mean, it looks like most things were pr pretty split the way you'd think they would go. Um, one thing that did surprise me was the 8% having no confidence at all in the election. I'm not sure what I thought the number would be, uh, but 8%, honestly, I thought it'd be a little bit higher given the the issues we had in the 2016 election and, and elections in the past and the all the rhetoric surrounding voting in general. I thought that the number would be higher, honestly. Yeah, and I agree with you. I'm surprised it was below 10% there. I kind of yeah. figured it would edge a little bit higher. Uh, but it is good to know that the vast majority of people do think that they, they have confidence in the election. So we are scoring these rounds on a 10-point scale, 10-point must, and uh, we will tally up our totals at the end of the matches. Do we want to do uh, each our scores each, for each round or just count it all at the end? Well, I would I would pencil in your, your score now, and okay. then we'll do the math at the end there, and we'll just give the totals. Okay. Um, so that's it for round one. We'll be back in a minute with uh, round two. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, Guild Lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So round two, uh, we're actually drawing our information from a, a survey done by Pew Research. Uh, and all of the links to the surveys will be available on our website in our show notes after the podcast. Uh, so round two, we're looking at the top reasons for voting for each candidate. And we're looking at Donald Trump. Uh, well, we're looking at both candidates. I'm sorry. We're looking at both candidates and we're looking at several different categories. So the first category we look at was leadership and performance. So we uh, Americans were asked to rate each candidate on each of these categories. And for leadership and performance, 23% cast their votes for Donald Trump, while only 19% cast their votes for Joe Biden. Uh, so the next category is his issue or policy positions. Uh, in this instance, 21% of people uh, voted for President Trump here, and only 9% uh, voting for Biden. So Biden definitely scoring low in that category. The next category is he's not the other guy, uh, which seems whimsical, but given the divisive nature of politics in our country today, I think it's pretty significant. 56% of people said they would vote for Biden because he's not Trump. And only 19% said they would vote for I, uh, Trump over Biden. Now, again, this is not a category that has any kind of concrete, provable evidence. It's literally just <laughs> opinion opinion of candidates. Yeah. Uh, so the next category, he is for the American people and values, uh, the candidate's representation of American people and values. Uh, Trump uh, scored 17% in that category, and Biden only scored 6%. So again, Biden falling uh, in the low percentages. 
The next category we have is people who vote along party lines. So Republicans vote Republican, Democrats vote down the Democrat column. 16% said they would vote for Trump, 7% vote for Biden. And I think that is more a statement of party loyalty more than anything. And I also think that's kind of reflective of what we saw coming out of the primaries where we had 20 some people um, as candidates that emerged on the Democrat side where the Republicans obviously maintain a fairly um, single-minded race the whole time. And I think that statistic is reflective of that. Yeah. Uh, so the next category is their personality, personality excuse me, and temperament. Uh, Biden scoring 13% here and President Trump scoring 11%. So Biden pulling ahead with two extra percent. And it's interesting, given the nature of the first debate, which this this survey occurred after the first debate, I'm surprised that that margin isn't greater in yeah. Biden's favor because of the amount of criticism that, that was mm -hmm. lambasted against Trump for his seemingly overbearing, bullying yep. t uh, tendencies during the uh, debate. Um, the next category is simply other. It was not, they had a prescription of what, uh, questions they asked people and people who answered for voting reasons outside of those wound up in the other. Um, and this is a statistical tie here. Biden at 13%, Trump at 12%. I think the margin of error on this poll was four or 5%. So statistically insignificant to the overall poll. And the final category is people that did not know or refused to answer. And again, these are pretty close. Biden with 14% and Trump with 13%. Yeah, so I think the last two here we kind of can throw out from a statistical standpoint. Uh, looking at the rest of these, I think it's pretty clear that uh, Donald Trump round, uh, won round two on this one here. Uh, let's move right into round three here, since that was a quick, decisive round. Round three, using the same poll, looks at personality traits. So we look at energetic being our first one. 56% of Americans think that Donald Trump is more energetic than 40% who think Biden is more energetic. Uh, the next is courageous or, you know, how courage, how much courage they have. Uh, Trump with 46% and Biden close with 45%. So just 1% difference there. And then we asked Americans, well, we didn't, but Pew Research asked Americans, uh, who cares for the needs of ordinary people? And this is where we see a bit of a breakout here where Biden <clears throat> scores 54% of the confidence level from voters, Trump only 41%. So that, that's kind of a opinion statement there as to who cares more. Yeah, and sort of in the same vein as that, the next category, uh, a good role model. And again, Biden pulling ahead here, 46% from Biden, uh, with Trump only getting 31%. So again, similar to cares for needs of an ordinary people, you're seeing in the personality realm, Biden is pulling ahead a little bit. Right. And the last one that we have in round three here, um, I think this is a, this is a knockout blow here, and, and the last two were, uh, they asked, who do you think is more even-tempered? 60% of Americans think that Biden is more even-tempered than 25% of uh, Trump supporters. Uh, so I think round three, I, I would definitely have to give to Biden in this case here. Not only did he win more of the categories, but he won them with a significantly higher percentage mm -hmm. uh, difference than the others. Yep, definitely. Uh, but overall, I'm... I'm I was actually kind of surprised at this point in time when I prepared the notes as to how even uh, the two candidates really were at this point in time if we're scoring on a 10-point must. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a, another quick break here, and we'll be back in just a minute for round four, where we're going to look at what voter confidence is on key issues between the candidates. <laughs> Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. 
we'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. We're back with Decision 2020. Wrong camera angle. <laughs> I was like, hello. <laughs> Decision 2020. Trump versus Biden. We're about halfway through now. We're, we're scoring this on a 10-point must. We did our tail of the tape. Halfway through now, we've got two rounds left to go. Where do you think we stand on the candidates? Well, just doing a quick, uh, I'm not going to reveal my scores yet. You know, we got to tease it for the end. But just uh, doing a quick totaling of my scores, both candidates are pretty close. Um, I think in the most recent round, in round three, we definitely saw Biden pull ahead just in terms of his personality. Um, and I think that's interesting because if you look at it, being president is more than just your personality. It's about policy issues, which if we look at those rounds, candidates were much closer or it leaned to one towards, you know, uh, President Trump. So it's interesting to see how these votes are coming down and what people might value in a, in a presidential candidate or a president themselves. Yeah. And I think part of that is the fact that, you know, Donald Trump has been president for four years, so we have a performance that we can look at for comparison purposes. Uh, Biden has been out of office for four years, and when he was in office, he wasn't president. He was a vice president. He was a senator and so forth. So I think when people look at policy decisions, they look at that kind of differently given the roles that Biden's been in in the past. And I don't think he gets nearly as much attention or credit for those policy decisions um, but especially from an economic standpoint, Donald Trump has very much cast himself as, well, he's casting himself as the law and order president, but he also hinges a lot of what his performance is on the economy. How do you think that's affecting the survey results? Well, I think, I mean, at the end of the day, people care probably the most about money, right? So, and if, if Trump's able to frame it in such a way that if you vote for me, I can keep the income flowing or I can keep your families fed when in reality, at least from my point of view, given the COVID-19 pandemic, he hasn't done all that great of a job in terms of keeping the like, stimulus checks and things like that. And I know that it was also the Democrats involved with that about not being able to push that through. But I, th I think it's, it's not nearly as cut and dry as Trump would like people to believe where if, if you vote for him immediately, the economy will be, will be better. And in turn, your life will be better. And I, and I agree with you on that point. A lot of the things I think that I would knock Donald Trump on here is he's telling you that things are bad. You know, we have a, we have riots in the streets. You know, if, if you elect Joe Biden, you know, your taxes are going to go up and this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And he cites a lot of things that are happening right now under a Republican administration. So I find it difficult to correlate that electing Biden would change things since obviously we're still having riots in the streets now, most recently in our backyard in Philadelphia here. Yep. And that's happening on Donald Trump's watch. So why would that change on Joe Biden's watch? Yeah. Those ads that make that argument, they perplex me because he presents this image of an America that is burning but he's the president, right? And, and it's 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 on one hand, I, I can't tell if it's smart or or not, because some people are probably believing it, yeah. And that if they give him another four years, he can stop it all. But in a lot of instances, he is at some fault for the state of things now, anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, I know we don't want to turn it into a Trump bashing thing, but like you said, he, we've had four years of his performance to critique, and I guess that's probably why we're leaning yeah. you know, that way. Well, and he makes, you know, he makes a point of talking about the forest fires out in, in the, uh, on the West coast there. And a lot of experts make a case for the forest fires being as bad as they are because of environmental issues, global warming and so forth, the drought that's been out there. 
And Donald Trump tends to counter saying, well, it's forest management. Well, two thirds of the land that's burning is managed by the federal forest service, which is under his control. Mm -hmm. So if there's a, issue with forest management, it's the administration that's falling down on that. Um, and, and, and I look at that, the response that he has, and I have to question really the veracity of it. And then even getting to something as simple as the slogan, you know, Biden is uh, build back better, which, okay, that's kind of lean, but sure it's different. Um, but Trump is sticking with make America great again. And I have to wonder if that's really helping you out. You were, you campaigned in 2016 with Make America Great Again. You got four years and you're campaigning on Make America Great Again. Are you saying that in the first four years you didn't make America great? Yeah, I think and if, some, yeah, sorry, if, go ahead. if that's the case, why would I vote for you again yeah. for another four years? Yeah, I think sometimes he'll change it up and say, keep America great. But if this is our definition of greatness, it's not one that I would like to subscribe to. Right. Right. So it just, we seem to get very confusing messages out of, out of the Trump campaign at this point in time. Uh, but, you know, on the opposite side, we have a number of controversies out there that are brewing around Biden. You know, we're talking packing the Supreme Court. We're talking the whole Hunter Biden laptop thing, which is or isn't an issue. And that's still up for debate. But a lot of the tough questions, fracking being another one. Mm -hmm. A lot of the tough questions that are being pushed at Joe Biden are basically being ignored. They're not being responded to. And and I don't know if that's a good strategy in that maybe his handlers are afraid that he, of the response that he's going to give. Um, if you look at his response on fracking, it's been uh, fragmented. It's been inconsistent. Um, and he's countered previous statements a number of times during the campaign. Um, or is he just avoiding answering the tough questions? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of both. And talking about fracking, he when he talks about the pandemic, he is all in favor of science and things like that. But when it comes to fracking, which is, you know, scientists say is a bad thing, he's all for it. So there's conflicting messages there. And obviously with every politician, you're going to have that. You're going to have them conflict with themselves. But I don't know. It's It's... Not necessarily directly lying, but it makes you wonder if he does get four years in office, how that is that dichotomy almost is going to be reflected in the administration. Yeah, yeah. Should be interesting. Well, let's get on to the second half of the match here. So round four, we're going to uh, – the voters were asked what their confidence is on each candidate in certain key issues. And the first key issue, again, economic policy. <clears throat> so 51% of people are more confident in Trump's economic policy than Biden, who we only have a 48%. But again, we have a 4 or 5, 4 to 5% margin of error. So that's statistically irrelevant when it, in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure we can, we can really choose a winner from that one. What's our next category? Uh, so the next category is law enforcement and criminal justice issues. Uh, Biden... Uh, pulling ahead here with 46% of confidence, while Trump has 41%. And I think that's, again, having four years of Trump, I think that that is a reflection in this poll because he, President Trump, is dealing with currently with uh, civil unrest, quote unquote, and his issues and his takes on law enforcement and how that should be implemented. So I think that, you know, that's how we're, what we're seeing in these polls. And I would tend to agree. I don't think Biden really has any record on law enforcement. Uh, in the 47 years that he's been in the Senate. Um, so I can't, I'm puzzled as to why he's, he's scoring so high here. I think it's more a matter of Trump scoring low mm -hmm. than Biden scoring high. And I, I think that's just a product of he's different. Yeah. Right. So the next one we have is handling the coronavirus health impact. And here we get a significant percentage difference as well. Oh, actually, no, I'm sorry. I skipped a category. I would have just read that if you liked. Yeah, I skipped a category. <laughs> Foreign policy issues. So in this in this year, we have a six-point lead. So this is a this is a statistical um, a lead that we can cite here. Biden has been graded with a 50% level of confidence versus Trump's 44%. And I think this kind of speaks 
to both of them. Biden definitely has a foreign policy history, uh, both in the Senate and as uh, vice president. And Trump most definitely has a foreign policy history in his last four years, uh, which given the countries that we seem to be more closely friendly with and those that we are less friendly with, I think, uh, speaks volumes. Uh, so the next category is handling the coronavirus health impact. Uh, Biden uh, wins this category, getting 52 percent, while Trump only has 41 percent. And again, we're seeing this reoccurring thing with this round specifically. But I think it's about I'm going to repeat myself here, but Trump having four years and Biden giving policy promises for if he were to win the election, what his administration would look like. So I wonder if Trump falling behind in a lot of these categories is more just people wanting something different from Biden or something better uh, in a lot, on a lot of these issues. Well, I think specifically to coronavirus, this sort of came to a head in the second debate where the performance that Trump has put up for the pandemic we're currently in is abysmal. Mm -hmm. um, given the number of infections, the number of deaths, the performance in relation to other countries who have had it, uh, the United States is last, um, hands down. And during the second debate, uh, Trump tried to sort of retaliate or, or, or punch back on this when they talked about the H1N1 uh, virus that struck during the uh, Obama-Biden administration and claimed that had they dealt with this virus then the same way, the death toll would have been monstrously higher. Two million people, I think, is what he was quoted as. And when you look at the performance of the Obama and Biden administration, the death toll was insignificant compared to what we're seeing now. Yep. And I think, I think Trump failed to make a case for a failure on Biden's part in the first pandemic, which in combination with his abysmal handling of it, and, and I, there's very few people I think that can provide a convincing argument otherwise, I think those two things combined is what's really killing the, the public confidence. I mean, Trump has, has declared that, that the virus is over and we've got a thousand people a day dying. So it's, it's kind of hard to have any confidence in someone who has that kind of distorted version. Yeah. And on that issue, also pulling out of the world health organization in the middle of a pandemic, I don't know who greenlit that. I'm sure it was probably mostly president Trump pushing for that, given his opinions on funding the world health organization, which if you just do a cursory amount of research, it's not quite as black and white as he's presenting it. Right. But I think things like that, whether they're for, in his mind, the right reasons or not, they send the wrong message to not only the American people, but to the rest of the world on how America is handling this. And you're seeing that with travel restrictions being put back on Americans going to other countries and cases continuing to rise every day. Yeah. Well, not only did he pull us out of the World Health Organization, he's also... He has a crusade going to repeal the Affordable Care Act, which would leave 20 million plus Americans without health care during a pandemic. Maybe the ACA probably, maybe it needs to be recalled and needs to be reworked and something else put out. Um, he doesn't have a plan. He hasn't put a plan forward. It's coming. Every two weeks, it's coming. So until you have something that's a viable replacement that's better, you can't withdraw it, and it's already made its way to the Supreme Court. Yeah. We're waiting on a vote for the Supreme Court. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's easy to say all these things about Trump because we don't have a Biden in this situation. And maybe things would have gone just as poorly if Biden was in charge, but that's not really the point. The point is Trump was in charge, and this, these are the consequences of his actions. That's exactly it. So the next uh, category we have, um, which is a, another clear victory for um Biden is race relations. 48% uh, of Americans are confident in Biden versus 35%. And again, this is, this is a direct reflection of the last four years of division that we saw under Trump. Now, looking at Biden's record, Biden does not have a stellar record on race relations. He's yeah. made comments in the past. He's had... Uh, policy decisions in the past that were 
not in the best interest of minorities. And a lot of that is just being overshadowed by the fact that Donald Trump, in many cases, has aligned himself with white supremacist groups. He refuses to condemn them. Um, he's made comments to the effect that, you know, there are decent people in the KKK. Uh, he was asked to condemn um, the Proud Boys on the debate stage. And instead of saying, you know, stand down, it was stand back and stand by, which is a very, very different message than stand down. Um, so it, this is a direct reflection, I think, on Trump's handling of the race relation issue. And, and just recently, the other day, wasn't and I know I, I don't want to speak out of turn here because I, I don't have the information in front of me. But wasn't Biden's bus uh, confronted with? White supremacists down in Florida, Texas. That Texas, was sorry. that was actually today or yesterday. Yeah. They were going to a rally. They canceled the rally because Trump supporters in pickup trucks surrounded the bus driving down the highway. Yeah, and I don't know if if Trump has a has commented on that at all. But either way, it's difficult to argue that these things would not be happening if Trump, President Trump, was not in office. I I agree, I and, he, and and you can't necessarily knock Trump for the, the actions of every one of his supporters, yeah. what you can knock him for is his reaction to it. Mm -hmm. You know, he should have immediately come out and condemned that type of action. Um, and the other thing you have to keep in mind is vice president, uh, uh, presidential candidates have secret service protection details. So you have these highly trained individuals with weapons that are being provoked by these protesters. American citizens. Yeah. And, and the fact that this is being allowed to happen is, is extraordinary during an election. Yeah. Uh, I guess speaking of all that, the final category we have here is bringing the country closer together. Uh, obviously, we're just talking about division and things like that. Uh, Biden here getting 45 percent and Trump getting 31 percent. So, again, Biden pulling ahead. So how do you how would you rate round four at this point? Well, it definitely looks like Biden uh, overall winning more categories here. But again, is it just because we have four years of Donald Trump and we want something, people want something different? And we're, I mean, with, with things like race relations, we talk about how Biden has certain issues with it in his past. But when you compare it to Trump, it's, it's, it's almost apples and oranges in terms of, of quantity of evidence. And I think that that is the reason that Biden pulls ahead in so many of these categories is the amount of evidence for each of them on these issues. Yeah, and, and, you know, it's funny that, that you, you say the phrase, people might just want something different because that's exactly what swept Donald Trump in the office in mm -hmm. 2016 was the idea that it's not politics as usual. I'm different. I'm not a politician. People are tired of politicians. I'm going to drain the swamp. So he swept into office under the premise of I'm different. And now he's under real threat of being swept out for people looking for something different. And his premise was, well, you've had 50 years of politics as usual. I'm different. We've had four years of Trump and Americans seem to want something different now. So I'm not really sure where that statement actually leads the country. Yeah. And I think that happens anytime you have the incumbent president going against another the other candidate from the other party. It's always, well, I didn't like what they did, so I'm going to vote for somebody different. Whereas if you have a president that is overall liked in their first term, they're more likely to get reelected because people want more of the same. And we're not seeing that here, I don't think. Well, and the one thing I think that's very different about this race than I think I've ever seen in the history of politics is you look at the national conventions for each party. And the Democratic National Convention quite literally had more respectable Republicans speaking in favor of Biden than Donald Trump had in total speaking at the Republican National Convention. When more Republicans show up for the Democratic National Convention, I think you're seeing a divide in a party where the par that party has been very consciously trying to cover up that divide at this mm -hmm. point. And the race that we're looking at here is not really just a race for the president. It's a race for the Senate and the House. Uh, right now, the, the Republicans control a majority there. So anything that the Democrats try to do is being thwarted. 
And there's a real threat right now because of how the country has been in the last four years under a Republican president that not only do you see the executive office switch, you may see enough seats in the Senate switch that you could have a Democratic president and a Democratic-controlled Congress that will dominate for the next at least two years until the midterms. So that could have a significant impact on the future of this country. Yeah, and we're not even taking into account the Supreme Court, too. Um, having majority Republican judges is also going to affect how others— Well, and, and let's not call them Republican judges. That's kind of unfair because Sorry. you know they are impartial, mm -hmm. but they've been— Republican appointed judges. Yeah, sorry, I, that's closer to what I meant. Um, but those appointing uh, judges are also going to affect uh, how a lot of decisions will go. Yeah, I, you know, whether you're a Trump supporter or not, the fact that he's had the opportunity to appoint three justices to the Supreme Court when in four years he's gone through more members of his administration than, than any other administration before which, to me, if I look at it from, from a hiring manager standpoint, if you go through that many people in that short a period of time, you're probably a terrible judge of character when it comes to hiring people. Yeah. And based on that revolving door policy on his administration, he's got three people appointed to the highest court in the land for life terms that will have far-reaching impacts on the future of this company, country than anything. Yep. Um, and that's kind of alarming you know even if you aren't a, a, a democrat i think it's alarming that any single individual has that much of an influence over the supreme court so that was it for round four we have one more round uh which i think is probably the biggest round that we have and it's a single question round and i think this will tip our contest one way or the other because i think we're you know tell me if i'm wrong but i think we're pretty evenly matched right now mm -hmm. yeah definitely um and you have a couple instances of biden pulling ahead but then you also have trump uh doing better in the other ends as well so it is i'd say it is pretty back and forth i agree so we'll take a quick break and we'll come back for round five and then our analysis <laughs> So round five is a symbol, a single question, very simple. And this comes from the yougov.com survey asking who they think is the most honest candidate. And people who were polled about that question for Donald Trump, 57% say he's not honest and 35% say he is honest. Uh, Joe Biden, 48% say he is honest. 41% says he's not honest. So Joe Biden, his numbers are a lot closer uh, than President Trump's were. Yes, and and I think this is probably the most telling thing out there. Um, most people, and and I don't mean to seem cynical, but when it comes to politics, I think most people expect your politicians to lie to you. Mm -hmm. And I think if you don't, you're naive. Uh, the fact that they think that the only career politician in this race is more honest than our current president speaks volumes. Yeah, especially given a big reason for Trump getting elected in 2016 was his uh, his stance against career politicians. And now the career politician is in some ways being more favored in different categories. Yes, and I, and I think Donald Trump's... Again, a lot, a lot of this reflection is on the last four years. I think mm -hmm. Donald Trump puts himself out there with these absolute statements. And that's a product of his political naivety, where a career politician knows how to say something that leaves him enough wiggle room to get out of an absolute statement. Yep. Um, Donald Trump gets in front of the microphone and says things like, there'll be a vaccine in two weeks. Well, when there's not a vaccine in two weeks, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. You've kind of painted yourself into a corner there. Yeah, and we talked about that with Biden having more of the career politician take where he talking about things like fracking and his criminal justice background where he gives himself that wiggle room. He doesn't have a concrete stance, right. which can, is a negative and a positive at the same time. It depends on how you look at it because he can't – there's very few except for a few unfortunate quotes that he said before of things you can pull up to say, oh – 
well, here's evidence of this guy, you know, not being fit to lead. Yeah, and and Trump has shot himself in the foot a number of times yeah. here because Trump is a gambler. You know, Trump is the type of person who takes chances and he plays the numbers in such a way that when he says something that's an absolute statement and it's true, then he gains a lot of collateral that way. And when it's not true, what happens? Usually we get some other statement or something else that distracts us away from that, mm -hmm. or he tries to wiggle his way out of it or something like that. Then he turns into the politician and he starts the, the song and dance. And I think as a result of that, he comes across as dishonest. And there was a uh, statistic that I saw, and I think it was on USA Today. I don't remember. But midway through this race a couple months ago, there was a statistic that came out that rated Donald Trump as every fourth word out of his mouth was a lie. And that's based on the number of words that he's given in public and the number of lies that he's told. And that's, I've never seen that statistic for any politician. The fact that he has so many untruths out there that they can calculate that is alarming. Yeah, and I, this came up with the debates, too. People wanted live fact-checkers. I think even Joe Biden said there should be live fact-checkers. But I do think it can be a little bit one-sided against Trump with how much he lies, especially with things like fact-checking. I think in terms of the debates, I think it should have been a little bit more even with and who's being fact-checked the most, where I think it's Trump makes himself an easy target given all of his lies. And I think that there has been a lot of attention on that and maybe not as much on uh, Joe Biden. Well, and Donald Trump has also put himself in, in compromising positions in the past, mm -hmm. uh, like the Woodward interviews, for instance, oh, that yeah. were done months ago, um, very early into the pandemic. And Donald Trump came out acknowledging the fact that he knew how dangerous the virus was. He knew it was airborne. And he willingly chose to downplay the virus because he didn't want to panic Americans. And why you would say something that was so compromising on tape, knowing that you're on tape, mm -hmm. boggles my mind. Yeah. And, and I don't understand what he thought he was going to gain from that. I, for, the way I see it is he doesn't care because that is already out of the news cycle. Right. I mean, he admitted to this on tape and it was major headlines for a couple of days, but it's out of the cycle now. And I think that that has been a reoccurring thing with his administration and his presidency. He says something insane or does something insane that you would never think a president to do. And in the past would probably be extremely damning. But because there's so it happens so frequently, we become desensitized to it and it becomes, unfortunately, a, a new normal almost. And I think that he says things like this because he knows that. It's not going to stick. Yeah. And I think you're right. And and I think when he does something where he, shoot, he shoots himself in the foot and the news organizations pick up on it and report on it, then we get the, oh, it's fake news. They're not treating me fairly. Did you ask Biden the same questions? Yeah. And he goes on this defensive rant to distract away from everything. Um, so he's, I have to give him full props as a master manipulator. He really has his, the, the perfected the methodologies of ma of manipulating the media at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of his reputation even before he became president, right? I mean, with his depiction in different movies, you know, Back to the Future 2, the president and that being loosely based, or not the president, but uh, older Biff being loosely based on Donald Trump right. and things like that. I think he's always had this reputation. It was only before... It was more normal because he was a, a greedy businessman. But when you put somebody like that in office, the standards are different. Yeah. So. Yeah. Interesting. So that was it for round five. I think we can say that squarely went to uh, Joe Biden. Uh, we'll be right back with our final thoughts and uh, our tally of who we think won the matchup. <laughs> So in tallying up my numbers here, I'm showing Biden with 49 points and Trump with 45. What do you show? I had Biden with 49 and Trump with 41 points. Okay. Well, you were much harder on Trump than I was. Well, I was harder on Trump 
uh, in rounds three and four only because he scored so much. Those are the categories where he got destroyed by Joe Biden in terms of the percentage differences. So I thought that that warranted uh, lower scores for him. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I think either way, we both agree that uh, based on these polls uh, from Americans uh, out there from two different polling organizations that Biden was the clear winner. Uh, what are your thoughts moving forward? Uh, let me let me ask you a couple of, of questions that I think a lot of Americans have on their mind right now and get your reaction. One, how do you think November 3rd is going to play out? Do you think we're going to have a winner or do you think it's going to take some time to count the votes? I think it's going to take a couple days afterwards um, just because of the influx of mail-in ballots, especially with the pandemic. I think I'm – and – I don't know if you watched it last week tonight, but he talked about this thing, John Oliver, about this thing called the blue shift, where because so many um, Biden supporters are mailing in their ballots, those votes might not be counted until a couple of days after election night. Whereas if a lot of people that support Trump vote in person, that might show him pulling ahead, which he could then capitalize on to declare a victory. Um, and I think that that's a scary prospect. Um, and I think the official tally will probably be a couple of days later. Um, due to the just the mail-in votes. So let's say a week, two weeks into this, we have decisive numbers that come back after everything's counted up. And let's say, th uh, hypothetically, Donald Trump loses the election in the Electoral College. Do you think we'll see a peaceful transition of power, or do you th how do you think you – how do you see that going down? I, I don't really know, honestly. I mean, obviously he says all these things like, I'm not a good loser. I will, you know, he's spoken to the idea that he might try to, to resist the peaceful transition. But I don't know how much of that is true. I, I, I wonder if he's just saying that to, to frighten people or to appear stronger to his supporters. Um, but honestly, I, I have no idea. I have no idea how things are going to go if he does end up losing the Electoral College, if he does. Um I'm not, I don't, I don't know, unfortunately. Well, let me ask you the same question. If Biden loses, what do you think is going to happen? How do you think the country is going to react? Uh, I think his supporters are going to be disappointed. I know I would personally be disappointed by it. Um, but I do think that Trump would probably run with it and maybe use it as, as fuel to extend you know, his power even more because he, he won again. Right. And, and that for him would be a confirmation that he's doing the things right the right way so it probably will just lead to more of what we have now now have, can i ask you have you voted yeah and you did mail-in voting or i you did, did in person? yeah no, I, okay. I mailed uh back in whenever i got it which is like october now let me ask you a question and this is a question that i i i ask a lot of people when it comes to politics putting all the other issues aside everything we talked about here the one thing i ask people when they look to vote is are you better off today than you were four years ago? I'd, me personally, I would say no, but I, I realize that I'm in a privileged position and there are a lot of people less uh, fortunate than me that are in much worse positions. And I do take that in consideration when I vote. I'd say the biggest thing that the Trump presidency has affected me is the coronavirus pandemic and it uh, limiting my options in my life in terms of social options and things for school. Um, you know, having to do school remotely. Um, but like I said, other people have been affected in much worse ways um, from the presidency. Should we see a change in administration here and Joe Biden come into power? Do you think the coronavirus will be dealt with better? Do you think we'll see a, a more involved government in uh, of, uh, addressing of it? I do. I, I, at least I hope. I hope so. Um, I hope that funds will be better allocated. I think that if if the leader of the country admits that there is a problem and is working towards it, I think that that will help at least some people in the country take it more seriously as well. Because I know in at least my life, people, a lot of people are not taking it as seriously as they should. And I wonder how much of that comes from the kind of rhetoric they're hearing about it from their leaders. Right. And, and economically speaking, who do you think the country would be better off with, Trump or Biden? I am not super well-versed in economics. Um, I know that a lot of people are citing tax, uh, Trump's tax, taxing of 
or no, Biden's taxing of the wealthy, which I am in support of. I think that that's a good thing. I think people that are wealthy should contribute more. Um, I'm not, but like I said, I'm not familiar um, as as much as I should be with the economics. Is there any outstanding uh, issue that you think sticks out more than anything else that we've discussed that would decide who do you think should be president? I know that before I said that it's not all about personality when you're picking a candidate. But for me, I just don't see voting for Trump as the moral right thing to do. And that's honestly, that's the biggest thing for me. I don't support Biden on a lot of issues. I don't agree with him on a lot of issues. But I just don't think Trump is a good man. And maybe Biden isn't either. But I think there's something about Trump that for me, he's just not not the right person to be in office or to be in power. Fair enough. Uh, that was all I had. Did you have anything else you want to get into? Nope. All right. Uh, I think that's it for today. I think uh, our next podcast will be very interesting depending on how this election goes. I assume uh, by the time we go on the air again, that decision will have been made yep. by the country. And we'll see what direction we go. And uh, it might even decide what we talk about on the next podcast. <laughs> yeah, <I guess> so. <laughs> that was all we had. Uh, thank you for watching today. Uh, before we go, uh, I would invite folks to subscribe to us. You can get video versions of our podcast if you look for insights into things. You can get audio versions if you look for insights into tomorrow. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and Amazon. Uh, we would also invite folks to reach out to us and give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insights into things. We're on Twitter at insights into things. We are on Instagram at insights into things. Facebook, you can catch us at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. Or you can get links to all of our social media contacts as well as transcripts and show notes on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. And I think that's it. Another one in the books. Bye. into teens a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth talking to real teens about real teen problems explore issues from braces to puberty social anxiety to financial responsibility each week we talk about the topics concerning today's youth we look at how the issues affect teens how to cope with these issues and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years.
Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 110, Cultural Appropriation. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my compassionate and understanding co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. How about you? Doing all right. A little hot today. Uh, I think we got up into the 90s today. Mm. <clears throat> Hottest day of the year so far. Yep. But that's what they make air conditioning for. <laughs> yeah. Anything exciting going on this week? Uh, I just have a couple of quizzes and tests and stuff. Nothing really too big. Okay. Well, it seems like an easy week then. So this week we are talking about cultural appropriation. We'll help you understand what cultural appropriation is by looking at the meanings associated with the phrase and other vocabulary associated with cultural appropriation. We'll take a look at some real-world examples of cultural appropriation and why they're considered cultural appropriation. And finally, we'll look at, we'll look at ways to know if something is cultural appropriation and how to avoid cultural appropriation in our everyday lives. Ready to get started? Sure. All right. So the research for this week's podcast actually comes from uh, VeryWellMind.com, which uh, we've used several times in the past. So let's first consider what's meant by each of the terms in the phrase cultural appropriation, as well as some of the related terms that are important to understand. Why don't you tell us what these terms mean? So, for the first word in the phrase culture, culture refers to anything associated with a group of people based on their ethnicity, religion, geography, or social environment. This might include beliefs, traditions, language, objects, ideas, behaviors, customs, values, or institutions. <laughs> Most often, culture is thought of as belonging to a particular to particular ethnic groups. Yes, it, it is often attributed to ethnic, ethnic groups, but there are different types of culture out there. You can have religious culture. You can have geographic culture. A lot of the nationalism that happens can be considered a culture. You know, people that are pro-American, that's a culture. Okay. Uh, from a religious standpoint, you know, being Jewish is a culture as well. Uh, being uh, Muslim is a culture. There are traditions and everything that go along with that as well. So it's not just ethnicity. Uh, a lot of what we see today with cultural appropriation has to do with ethnicity, with uh, African-American cultural appropriation or uh, Native American or indigenous people appropriation as well. So it's important to, to keep in mind that it's not just ethnicity, it's other things. Okay. So what do we mean by appropriation? So appropriation refers to taking something that doesn't belong to you and most often refers to an exchange that happens when a dominant group takes or borrows something from a, mon from a minority group that has historically been exploited or oppressed. In this sense, appropriation involves a lack of understanding or of appreciation for the historical context that influences the act of what is being taken. For example, taking a sacred object from a culture and producing it as part of a Halloween costume. Yeah, and that's one. That's a very common form of cultural appropriation. Um, but we also see it in other forms such as uh, sports teams and mascots is mm. another one that's very uh, much in the news today. So there are different ways to appropriate it. <clears throat> one other thing that's associated with cultural appropriation but it is different is cultural denigration. Tell us about that. Cultural denigration refers to when someone adapts an element of a culture with the sole purpose of, hum of humiliating or putting down people of that culture. The most obvious example of this is blackface, which, ori which originated as a way to put down people of color as having certain undesirable personality traits. Yeah, blackface is something. I don't know if you're familiar with blackface. I think I've... Um, heard of it before. It's something that sort of came out of the vaudeville era where you had uh, white actors <clears throat> who would put on black makeup and portray themselves as African Americans, but they would do it in a way that was 
um, insensitive and portraying stereotypes of uh, popular stereotypes at the time of uh, African Americans at the time. So it was not at all an accurate depiction of the culture. And it was deliberately meant to be used at the expense of members of that culture. Mm. Uh, another example of this <clears throat> is all of the, or most of the uh, television Western shows in the 1950s and 60s with the Cowboys and Indians. And, you know, the Indians were all played by white actors that were in makeup. And the Indians were always portrayed as being uneducated, um, not very smart, savages, and just they were the bad guys. You know, when you played cowboys and Indians, if you were the Indians, you were the bad guys. Um, so that was another form of cultural denigration that was predominant through the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Mm. Now, the flip side of all that is cultural appropriation and respect. Let's talk yeah. a little bit about that. I think you mean appreciation. Yes, that's You too. said appropriation. Uh, sorry. <laughs> cultural appreciation and respect, yes. Cultural appreciation is the respectful borrowing of elements from another culture with an interest in sharing ideas and diversifying oneself. Examples would include learning martial arts from an instructor with an understanding of the practice from a cultural perspective or eating Indian food at an authentic. authentic Indian restaurant. When done correctly, cultural appreciation can result in creative hybrids that blend cultures together. And this is really, <clears throat> as a society, this is really what we should be striving for. Uh, because the one wonderful advantage that we have in this country is we have such a diverse culture. We have so many different cultures that we can sample from. And you see this a lot um, when we go into the city. You know, if we go into the city to a convention or something like that, you can drive five or six blocks and go through four different cultures and you get different styles of dress, different styles of food. You get to experience all all of these things in this, you know, wonderful melting pot that we have. And that appreciation of those cultures makes us better for that. You know, for, for the longest time, I didn't get to experience <clears throat> Indian culture or Chinese culture. Um, but when you venture into the city, most cities are like this. You have all these ethnic groups that tend to congregate in their own areas of the city, and you can walk from neighborhood to neighborhood, and it's almost like traveling around the world. It really is the 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 richness that you get from the cultures, and it's something to appreciate. Um, and I think a lot of people kind of take that sort of thing for granted, especially a lot of people who live in the city take it for granted that it's there. Uh, coming from a suburban lifestyle like I did, you didn't have any of that stuff. You know, the first time that I got to travel through the city, I was amazed at the diversity that you had there and and just the variety that you had when you went from block to block. Uh, you've experienced that. You know, when we go into the city, what are your what are your thoughts on that level of diversity that a city brings you here? Well, it's definitely really cool to see all these different cultures being represented while you just walk a few a few blocks it's really amazing how far we've come and how much appreciation and diversity we have right now and i get to experience other cultures that if we didn't go into the city or this wasn't happening i probably would have never experienced or learned about Unless I was, of course, in history. Absolutely. And the other thing that we have uh, the advantage of is, you know, we travel to Disney frequently. And one of the shining examples of cultural diversity is going to Epcot, where you can literally walk from country to country. And it's not, <clears throat> unlike other things in Disney, it's not actors that are in uh, costume portraying these roles. 
these are actual residents of these countries that they come in and they're, they're part, most of them are part of the uh, Disney University program and, and they're part of their exchange students and they live on property for periods of time, but they run the venues, they run the restaurants and the stores and the shops and everything. Ooh, I never knew that. Yeah. And they're actual, like, you know, we go to Mexico, those are actual, you know, residents of Mexico who live there and are here on exchange. Um, so it's, there's a level of authenticity there that you wouldn't normally expect with Disney. Uh, that's an even more, I think, vibrant experience going, going into that and, and experiencing that type of environment. Mm-hmm. You know, when we go to France, you know, we, we ate at the restaurant in France the one time and our waitress was, you know, from a little town outside of Paris when we talked to her and like, that's really cool. And, and they're there to exchange their culture, which is what's what's really nice. I mean, in the when you experience that cultural exchange in the cities, they're not there for the purpose of educating you. They're there to live their lives. So mm-hmm. you're oftentimes fortunate enough to experience that culture as part of that regular life experience. Uh, but when you go to Epcot, they're there to educate you. They're there to share their culture. They're there to answer your questions. And, and there's always, there's tons of questions that I always have when I show up to, to folks, you know, from their traditional dress to the foods, to where they come from and what do they like about where they lived. You know, it's, it's, to me, it's very interesting to get to know people on that level. And Disney offers a very unique experience for that. Mm Mm-hmm. So we're going to come back. We know what we're talking about now as far as cultural appropriation. We're going to come back and we're going to talk some examples of uh, cultural appropriation and uh, put up some some shiny examples of how not to culturally appropriate. We'll be right back. For over seven years... The Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So we've talked about a few examples of cultural appropriation already, but there's tons of examples of cultural appropriation out there, some of which we might not even realize is considered cultural appropriation. Okay. Um, Why don't you go down? We have a, a list here. Let's go down the list and we'll dissect that list. Okay. So the first on the list is intellectual 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 property like patents copyright industrial designs and trademarks right so can you think of any examples of intellectual property that's been uh, culturally appropriated um hmm. how about something where somebody has a, a copyright on a song yeah, I was going to say, like, I was thinking copyright with songs. Like sticking to the Disney theme, what's the one song that we always love to sing that came from a popular Disney movie? Um, uh, oh, uh. We do the background vocals and Mommy does the main vocals. <laughs> uh, Lion Sleeps Tonight. Lion Sleeps Tonight. That was a traditional African song that was... Probably one of the best examples of a, a cultural appropriation because it literally was stolen from the the 
gentleman who wrote it and made it popular in Africa. And it was recorded by several different artists in the West before Disney got it and used it in Lion King. Mm. And eventually, through the charitable work of uh, a lawyer, they uh, Disney eventually acknowledged the wrong that was done to this particular artist. And they did have a settlement where they paid the family some money for the art itself. Mm. Uh, but we're talking 30, 40 years later. So that's a great example of intellectual property that's been appropriated. Oh. What's the next one that we have? The next one we have is artifacts. Pottery, weaponry, artwork, tools, and manuscripts and writing. So can you think of any examples that might fit this description? Um. How about something like art? So the first one that comes to mind to me is Native American cultural appropriation. Okay. So a lot of Native Americans have um, their own Native crafts that they do. They'll do clothing. They'll do um, tapestries, things like that. And what happens is when uh, you go to a touristy area, say somewhere in Oklahoma or Texas or something like that, you'll a lot of people will go to the Native American uh, reservations and buy the stuff. Mm. But what happens is you have a lot of nefarious merchants who copy what they have and they mass produce it and they sell it at more main street, uh, mainstream stores. Mm. So instead of it being an authentic uh, garment that was made by a Native American, it's some knockoff somewhere that was made in some factory that is being passed off as that. Mm. So there's cultural appropriation as far as artifacts go. Uh, what about the next one we have? The next one we have is dance. Some examples are from China, the dragon dance. Japan, the kabuki. Kabuki, yeah. Ukraine. Ukraine, the Cossack dance. Cossack dance. Cossack uh, the Native American, the hoop. The hoop dance. Uh, the, the hoppy snake, snake. The rain dance. And, and the then stomp the stomp dance. dance. So the, I, I listed a number of Native American uh, dances in there because there were so many in the, in the research that I did. Mm. But what you have that comes out of this may not necessarily be the exact dance, but what you might get would be something that's popularized that um, an artist – might wind up doing. Mm. Uh, there were a couple of artists, and I, I should have wrote them down when I did, but there were a number of artists uh, who have taken heat for taking Native American dance moves and, and uh, African tribal dance moves and incorporating them into their dance routines. Mm. And the important thing is, is it's not bad to incorporate that into your routine or your life, or, or whatever you're doing, where you run into a problem is when you don't credit the, the origin of it. Where you, you take it, you use it as your own, and you pre pretend that you came up with it. That's really what cultural appropriation is, and that's what a lot of these artists were getting hit for. They weren't crediting the origin of some of the material that they had. Mm. So what's the next one that we have? The next one we have is clothing and fashion, like from India, the sari. Sari, right. Uh, Japan, the kimono. Kimono, yeah. Kimono. Um, and Scotland, the kilt. The kilt, yeah. So these are a couple of, of uh, very common pieces of clothing that are culturally significant to these other areas of the world that, again, very similar to, to the example that I gave with the Native Americans, where they're producing their own goods, but they're being copied. You're getting some of the same thing. But in this case here, they're referring more to taking the inspiration for these and having fashion designers or clothing producers produce clothing that's based on those, but never crediting the origin of them. Mm. So you run into some issues like that. Like a lot of times you'll go to the Ren Fair and you'll see people in kilts. That's a form of cultural appropriation, 
but not in so much that you're trying to pass it off as your own. Um, the one thing with, with kilts, unfortunately, I'm not familiar enough with the cultures of the other two examples to talk to great detail about. But with kilts, the pattern of the weave in the kilt itself is attributed to a family or a clan. Mm. So we would have our own, if we were Scottish, we would have our own pattern that we would wear. So it's not just the style, but it's the actual design of the pattern in that piece of material that is culturally specific. So that it goes an extra level deep there. Mm. So if you were to dress in a kilt in Scotland, you would be recognized for your clan based on the pattern that's in the cloth itself. Mm. So what's the next one that we have? Uh, the next one we have is language, and all languages are cultural in their nature. Yeah, and this is probably the uniquely cultural thing that everyone has in their culture. And it's the ability to communicate. Now, just because you may know three different languages doesn't necessarily mean it's cultural appropriation. But what they're referring to here is when you start um, appropriating terms and phrases from certain languages into your vernacular. And you make it into sort of a slang type um, use of that word where you're not necessarily giving credit to where the terms came from, but you may be using them in a derogatory way too. So it's not really speaking a different language. It's borrowing elements of that language to enhance your own vernacular. Ah. So, and that's where it, it can become insulting in certain circumstances. I can definitely see that. What's our next one? Next up, we have music. And we've kind of talked about this a bit before, but music can be tied to ethnicity, geographic location, religions, in, and, in, and cultural significance. Yes. So music, like language, is something else that is very cultural driven. So it can be based on your ethnicity. You know, African Americans have a very distinctive uh, musical sound that their culture provides. And in fact, it's been heavily borrowed upon and stolen in many cases, you know, and we'll talk a little bit later in, in a few of the other examples that we have. Um, but Judaism, you know, religions are very musically inclined. Uh, even Christianity is very musically inclined. Islam, very musically inclined. They're all cultures that are, they're all art forms that are culturally based. Mm. Uh, and when we borrow from any of those without giving them credit, it's cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a, there's a lot of meaning, especially with Christianity, and there's so many different denominations of Christianity. There are, there's a music associated with certain types of denominations um, that when they're not treated with respect can then turn into cultural denigration as well. Ah. Uh. So that's, that's, you know, a significant thing to keep in mind. What's our next one? Uh, the next one we have is religious symbols, like for Christianity, the cross, Judaism, the Star of David, Buddhism, the Wheel of Dharma, Dharma uh, Druidism, Druidism, Tris the Triskelion, the Triskelion, Islam, the Star of and star and crescent, uh, Norse polytheism, polytheism, polytheism. How do you pronounce that one? I knew you were gonna have trouble with that one. It's Thor's hammer. What's Thor's hammer called? Not Mew Mew. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a m one. Mjolnir. 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 Yes, and it's it's a it's a hammer symbol that they use in their in their religion. Mm. So again, you know, there are. Let's take the cross for example. So there are Christian crosses. There are. There's what's called an act cross that's actually circular at the top. Okay. There's probably four or five different styles of the Christian cross. 
all of these stem back to the, uh, you know, the crucifixion of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Well, crucifixions weren't a religious punishment. Crucifixions were a traditional punishment in ancient times. Ah. But because it happened to a certain individual, in fact, mostly, most crucifixions happen, they crucified you upside down usually. Oh. Um, which was an interesting distinction. But this was a, an example of that symbol being borrowed and used as a symbol of faith moving forward. Oh. Um, same thing with your Star of David and your um, your Star and your Crescent. It, these are all symbols that mean something to the adherence to those religions. And when we um, take those and we use those in a disrespectful manner or we use those in a manner where we're not treating them with the reverence that the culture itself believes they should be, then it's cultural appropriation, cultural denigration. Oh. So the, those are just some some examples. Now, the next thing we kind of have to talk about is the um, example or the um, groups from which um, cultural appropriation is typically targeted to in terms of the United States. Uh, I don't. I don't have enough information globally to talk about it. I know there is cultural appropriation that happens in other areas of the world. But in the United States, probably the number one group that is a target for cultural appropriation is African Americans. Um, Whether it's their music, um, hairstyles, style of dress, um, it, these are all things that are being taken. And and when we talk culture, just like we have our own culture as far as our family goes or as far as relig- religion goes, where, you know, you're, you and mom, you're Jewish. So there's a culture around that. And the things that are associated with that culture are things that are near and dear to us. And when someone violates that by borrowing it without acknowledging or giving us credit for it, or if they borrow it in a way to make fun of that culture, it's going to to bother you, right? Mm -hmm. So some of the groups that are targeted for this are African Americans, Asian Americans, um, especially uh, recently, Hispanic Americans, and Native Americans for the longest time, where uh, these are groups that have been looked down upon by the majority of people in the country, and they've, they're have sort of downtrodden people that their culture has been used against them almost. Mm. Um, and I think we're, as a soci- society, we're finally reaching a point where we acknowledge that. And we acknowledge the richness of these cultures, too. Hmm. Can you think of any other cultures that might be targets in the United States or even in, in anywhere in the world? Um, hmm. You know, if we just rip it from the headlines now and we look at the conflict that's happening uh, in Israel. You have the P- Palestinians who... They feel their culture is, is under assault at this point in time, and they're in open conflict with the Israelis. So there's two groups right there that may feel that they're, they're being oppressed culturally. Uh, you have uh, Uyghurs in um, uh, where are the Uyghurs at? China, I'm sorry, China. It's an, it's a they're Uyghurs are a Muslim group in China. Okay. That are being uh, downtrodden by the the communist Chinese government. Uh, it's not so much cultural appropriation as that's cultural denigration there, where they're openly trying to oppress them. Mm. Um, but if you look from a religious standpoint, historically, you know, you see what happened to the Jews in Nazi Germany. You know, you're doing a lot of research now with your uh, diary of Anne Frank. So you 
are familiar with some of the denigration there and the fact that they what what was the one thing that the germans the nazis required the uh the jews to wear they had to wear a yellow star on their chest right and the yellow star was a star of david so it was the 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 nazis basically appropriating jewish culture to mark jews during that time so they could be oppressed mm -hmm. so this isn't a new phenomenon this isn't something that just started happening um, cultural appropriation and cultural denigration is something that has happened for centuries now i think nowadays we're finally starting to combat it which is nice um, there were a few few specific american uh examples that i wanted to talk about as far as appropriation to kind of, you know, hit home on it. And the first one that a lot of people don't realize is cultural appropriation is rock and roll. Really? Tell us about this one. In the 1950s, white musicians invented rock and roll. However, the music style was borrowed from black musicians who never received credit. Music executives choose to promote white performers over black performers, reinforcing the idea that cultural appropriation involves impacts on non on a non dominant group. Yeah, so rock and roll itself is cultural appropriation. Uh, it was a collection of a number, and even uh, in interviews, Elvis, the king of rock and roll, even acknowledged that a lot of the roots that he had with rock and roll that that led to his rock and roll career were in African-American music and culture. Um, gospel music was a big influence on him. Uh, soul music, you know, the, the he grew up in, in uh, Mississippi. You know, he moved all around the South. So a lot of what his influences were, at least he gave credit to the African-Americans the area that didn't were these music producers. Mm. So you had um, one of his famous songs was Blue Suede Shoes. Blue Suede Shoes was originally written and performed by a black man. And when Elvis wound up making it big, the producers put him in the forefront, not the original artist of it. Mm. Uh, and it was because of this cultural appropriation attitude and this um, this attitude of not promoting minorities. Yeah. Um, there was actually um, a version of that, I remember, in the one show me and Mommy used to watch. Basically, it was dinosaurs versus swamp monsters. I don't entirely remember what they were called, but basically the swamp monsters were supposed to represent the minorities and like they had played music that was similar to the blues music right and basically when um the one dinosaur who wanted to help out and promote the music gave it to the producer the producer used the music but had a dinosaur singing over it yeah so yeah. i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure that was what they were aiming for showing and sadly that's stuff that still happens to this day you know you have some artist out there who just never get to see the, the limelight because of this type of thing mm -hmm. so the next example we have is a sweat lodge have you ever ever heard of a sweat lodge i don't know so in 2011 a motivational entrepreneur named james arthur ray was convicted of three counts of negligent homicide after the death of three participants in his pseudo sweat lodge this is an extreme example of cultural appropriation of Native American tradition. So the sweat lodge is a Native American tradition that's sort of a meditative type of uh, cultural event that Native Americans would do. Okay. And they would, you know, the, the idea is you push the body to its extreme and you experience a uh, higher level thought in the process. Okay. Well, this individual happened to be using it as some type of motivational type of exercise and charging a small fortune for it. And he was discouraging the use of these sweat lodges for safe use. And eventually he wound up killing people while he was trying to, to use this activity. Um, and as a result, the native American, um, 
legitimate concept of this meditative process came under fire for it. So because of someone misappropriating this cultural uh, tradition, it has a negative impact on the legitimate version of it, mm. which is unfortunate. Yeah. So this is one, there's an excellent one, is one that I had never heard of, but after reading about it, it made sense. And that was voguing. I had no idea what voguing. You know what voguing means? No. Okay. So do you remember the voguing craze made popular by Madonna back in the 1980s or 1990s? Whatever she did, I guess, was called voguing. Never really paid much attention to her. Voguing as a dance actually had its roots in gay clubs in New York City and was pioneered by the black and Latin communities. Madonna defends her right to artistic expression, but the question remains, how many people will think Madonna invented voguing? So that's a, That's one of these examples where she picked this up from a culture. She took it on as her own, and I'm sure her version of it wasn't exactly the way it was done in these different cultures. But because she was in the forefront of it and she got all the spotlight for it, Everyone thinks she invented it because she never gave credit to the area, to the cultures that she took it from. Ah. Oh. So that's an example of that. And the last one here is one that's in the news today with team names and mascots and stuff. And that's team mascots. Major sports teams in the United States and Canada are involved in cultural appropriation because of the names of their teams. The Redskins aren't the Redskins anymore because it was a derogatory term towards Native Americans. Mm-hmm. Past and present team names uh, include the Chicago Blackhawks, the Cleveland Indians, the Washington Redskins, and the Edmonton Eskimos. Uh, Redskins, a derogatory term for indigenous people, and the term Eskimo has been rejected by the Inuit community um, based in Alaska and, and Canada. And once again, if you aren't sure if something's cultural appropriation, you need to look no further than the reaction from the group from whom the cultural element was taken. If it offends the people that you're taking it from, then it's cultural appropriation. Mm. So we're going to take a quick break. That was a long segment there. We'll come back and we're going to ask some questions and, and point out some things to know if something is cultural appropriation and how to avoid cultural appropriation. Okay. We'll, we'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today we're talking cultural appropriation. And before we get into how to know if something's cultural appropriation, you had another example of cultural appropriation by our favorite company, Disney. <laughs> yeah, um, I remember hearing um, at some point that Disney actually had cultural appropriation had cultural appropriation happen to one of the most popular films, Peter Pan. Specifically, the scene where the, when um, they all meet the Indians on the island, um, specifically when the song plays, basically talking about red-faced man, and Disney received a lot of flack for it, and they actually had to put a disclaimer on it. I actually just thought of it. Yeah, and in fact, sticking with that same thought, Disney's in the process of making changes to their Jungle Cruise to remove some of the cultural uh, insensitive elements that are in the Jungle Cruise. Okay. But what is, how do you know if something's cultural appropriation? And how do you decide whether or not you should appropriate culture? 
here's a few questions that, that you should ask anytime that you feel you might be appropriating culture. What's your goal with what you're doing? You know, are you trying to embrace it, enjoy it, learn from it? Are you trying to enhance yourself from it? Or are you trying to make fun of the culture itself? What's our next one? Our next one is, are you following a trend or exploring the history of a culture? Right. So, go ahead. So, I'm guessing it would be differentiating between what you think is popular or trying to express and explore and learn the history of a culture. Exactly. Exactly. The next is, are you deliberately trying to insult someone's culture or being disrespectful? And I think this one is pretty straightforward, but sometimes people try, they don't try to be disrespectful. You know, you may be trying to be entertaining or tell a joke or something like that, and it turns out to be disrespectful. You just have to be mindful of that. What's next? Next up we have, are you purchasing? Purchasing? Mm Mm-hmm. Purchasing something that is a reproduction of a culture or an original um, example would be artwork. Yeah, that's something we had talked about already. How would people from the culture you're borrowing an item from feel about what you're doing? Are they insulted by it? Are they um, complimented by it? You know, if you are taking something and using it to highlight uh an injustice or how a culture is being treated. That might not be a problem at that point. Mm -hmm. Next up is, are there any stereotypes involved with what you are doing? I'm guessing just like, are you making one specific group or a specific culture into a stereotype? And pretty pretty sure most stereotypes are pretty bad. Exactly. Are you using a sacred item in a flippant or fun way? Like, are you not taking that cross or that Star of David seriously if it's religion? Are you using a sacred headdress as a costume for Halloween where it would be insensitive? That type of thing. Mm -hmm. Are you borrowing something from an ancient culture and pretending that it's new? Basically, taking something you think it's cool and thinking that, hey, it's okay to say that it's new. I completely created this on my own. Exactly. Are you crediting the source or inspiration of what you're doing? There's nothing wrong with appreciating culture or using culture, other people's culture. You just have to make sure that you're giving credit where credit is due. Yeah, just like if you really try using any inspiration. Exactly. Uh, We worry. Um, If a person of the original culture were to do what you're doing... Would they be viewed as cool, or could they possibly face discrimination? Okay. You're not not going to expound on that one? I don't know how to expound (laughs) on that. I'm sorry. Are you wearing a costume that represents a culture, like a geisha girl or a tribal wear style costume? Um, These are, again, a lot of Halloween costumes. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. In, In my research, Halloween costumes took a lot of heat for it. Because you're really insulting a culture by wearing something like this. Yeah. And what's the last one we have? The last one we have are, are you ignoring the cultural significance of something in favor of following a trend? This kind of goes along with the other question of, are you basically just doing it because it's popular? And are you ignoring, and are you not respecting it because of it? Right. And I think... I think the idea is if you can answer these questions to your satisfaction, I think I think the first, you know, three or four questions from this group will probably give you a good idea of what you're doing as cultural appropriation. Mm-hmm. Now, there's ways to avoid cultural appropriation. You know, if you ask yourself the list of questions above and start to under uh, explore your underlying motivation of what you're doing is a very good reason. Like, why are you trying to use these elements from this other culture, mm-hmm. uh, again, is it to enhance yourself? Is it to broaden your understanding of that culture? Is it to show appropriation of that culture? 
Uh, uh, not appropriation. <laughs> you appreciation. Re- you really keep missing mix, right. ba- 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 mixing those words up. Is it? Are you showing appreciation for that culture? Like, for instance, I I wasn't raised Jewish, but I still participate in the Jewish holidays that we have here, and that's out of respect for mommy and you and the religion, and it's to broaden my horizons and my experiences as well. It's not necessarily to exploit it or to make fun of it or anything like that. Yeah. What's the next suggestion? The next suggestion is to give credit or recognize the origins of the items that you borrow or promote from other cultures rather than claiming them to be your own original ideas. Right. And I think that's very important. I mean, otherwise it's plagiarism, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So you need to not do that. Yeah. Don't do – don't – don't plagiarize. That's a good lesson. (laughs) Don't plagiarize. Plagiarism is bad. (laughs) To take the time to learn about and truly appreciate the culture before you borrow or adopt elements of that culture. Learn from those who are members of the culture. Visit the venues. Run uh, uh, run it by actual members of the culture, such as in restaurants, for instance. If, If you go to eat at an Indian restaurant, ask questions about it. Understand if there is a tradition to it or understand what region the food may come from in the in their country, stuff like that, because that's where you get to uh, build your own appreciation and attend authentic events. Like for instance, you can attend real luau's. Mm-hmm. Um, Disney does this at the Polynesian. They actually have members of the Hawaiian culture that run the luau's there. And you can learn a tremendous amount about people and their culture by exploring their art forms, their visual arts, their music, their dance, stuff like that. There's so much you can learn about the culture. What's our next one? Our next one is support small businesses run by original members of a culture rather than buying mass-produced items from a bit from big box stores that are made to represent a culture. Um so basically appreciate the people who really do who are a part of that culture trying to um show and teach them rather than buying from a big name company who's trying to represent or replicate the culture exactly and the last thing is be respectful all cultures have traditions histories artwork food and other associated cultural treasures that are subject to cultural appropriation understand this and be sure to cherish and respect those of your culture and other people's cultures and really it's 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 the basic human idea of treat others the way that you'd want to be treated if you didn't want someone appropriating your cultural elements and and denigrating them and making fun of them, then don't do it to other people. It's, it's literally that simple. Yeah. So we do have a couple of closing thoughts here. So in conclusion, cultural appropriation is the social equivalent of plagiarism with an added dose of denigration. Mm-hmm. Um, If something, it's something to be avoided at all costs and something to educate yourself about. In addition to watching your own actions, it's important to be mindful of the actions of corporations and be choosy of how you spend your dollars, as that's another way of supporting members of the non-dominant culture. Do what you can when you can, and you learn to do better. Right. So, if... There's only just a little bit that you could do. Like, for instance, if I'm at a touristy location and I have the option to buy, um, let's say, an area rug, like like a Persian rug, okay? I can either buy it from an authentic artist who created it themselves or I can run down to the local convenience store, the local, you know, box store and buy it. Well, in that situation, it's it's kind of a no-brainer. You buy it from the people who make it because not only will you most likely get a better quality product, you're supporting that culture, and chances are there's a lot more history to that piece at that point in time. There's a story behind it. You know, it's not something that came off of a factory machine somewhere. Mm-hmm. Get to know the culture. Learn about it. Make it an opportunity to expand your own horizons. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll get your closing thoughts. (music) 
Go for your closing <laughs> remarks. Um, so to everyone out there, um, cultural appropriation is definitely something to be avoided. Like we said, it is the um, social equivalent of plagiarism. And everyone knows plagiarism's bad. Um, if you are going to try and represent a culture, do it properly. Under- no have enough knowledge of the culture in order to show it to more people and if you do do something based off of a culture at least try and give credit where credit is due sage advice as always before we go i would encourage folks to subscribe to the podcast you can get video versions of the podcast listed as insights into things Audio versions of the podcast you can find listed as Insights into Teens. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Amazon, and pretty much any place you can get a podcast. Uh, I would also encourage folks to write to us, give us your feedback, give us some show suggestions. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We are on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get high-res versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. We stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can get audio versions of the podcast at podcast.insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we are at insights into things, or you can get links to all those on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. And you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights and Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother Sam. Nicely done. You didn't flub that one. Yeah, surprisingly. Uh, I think that's all we had this week. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye. into entertainment a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom we'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week we'll talk about theme park and pop culture news We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights and Entertainment. This is episode 110, The Marvelous Mara Jade. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen. And my caring and attentive co-host, Michelle Whalen. Aww. How are you doing today, sweetie? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm just as good, only <laughs> slightly less. <laughs> okay. Sure. <laughs> we'll go with that. Long week this week. Yeah, it always is. Yeah. Well, especially when we do these on Thursdays. Right. 
It's much it's, shorter it's, when we did them on Sunday or the Saturday, <laughs> right? Yeah, but it's it's like Friday Eve, so that's that's the certainly positive look at it, sure. the positive spin. Well, aspect. and we have a good we have uh, some yes, stuff going we on this have weekend, but we have a fun filled uh, we'll save weekend. It end, so yeah, we teaser. don't want to. <laughs> teaser we don't want to tell teaser. you Spoilers. Every, <laughs> all the fun we're having that's not what we're talking about today what we're talking about today in our disney detective disney's closing the fox channel and moving shows to disney plus and disney gave jungle cruise filmmakers an option to send their movie to disney plus then in our tales from the edge of the galaxy brie larson is rumored to be cast as luke skywalker's wife in an upcoming project and the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel may detour to other planets during unexpected circumstances. And then in our entertainment news, Knives Out 2 has added a Hamilton star. And a certain Cobra Kai star never thought he'd be cast in Karate Kid. And then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. <clears throat> Before we do that, though... I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get video versions of the all of our podcasts on the network. Uh, if you look up Insights Into Things, you can get audio versions of just this podcast listed as Insights Into Entertainment. We're available on Google, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, any place you can get a podcast these days. <laughs> if you don't know where to find them, then you, 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 you think you don't listen to podcasts. Then you're right, exactly. <laughs> Um, we also invite you to uh, reach out to us, give us your feedback, tell us how we're doing, give us suggestions. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. On the Twitter, we are at insights underscore things. <clears throat> On Facebook, we're at facebook.com. The Book of Faces. <laughs> slash Insights Into Things podcast. On the Instagram, we are... Instagram. At Instagram. The grams that are Insta. <laughs> we are at Instagram.com slash Insights Into Things. And Ooh. if we haven't confused you enough with all those, you can just go right to our website at www.insightsintothings.com to get links to everything. <laughs> are we ready to go? I don't know. Are we? I think we're good to go. Okay. Here we go. Go for Disney Detective. So it seems that Disney Plus subscribers in the UK are about to get a major influx of content on the streaming service as Deadline reports that the Fox Channel across the pond is being shuttered after 17 years. The closure of the channel will see all of its programming move to Disney Plus streaming service, uh, marking yet another indicator that the Walt Disney Company has their main primary uh, their primary focus set on growing their streaming platforms. This announcement means that all of the Fox Channel programming will appear under the star vertical on Disney Plus in the UK. In the US, basically it means nothing for us. No change. Well, that's kind of disappointing. <laughs> well, the thing is that in the US, most of Fox's stuff is under Hulu and Hulu and Disney, they're already together. Right. So for the UK, it's big news because they hadn't started switching anything over for them yet. So it, it's big news for, for them. Uh, so a Disney spokeswoman uh, had made a statement that on June 30th, the Fox Channel in the UK will close. Many titles will become available on Star on Disney+. Plus, and uh, we will announce in the near future... Uh, Appreciate everybody's support, blah, 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 blah. Hey, there's going to be lots of new stuff. Did they actually write blah, 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 Yeah, they blah? did. Yeah. Wow. That's, <laughs> was, they need some quoting, better creative writers there. I was quoting them. So, yeah, for us, again, it doesn't mean anything, but for people in the UK, and that was what <laughs> what kind of, um, they, they were really the ones that were kind of being screwed over because when all of the new content was coming to Disney Plus in the U.S., it wasn't available in the UK for a right. while. So like when Mandalorian launched and other things, they had to wait months before it came. So now at least they're starting to, to catch up. So they're going to be able um, to get things like American Horror Story, The Orville, Atlanta, 
Walking Dead, LA's Finest. So a lot of and Fox. How, how many of those have been canceled now? <laughs> yeah, well, but, but they'll be able to, you know, catch up on it. Um, the other thing that came out was last week, word came from the Walt Disney Company that Disney Plus's service has now hit 103.6 million subscribers worldwide as of June 3rd. Million? Million. Million. Uh huh. Meaning that 8.7 million global customers joined the service just in the past quarter. Wow. So that's impressive. Yeah. It's also worth noting that if you look at the demographics for this podcast, our number two uh, viewer slash listener audience is actually the UK. See, so I this so is news for friends, them. All of our friends in the UK. See, listening, watching all those shows with English accents pays off. <laughs> See? Yeah, so mine happens to my insightful pick is another. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, That's I why you said. <laughs> skipped ahead. No spoilers, though. No spoilers. <laughs> no spoilers. So, yeah. So, what else we got in so Disney? So, in news? more Disney Plus news, it seems that Disney gave Jungle Cruise filmmakers the option to send uh, the Dwayne Johnson movie to Disney Plus. Uh, so Disney's Jungle Cruise will set sail in theaters and on Disney Plus on July 30th, a decision that was reached by the studio and the filmmakers behind the movie. Uh, Johnson on Thursday had announced Jungle Cruise, based on the iconic Disney theme park attraction, would be the fourth film to debut in theaters and on Disney's premiere access after the animated uh, Raya and the Last Dragon. Then you have Emma Stone's Cruella, which is coming out next week. Um, then Scarlett Johansson's uh, Black Widow will be coming out July, all through the Premium Plus. Now, again, if you're not sure what that is, it's a uh, $29.99 priced premiere access, which they had actually lost last September with the live action Mulan after Disney had canceled the film's wide theatrical release. So basically for $29.99, you get to own the movie for as long as you have Disney+. Plus. Now the other thing too is when Mulan came out in September, it was only two months that you had to pay for it. If you waited until um, December, you were able to get it as part of your Disney Plus package. So I'm guessing it's probably the same thing. I don't know if there's a set time for any of the premiere access movies, if it's like a two month uh, period or not. But you figure if you're a family of four, heck, if you're a family of three, paying $30 to own the movie is cheaper than actually going to the movie theater. And in some cases, your local movie theater might not yet still be opened at this point. So if you want to see basically a first run movie in the comfort of your home, $30, you know, isn't too bad. Um, so Disney presented the filmmakers behind the Jungle Cruise with the release option. And according to a report, they decided to go with the split release of doing it for Disney Plus as well as doing it in the theater. Um, so it'll be interesting to to see, you know, how it does now that things are, again, starting to open back up. Are people going to choose to go to the theater to, to watch it or are people still going to, you know, to decide to, to stay at home and, and watch it? So This is one area that I'm I'm very curious to see what happens when things kind of go back to normal mm -hmm. is where do movie theaters fit into this? Mm -hmm. And now that you've got these first run movies at home and the business model has proven out that you can make money off of it. Right. Are we going to have a certain class of movies that now continue under that release right, program? Right. Is it going to be open to everybody? Are the award shows now going to start allowing that type of thing? Because they did make an allowance for just the one year. Right. So, because nothing was open, right, so they couldn't right. do it. So, again, does it become where you have to at least show it in so many theaters to be considered, but yet the rest of it? Because, again, you know, we, we talked about this multiple times before is that you have, we're lucky enough, we don't live in a rural area. We're in a suburb of, you know, of Philadelphia in you know new jersey and within 
you know, 15 minutes, we're near at least two movie theaters. Easily, yeah. Easily. Within 25 minutes, another two or three right, theaters. Right. So we're we're very fortunate. We don't have to travel very far to, to get to it. Um, I know people who grew up in the middle of nowhere, New York, you know, upstate New York, and everything was an hour away. You know, you wanted to go to the mall, it was an hour away. Right, you wanted to go right. to the movie theater, it was an hour away. So... For somebody that lives in those areas, heck, I'll pay a premium, you know, even if it's something where it's going to cost me more. And you make the economic point that it's cheaper for us to pay 30 bucks to have Mm -hmm. the whole family watch the movie Mm -hmm. than to truck the whole family out to a movie theater that may or may not, you know, be sanitary. Right. You're, you know, you're paying as much, if not more on snacks than you are on tickets. So you're you're doubling what your cost is. And for a family of three or four, you're looking at over a hundred bucks to go to the movies. Mm -hmm. Well, for the Jungle Cruise, I don't need to see it in a theater. Right. If it's Star Wars, not a Ryan Johnson Star Wars, I need to see it. Depends on the Star Wars. I I need to see it in a theater. But we do have a pretty good sound system and a pretty big TV. We do. So... It's not, you know, it's not like we're sitting there watching it on our phone. True. So, but there but are yes, some there movies are... that need to be seen in the theater. Absolutely, and I will agree. still go to see those in a the theater. Absolutely. But movies like Jungle Cruise or what was the one we had just watched recently? Um, what was the one that we did? Oh, uh, Wonder Woman. Right. Wonder Woman. Well, I didn't want to watch <laughs> after watching it. I don't want up the time back from watching it in my in my living room. But right, right. I would have really been upset if I had paid to go see it in the movie theater. Right. Um, but yeah, movies like that, I don't need to see in a theater. Right. They, I I agree. There are certain movies that seeing it in a movie theater enhances the experience. But for the most part, being able to see it at home, plus the fact that we can pause it, and right. that's what we did with. Wonder Woman, because <laughs> we just needed to take a break. I'll tell you, when, <laughs> when we went to see Endgame, yes. I wish we had a pause button. Yeah, everybody did. Because it was so long, and I had to pee like three times in the movie. Right. So it was nice to be able to watch it in the comfort of my home and pause it when I got home to watch it. Right, right. But that was also, you know, after the fact, after you had already right. seen it. And so, yeah, like, you know, Jungle Cruise or... Or um, uh, Black Widow, you know what? Maybe we'll spend the thirty dollars right. and and do that to be able to watch it, and we'll do a movie night. Everybody gets there, and the fact that you can you own it as long as you're a member mm-hmm. of Disney Plus right. is nice. But how many times are we going to go back and watch Jungle Cruise? I don't know. How many times have you watched Endgame? Oh, and you were watching but it when it was on. Jungle <laughs> Cruise is not Endgame. Okay, uh, you don't. Maybe Maddie will like it. I don't know. Maybe. I mm, guess. No, we won't know until we watch it. That's true. So That's true. So that was all we had for our Disney uh, detective. Yes. We will be right back with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. For over seven years... The Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group we're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. <laughs> you know, I like to keep you on your toes. Right. 
So it seems the MCU star Brie Larson has made no secret of her love for the Star Wars franchise. It seems that the Captain Marvel actress has previously confirmed that she has auditioned for all three of Disney's sequel trilogy films, but unfortunately failed to make the cut. So now it seems she might be getting her wish. So again, rumored report is that um, a new report comes out that the MCU fan favorite is in serious talks with Disney and Lucas Films to play Luke Skywalker's wife, Mara Jade Skywalker, as the Star Wars universe continues to expand. So ever since the iconic Jedi Knight, a, a CGI version of Mark Hamill, uh, showed up uh, from the 1983 era of Return of the Jedi, he made his cameo appearance in the Mandalorian uh, season two finale. There have been rumors about the Star Wars legend's wife now becoming canon. So it's also interesting to note that in Timothy Zahn's Star Wars Expanded Universe Thrawn trilogy novelization, Mara Jade is connected to Grand Admiral Th Grand Admiral Thrawn, um, who happens to be the blue-skinned villain who was introduced into the Mandalorian saga when Ahsoka um, had teamed up with um, the Mandalorian and they defeated um, the magistrate character uh, in, in season two, and they mentioned him, so we kind of got that feeling that he was going to be showing up in episode three. Uh, in season three. So, of course, he is expected to play some sort of major role um, and maybe even interconnected with the spinoffs of Ahsoka and the Rangers of the New Republic. So it would certainly not be surprising if Mara Jade shows up, uh, Mara Jade shows up in the current canon sooner rather than later. Um, obviously, she has a fascinating checkered past. She went from being uh, an emperor's hand assassin for the Galactic Empire to a Jedi Knight in her own right, and then sitting on the Jedi Council. So if she doesn't show up in the third season of The Mandalorian or one of its spinoffs, there's certainly potential for her to appear in the rumored Luke Skywalker and Grogu series that may feature another Marvel actor, Sebastian Sand as the legendary Jedi. So that's been a rumor going around, too, that he was going to be playing Luke Skywalker in something coming up. So that you keep hearing. Uh, well, he's got the metal hand for it, so. <laughs> right. Right. <clears throat> sure. So this isn't the first time that her name's been connected with uh, the Star Wars Legends character. It seems that fans actually had wanted both her or Elizabeth Olsen to take the role of Luke Skywalker's wife. Um, so it is important to know, again, this is all rumors, that at the time that this story came out, nobody's confirmed whether or not uh, she's been part of it. But if it does happen, that would be kind of cool. So You know, when I read this story, when I saw the story was in the show notes, I actually got goosebumps. Mm. And I had to go and read the story because... I've been waiting for them mm -hmm. to bring her to the new Star Wars universe for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And now is the perfect time. You've got all the right elements in place. Yep. You've got Thrawn, who they've developed not only through uh, Rebels in the novels, but now Thrawn's making, allegedly making an appearance in The Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. It's the right time frame. Yep. It's right after the Empire um, has fallen you know, Empire is still kind of fresh. There's that remnant that's still out there. You've got Luke, who's now made his appearance, mm -hmm. which I'm not sure how you're going to do a spinoff with Sebastian Stan as Luke and not superimpose Luke's face right. digitally on top of him. That's got to be kind of weird. Yeah, because you already had him yeah. show up yeah. in something. So how do you not continue to, to do that? Yeah, that's yeah. going to be a little weird. I don't know if... I can't see them taking a main character like that and turning it into a spin-off series. Yeah. I could see cameos. Right. Um, and I could certainly see Mara Jade appearing in here so that she might be able to springboard off onto something, another project. Mm -hmm. um, 
but you're not going to see the, the the thing that kind of saddens me is you're not going to see that storyline develop between Luke and Mara Jade because obviously we're pretty far along in the storyline at this point in time. I don't know if there's enough run room now mm. for him to do some of the things that he did to encounter her as the Emperor's hand, you know, since the Emperor's dead now. Right. So that kind of complicates that side of things. Mm. Um, but yeah, it would work. It would work, you know, and, and technically her appearance in the Thrawn trilogy was all after the empire emperor was dead too. So you could make it work. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love to see it. I think it was a great storyline. I think if they borrow elements from the novels, the, the Thrawn, the Timothy Zahn novels, I think they've got a winning recipe no matter what you do with it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Timothy Zahn could write the dictionary and it would turn out awesome in the end. Right. That's just the, how good of a writer he is. But anyway, yeah, we'll see what happens. Okay. So what else do we have for our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy? So it seems that the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel may detour to other planets during unexpected circumstances. So in an interview with StarWars.com, uh, Walt Disney Imagineer Ann Morrow Johnson divulged some details for the upcoming Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel. Say that five times fast. So that acor- five times fast. <laughs> Thank you. So according to Johnson, when the Halcyon sets off next year, its leisure cruise through the stars may be interrupted with unplanned detours. She said, and just like any other cruise, we have an itinerary, so we have a set list of planets that we'll visit. It's impossible. It's possible that we might take a detour or two if we find ourselves in unexpected circumstances, but you will be able to see those planets, other ships, and maybe the occasional asteroid field out the window as we cruise from place to place. Um, Of course, guests will also be able to take an excursion to Batuu uh, via uh, shuttle during the cruise. So it sounds like there are going to be some unexpected things happening with your two-day, two-night stay uh, aboard. So, Well, you know, it's funny because that kind of sticks with the theme of other Star Wars things in the parks, sort of mm-hmm. like Star Tours. Where, right. You know, Star Tours, you go on an unexpected trip to right. multiple locations. Right. Um, when you're on... Uh, when you go through... Uh, what's the What's the new ride? Not the Millennium Falcon one. What's the other one? Rise of the Resistance. Rise of the Resistance. So you go on Rise of the Resistance, you have an unexpected twist right, on that one Right, right. It's a very Disney yeah. Star Wars thing so to it's, do. It's so a, it's a very thematic type of, mm-hmm. of thing. And what I hope is, I hope it's not a forced thing where you have a script and, okay, day one at 10 o'clock we're doing this and, you know, at 4 o'clock we're doing... I hope they change it up so it feels more organic. Right, and I also hope that they they do something like that, too, where they kind of change it up so that this way, if you go and tell a friend about it, you don't have the exact same experience. Kind of like what they do on Star Tours. Right. On Star Tours, it's a generated or a random generated thing, so you don't always get the same two or three planets Right, so you can go on Star Tours multiple times and have a different experience every time. Right, so I'm hoping that they kind of do that, or depending on where you are on the ship at a certain time, you run across something. Um, One of the things uh, that I saw in a a different article uh, was actually talking about cast members that they were hiring. They were looking for stunt uh, actors. They were looking for musicians. Um, so obviously there's going to be Play that same song. <laughs> there's going to be you know, obviously some sort of bar or some lounge area where there's going to be music it's going on. Star Wars, you have to have the aliens at the bar. Right, so I'm sure there's going to be the aliens at the bar. I'm sure there's going to be these other actors so that if, you know, maybe the ship gets taken over by something and that was somebody else, uh, I don't know if somebody had made a comment or said, like, maybe Kylo Ren shows up and boards your ship and there's I a whole... Not. Make it Vader. I'm so <laughs> sick and tired of the new stuff. <laughs> you don't... Maybe that's... And maybe that's what they do, depending on 
you know, what time frame or Give whatever. Give me my Star Let me fill out a survey to pick what Star Wars I want. <laughs> right. I wonder if you can do that when you make your, would you like new new trilogy or old trilogy? Original? <laughs> one, two, or three. Which one do you want? And that'll Would you like an original or extra crispy trilogy? <laughs> that'll determine what. <laughs> but it, it sounds like, <clears throat> you know, uh, somebody else had made the comment of um, very much like, uh, you know, when you go to Batu and everybody's uh, acting, and, right? They're and all in thing, character, right? There. Everybody's in character, kind of like when you go to a Ren fair and think, you know, the or if you play Dungeons and Dragons, you know, the more you role play, the, Saturday, 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 <laughs> the more you get involved with you know the storyline, or you know, oh, you said the right thing, so you can. Exactly. Go and do this experience. Or if you happen to play The Sims and you have the Batu expansion pack, you can interact with the people there. Too. Right. So it'll be interesting to to see how you know how they they go about this. I'm looking forward to it. I'm curious how long the wait's going to be and how long it's going to take for us to get yeah. reservations. Yeah. Because that's the one thing that'll bring me back to. Oh, to absolutely. I, I I know. <laughs> So trust me, I'm sure I'll get like 50 emails popping up saying reservations are open, reserve, you know, or you have to log on at like midnight to and, and get on a will. waiting list. Yeah, we, we will. I know we will. <laughs> <laughs> so that was all we had for our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. Yes. We'll be right back with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. for entertainment news. <laughs> oh, she left. <laughs> Aww. So, Knives, to, Knives Out 2 has added a Hamilton star. Your favorite Star Wars director, <laughs> Ryan Johnson, uh, has been uh, prepping his Knives Out sequel with gradual reveals of big stars to follow the original Oscar nominated Who Done It and it's shaping up to be a an all-star cast. Following recent news of Katherine Hahn actually being added to the Netflix movie, Knives Out 2 has now lined up its sixth actor and it's Hamilton star Leslie Odom Jr. Um, so Leslie Odom Jr. is coming off of a massive year uh, that the actor and singer, he was actually nominated for an Oscar um, for his portrayal of Sam Cooke in One Night in Miami. Uh, and he'll be playing an undisclosed role in the Knives Out sequel with Daniel Craig. Uh, Edward Norton is on board with this, Catherine Hahn, uh, and Dave Bautista, uh, according to uh, The Hollywood Reporter. Um, obviously, the actor is famously uh, or is known for famously portraying Aaron Burr in the original cast mm -hmm. of, <laughs> of Hamilton, uh, which earned him a Tony for best actor in a leading role. Um, and obviously, a lot of people last year finally got to see. Uh, <laughs> We have some visitors in, in the studio right now. I don't know if you can... Yeah. So we have Pumpkin and we have Leota. Because we have the door open because it gets really hot in here. Oh, and there they go. They're like, yeah, we're done. We came, we saw, we're done. Our guest today on the show. <laughs> Our guest today, Pumpkin and Leota. Um, 
So obviously a lot of people got to see the performance of Hamilton last summer when it went uh, uh, premiered on Disney+. Plus. Um, so the original Knives Out, obviously, if you haven't seen it, had a very massive cast uh, that included Chris Evans, Jamie Lee Curtis, uh, the late Christopher Plummer, uh, and in- introduced uh, the um, the detective character, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce his name, so I'm not even going to try, but it was actually played by Daniel Craig. So there were all, all these rumors about... Uh, a second version coming out, or a, a sequel coming out, but it was like, okay, well, if you already solved the who done it, how are you going to do a second one? But basically, uh, it's the detective; he's on another case, and that's how they're doing a second version. And it, uh, and there's possibly even going to be a third. Uh, version as well. Um, what's kind of funny is that Leslie Odom Jr. back in 2017, he actually had a role in the Agatha Christie adaptation of Murder on the Orient Express, uh, which has often been compared uh, by Knives Out. Um, so, th- th- you know, that's a, a more classic version of the whodunit where the Knives Out was a a more modern take on it. Um, So Knives Out is confirmed to continue with a second and third installment, which will both be landing on Netflix. Um, So I personally am looking forward to it because I did see the first one and I thought it it was really good. So, Well, being the cultural swine (laughs) that I am, I never did see the first one. Uh, but it's probably we, available on, on Amazon. <laughs> maybe it'll be next week's pick. You never know. There you know. go. Maybe I'll get you to watch it. Um, but with Leslie Odom Jr., I think he's a fantastic actor. Yeah, and the first one was real, was, you know, such an amazing cat. Don Johnson, you know, was in it too. And it was like, all right, this is interesting, Heather. See, I think the know. biggest challenge with this is to find a way to get, find some excuse to get him to sing. Right. Because he has a fantastic Oh, absolutely. Voice. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if that would really work in a movie like this. Yeah, probably not. Because in the Agatha Christie one, he didn't sing yeah. either. So That's okay. Yeah. That's all right. We'll just keep watching Hamilton over and over. <laughs> there you go. Next up, we have Cobra Kai, Cobra Kai, Cobra Kai. So it seems in uh, an article, in an interview that was on uh, Yahoo, more than 35 years after his big screen debut as the... Uh, as uh, Johnny Lawrence in The Karate Kid, uh, William uh, Zabika? Zapka. Zapka, sorry, is now, you know, a legitimate Emmy contender for his performance as the adult Johnny on Netflix Cobra Kai. Um, he said in the interview, the 18 year old me is kicking myself on a beach somewhere. Um, it's so unbelievable. He said the wild success of Cobra Kai, um, which follows Johnny and Daniel LaRusso as they run dueling karate dojos, is even more surprising given that the teenage uh, Johnny didn't think, or, or uh, the teenage Billy didn't think that he even had a chance to play Johnny in the first place. He said, when I read the Karate Kid the Karate Kid script, as I turned the pages, I was like, I'm never going to get this park. I'm not a black belt. I don't know karate. He's in a motorcycle gang. You know, I, I don't even know how to ride a motorcycle. He's mean. The last thing that I did was a milk commercial, maybe even M&M's. Um, they're never going to see me as this bad guy. Um, but fortunately, every Karate Kid and Cobra Kai fan knows that he was wrong, um, that he was obviously perfect for the part. Um, it was interesting. So I, I watched the the whole uh, interview, and he had said, you know, that if you would have told him 10 years ago, are you going to, you know, reprise this role? He would have been like, yeah, probably not. And he said that throughout his career, a lot of people have brought him various different things um, to kind of reprise the role, but just nothing seemed right. Uh, it wasn't the the right type of project. Uh, he even did, he said he did a music video back in like 2008 that was like a parody called Sweep the Leg. Um, so he kind of, you know, 
didn't put too much emphasis on it. And he said, you know, he had kind of lost touch with, uh, you know, with most of the cast. But when Pat Morita had passed away, he had gone to the memorial. And that's when he and Ralph Macchio kind of teamed back up again and kept in touch uh, and kind of rekindled uh, their friendship. And then you had this group of writers that came along and showed the script and he just fell in love with it because you got to see this other side of Johnny that kind of made sense. Like it it worked. It was much better than anything else that he had even, you know, thought of. So he was very happy obviously to, to take it and run with it. And, you know, Obviously, we're going to get a, another season out of it, and he could possibly, you know, get an Emmy for it, too. Yeah, I think that's cool. I, I think the, probably the outstanding thing about the, the new Cobra Kai series is how they humanize the characters. Mm-hmm. You know, you didn't see that much character development in the movies themselves, except for, you know, Daniel and, and Mr. Miyagi. Right. And the fact that you're, you're getting these I mean, I don't want to call him a tertiary character. He was a main character for mm-hmm. the first movie. Right. But you're seeing that, you know, movies back in the 80s were very black and white. Mm-hmm. Your bad guy was bad, your good guy was good, and that's just the way it was. Right. And what you're seeing now is you're, you're seeing different facets of characters now. You're seeing some character depth, and some characters really still are bad, but... Right, and you know, and like you kind of feel bad for him yeah but yet you know hey you made that bed you you right. know like you you understand now right. why he's the way he is but right. it doesn't excuse the way that he is right but it's nice to see that he's kind of trying to redeem himself and it's and what he thought was kind of funny in the whole thing was that how stuck in the 80s they made him like he doesn't know about the internet he doesn't know about you know so they showed a clip of when you know he and miguel are at the concert and he's like yeah make sure you 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 know you copy that and send me a copy he's like yeah i'll tag you he's like what do you mean you'll tag me you know i'll tag you on facebook what's facebook you know were things that most people take for granted or most people know the reference He's still stuck in 1980s and, you know, hasn't yeah. realized yeah, that a, the world has moved on. The show itself has a lot of character because of its character mm-hmm. development. Yeah. And and it's those character stories. It's those, the the, the backgrounds and the flaws mm-hmm. and the insecurities that they explore. That's really what's making the movie. It's not, or the TV show, mm-hmm. it's not this overriding plot. It's that plot that gets you to tune in every week. Yeah. But every episode is a different facet of the personality. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's a very well written show. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, and great actors, too. Mm-hmm. So, that was all we had. That's for it. Entertainment news. We'll be right back with our, with, um, insightful, our picks. insightful picks of the week. <laughs> I hadn't scrolled up that far in my notes. <laughs> Not a problem. I abandoned my notes. Oh, <gasps> my gosh. We'll be right back. <laughs> Go for your insightful pick. So, hey, my insightful pick of the week is a British documentary. <laughs> Shocker. Shocker. And it's on Disney+. Plus. Wow. Um, it's actually also on National Geographic as well because it's uh, under that um, banner on Disney+, Plus is the National uh, Nat Geo. Uh, and it is called Being the Queen. Um, So in this biography of Queen Elizabeth II, uh, 1895 Films, which is the company that made it, uh, uses a treasure trove of never-before-heard interviews from dozens of people who have known the Queen personally to tell the story of her life. This uh, This approach, paired with deeply researched archival footage, puts us in the room with Queen Elizabeth II during some of the most important and trying events of the history of the British monarchy. It's kind of interesting because it's only a 44 minute uh, documentary, but it, it basically runs the, the gamut of, um, you know, the, the start of her um, monarchy, 
uh, everything with the all of her children getting married, all of their marriages kind of breaking down. Um, you know, Diana passing away. Um, up until because uh, it it, it uh, was a 2020 um, documentary, so obviously Philip is still alive at the end of it. But it, it's a a nice condensed version of it. But it does touch on a lot of key points. Uh, if you're somebody who watched The Crown, there's different things that uh, are picked. Of course, we watched The Crown. There was English accents. <laughs> but for somebody else, you're like, oh, okay, you know, where there were things that happened on The Crown that I didn't necessarily know about that had happened, and watching the documentary, they were brought up. So it was like, oh, okay, yeah, I remember that. So they touch on. Other various things. Um, you know, one of the things was talking about her, her coronation and one of her ladies in waiting, uh, who's one of her cousins or something. And, you know, she talks about that day and they have uh, video, uh, you know, film video uh, uh, of that day and you can see some various things and, and she talks about it. So, a little behind the things scene. So, Again, a nice little condensed version. It's not one of these three-hour-long uh, uh, documentaries. It's a nice, short, concise, you know. And again, some information you've heard before, you've seen before, but there were different aspects uh, to it as well, which which was nice. So Nice pick. Thank you. So my pick this week is digging deep in the woods. This is another one of oh, my wow. yeah. yeah. This is another one of my uh, gems that I found on Amazon Prime. It's called the New York's World's Fair in 1964. Being the history buff that I am, <clears throat> it's an extraordinary documentary that takes a fresh look at the sights and sounds of this once-in-a-lifetime event. Produced in 1996, this is one of the the dig deep rare treasure finds of Amazon using vintage footage from the fair. You're transported back in time to this historic event where quote cutting edge technology was on display. The New York world's fair held over 140 pavilions, 110 restaurants, uh, 80 nations involved, 24 U S states and over 45 corporations to build exhibits or attractions at Flushing Meadows in Queens, New York. The classic documentary takes you on a nearly one-hour walk through some of the offerings of the fair. You get a feel for the spirit of the fair, the architecture, and the technology on display. The fair's theme was Peace Through Understanding, dedicated to man's achievement on a shrinking globe in an expanding universe. Very uh, lofty goals, very uh, you know significant achievements they were going for. American companies dominated the exhibition as exhibitors, Disney being one of the most prominent with several other exhibitions uh, retiring to the Disney theme park, such as It's a Small World and Carousel of Progress, one of which is one of my favorite rides. The other one I try to avoid like the plague. You can try and figure out which one is which. <laughs> <laughs> While the documentary mutes the overriding cultural significance of the Cold War going on at the time, you can't help but feel the energy and excitement of the space race that was a direct result of that quasi-conflict throughout the film. It was one of the last great exhibitions of American innocence and innovation before the darker, more turbulent times just a few years ahead with the Vietnam War and Watergate scandals when America seemed to lose its innocence. What I liked about this is that they didn't, it wasn't, tilt it towards any of the corporations mm -hmm. you saw glimpses right and like disney didn't display anything they didn't have an exhibition there they did it for all these other corporations right right so disney's not even mentioned in here mm -hmm. uh, but you see some of their displays like you see the building that was the carousel of progress and you know immediately what it is right. in the film right um there was another one where they had uh, greyhound had sponsored these little um shuttles they were they were I don't know, like souped up golf carts almost. And I had watched an episode of American Restoration where they dug one of these up and they actually rebuilt one of these and restored it. And it was neat to actually see them 
puttering around the exhibit, you know, people in, in these. There were like two right. or three people, you know, little okay. vehicles. Okay, okay. Um, it was just very neat to see at the time it was so futuristic. Uh-huh, right. And some of the architecture still holds up to this day. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the technology was just, like, it's almost, like, the nostalgia of it is worth watching. Mm -hmm. uh, to see what we thought the future was going to be like then and what it is today. Right. So, it's only an hour. It's available on Amazon Prime. It's, you know, it's a nice little little flashback in, in time to some American history there. Very so, cool. Uh, the New York World's Fair, 1964. So I think that was just about it. We did have one more thing that we wanted to talk about with our live audience. Right. So as we mentioned, we kind of had a fun-filled weekend coming up. Um, so one of the things that we are going to be attending on Sunday is the Monster Mania Outdoor Little Mall of Horrors pop-up event. Um, so those of you that are from the the area um even down in maryland as well because they do yeah. uh go down there monster mania is one of those events that happen a couple of times a year they do one up in here in cherry hill uh and then they do one uh down in the maryland area and it's a horror film uh, and memorabilia convention. They usually have a whole bunch of different celebrities there. That's where a lot of the Walking Dead stars, when, the, like, before the show even came out, were making the rounds there. Um, the, so they do photo ops with celebrities and things like that. Obviously, when convention stopped, this was one that right. had to Casualty stop. Casualty of the pandemic. Casualty of the pandemic. But it seems they were able to kind of put their minds together and kind of come up with a mini mall version of it. Uh, so what they're doing is also one of the other convention areas that we usually hit is the uh, Philadelphia Convention Center in Oaks, Pennsylvania, which is a huge... Um, they got what four or six exhibit halls or something. Yeah, I, I want to yeah. say four four halls, but it's, I think they can break huge. it down into other ones. Well, they have this huge parking lot because of all of this. Right. So they're going to be doing an outside event this coming weekend. This is the first time that they've ever tried anything. So it's basically all of the vendors that would normally be at their event, and then some. Uh, will be there. Uh, normally, Monster Mania is what, like $35, $40 like that, yeah. for the day. Uh, so because there aren't all as many extra things, it's only $15 to get in. There might still be tickets available for Sunday because, again, they only had limited quantities available. But then as uh, limit restrictions opened up they did open up some yeah, they some tickets, more tickets up. um masks are required even though the whole cdc blah 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 outside masks are required for everybody um so again if you're watching this live and you're in the area uh you can go to monstermania.net see if there's still tickets available um we are probably go you know more than likely we'll talk about this Next week, maybe yeah, even we'll have, have some, some. We'll have some footage we'll bring back and show folks what it was um, like and stuff. You know, and maybe again, if this is something that goes well, maybe it's something they'll think about doing in the future. Who who knows? So I'm so look forward to being outside in the parking lot in 96, <laughs> 96 degree, degree weather. degree weather. Oh, and they are going to have a bunch of celebrities there too. So you know, for as long as they can survive the heat, <laughs> they'll probably be in enclosed. Uh, you know, things with a whole lot of fan. Everybody's going to have generators yeah. with like yeah, <laughs> with really. the fans and stuff. So it'll be definitely interesting to see. This is, again is one of the first events that we're going to. Uh, you know, since everything's kind of reopening, so we'll we'll see. Hopefully, it it goes well. Yep, should be interesting. Mm -hmm. Before we let you go, though, I would encourage folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get video versions of all of the network shows listed as insights into things, or you can get just audio versions of this podcast listed as insights into entertainment. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, 
Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Amazon, etc., etc. Uh, I would also encourage folks to reach out and uh, give us your feedback, give us suggestions, tell us what we're doing wrong. You can email us at comments and insights into things.com. You can find us on the Twitterverse at <laughs> insights underscore things. We are on the book of faces at <laughs> www.facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. The grams that are instant <laughs> or insta uh, at instagram.com backslash insights into things. Audio versions of the podcast can be found at podcast.insights and entertainment.com. On the tubes of you. <laughs> Or YouTube, you can find us on youtube.com backslash insights into things. We twitch uh, five days a week. <laughs> the doctor said he's going to give me medicine for that <laughs> at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you do get a Twitch Prime. Throw it our way. You subscription. Say. Throw it our way. We would appreciate yeah. that. It helps us keep all these lights on. <laughs> And it gets really hot in here. Might pay for the fan at some point in time because it's really hot in here right now. Uh, But you can get us at twitch.tv slash insights into things. And if you forgot all of those other links and you're not sure where to go, you can actually go to our main website to find links for everything. And that is insightsintothings.com. That's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everybody. Bye. Bye. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow. This is episode 11, The Trump Legacy. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my co-host, Sam Whalen. How are you doing today, Sam? Doing good. It's been a little bit of a while since we've done a podcast, but uh, looking forward to another great show. Yeah, yeah. We took a little time off over the holidays to redo the studio and so forth. Uh, in the process, we uh, have a new president. Um, so I thought it would be interesting. Uh, we had, had originally discussed... Um, doing a, a podcast on <clears throat> the insurrection on January 6th. And I thought that was probably, while it was a worthwhile topic, it might be a little too focused. I think it would be probably more interesting and more helpful to look at the Trump legacy in a more general sense. I don't want to, I'm trying, trying, 
trying to be as fair and impartial as possible. I don't want to just look at the negative stuff right. from Trump. And I, and I think the insurrection reflects very poorly on him. So today we're going to look at what some of his notable accomplishments were over the last four years. We'll look at some of, some of his failures. And then we'll have kind of an open discussion about what the lasting effects of Donald Trump on the U.S., the world, the presidency, and so forth are. And then just a candid talk about where we think the future is uh, under Joe Biden for the next four years. So, uh, ready to get into it? All right. So, I wasn't even going to do the plugs because I think this is going to be a long podcast. We'll do the plugs at the end of the show. Um, so, um, notable accomplishments. I kind of broke these down into a couple of key ones that that came out of the, the WhiteHouse.gov website prior to the changeover. And the first one, and one that I think really is probably the biggest, is the reshaping of the federal judiciary. So everyone knows that Trump appointed three Supreme Court justices that are life terms, but he also appointed 220 judges to lower courts, which are all lifetime appointments as well. 25% of U.S. Circuit Court judges were Trump that are in place today were Trump nominees. And Trump's influence as a result of that will live on through the judiciary for the foreseeable future. Um, do you think that is a, a good thing, a bad thing, an uh, indifferent thing? What are your thoughts? Uh, I think it depends on, on what these judges are going to be ruling on in the coming years. Um, <clears throat> And especially since it's impressive as a president to be able to do that in only four years to um, appoint that many judges and three Supreme Court justices as well. Um, so whether or not they're going to – the judges will you know, rule on certain things in the coming years, it's still um, – it's something that will be in a history book looking back at the presidency of, of one of his accomplishments. Absolutely. And, and I think the one thing that we've seen so far is the – Three Supreme Court justices did not tip the balance of power in the Supreme Court at this point in time, given the number of cases that Trump brought to the Supreme Court during the election phase that did not go in his favor. Uh, so I think, uh, if nothing else, the impartiality of the Supreme Court seems to still be intact, which mm -hmm. is a good thing. Uh, the next thing that we we look at is... Space Force. Space Force is the first new branch of the U.S. military since the U.S. Air Force was created from the Army Air Corps uh, after World War II. It's supposed to be a more centralized version of the military missions in space. Now, that's not fighting aliens or anything like that. <clears throat> what they do is they handle satellite surveillance, they handle all the military satellites that they're responsible for the GPS system that's both civilian and military use. Um, they're monitoring the various debris that's in space to make sure that it's not dangerous to future missions. What do you think? Do you think like, I mean, I'll be honest with you. When I heard that we were creating Space Force, I couldn't help but chuckle. Uh -huh. And I wasn't the only one because this spawned a Steve Carell comedy series, you yeah. know, that came out of this. What are your thoughts on Space Force? Well, I think uh, space exploration is important. Um, and I know over the years, the public has sort of waned away from that. And there's not as much interest as there was like in the 80s and 90s and stuff. Um, I do think if Space Force is going to actually do something and it's not just a dumping ground for money like a lot of other of these types of programs, you know, they spend a lot of money, especially when it comes to the military. There's a lot of money put into that. Um, but I think if they do monitor things like the debris around the earth, which is getting really like it's becoming a real problem um, and satellites and things like that, I think that's a good start. Um, and maybe they'll segue into actual exploration missions uh, in the future, hopefully. Yeah, we don't really know what direction they're going in right now. They really inherited a lot of things that the Air Force had already been doing. Um, they're not doing exploration at this point. Yeah. That is still the domain of NASA. But, you know, we have 
missions up there. You have an international space station up there that occasionally needs to be moved so it doesn't get hit by a refrigerator size piece of debris that brings it down. So yeah. that's really what they're working toward. And you also have private companies like um, SpaceX that are going a lot more in, you know, they have a little bit more of a budget than NASA does for the funding. So they're able to do a lot more missions into space. Sure, sure. Yeah. In fact, speaking of space junk, one of the things that's really starting to crowd the low Earth orbit are these new uh, internet enabled satellites. You know, SpaceX, Elon Musk is putting a huge constellation of satellites, some 400 or 500 satellites up there, uh, all of which are moving obstacles that are flying at 17,500 miles an hour. So it's not a small job monitoring. That stuff for safety. What's the next thing that we have? Uh, so next up, we have the tax reform. Uh, it was the biggest overhaul of the nation's tax code in three decades. Uh, it slashed corporate tax rates from 35% to 21%. Uh, some critics argue it was a windfall for massive corporations uh, at the expense of the middle class. Uh, administration officials predicted GDP boost by 3 to 6%. Now, we haven't seen the GDP boost that they expected so far. However, I can say, at least in my experience, that slashing of the corporate tax was enough of an incentive for my company to give more back to its employees. Mm. I think my company is an exception to that rule. I think a lot of companies take that as a windfall and they absorb the profit themselves. Right. Uh, this kind of goes back to the early 80s with Reagan economics of trickle-down economics where, you know, Give the rich people more money and then it'll trickle down to other people. Which and I don't think that worked then, did it? That has never worked in the history of mankind, <laughs> yeah. actually. Turns out the rich just get richer. <laughs> you don't get rich by spending yeah. it, that's for sure. <laughs> so the tax reforms definitely are there. A lot of those went in place before the COVID pandemic happened. And I think a lot of the benefits that happened from that tax reform are largely wiped out because of the debt the company the country has incurred uh, as a result of a lot of these COVID relief packages. Yeah, but that tax plan, that tax, that corporate tax rate is going to stay in place until the new administration could put something together to overturn it. So it's something to think about. That's correct. Yeah. So the benefits will still be there for a lot of that. Uh, let's talk about the, the reform of the justice system a little bit. So he, one of the things that, that Trump tried to do was address the mass incarceration in the federal prisons. Uh, for several decades, they've been severely overpopulated. A lot of it had to do with uh, lower level drug arrests for minor infractions. But he also overhauled the federal sentencing to reduce the minimum mandatory sentences. And that's that's kind of a concept that a lot of people aren't familiar with, is that the federal guidelines for sentencing for just about every crime out there, there's a minimum amount of time that you can sentence someone. And even if it's an insignificant issue, but you have to sentence someone, they have to get that minimum amount of time. Um, and that was largely done to try to preserve fairness in, in the penal system itself so that you couldn't have people buying judges off and stuff like that. So one of the things that Trump did do was he reduced those minimum sentences so that even though you may be going into jail for these offenses, you're getting out sooner. Um, he also tried to shift focus from uh, punishment to rehabilitation and more job training opportunities. One of the problems that convicted felons have when they get out of prison is they lack the skills to, to get jobs and, and employment. As a result, they become, become a burden on society. So the focus kind of shifted to try to prepare these individuals to get back into the workforce and become producing members of society again. And what's the last thing that we have to talk about for his accomplishments? Uh, defeating the ISIS caliphate. Trump has falsely claimed ISIS is totally defeated. Uh, though territory has been lost, there are still an estimated 18,000 fighters uh, between Iraq and Syria. The U.S. was successful in killing ISIS leader, I'm um, probably going to pronounce his name wrong, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. I apologize if That's I That's actually pretty good. Right? Yeah, well, we'll go with that. Yeah. 
So, yeah, I mean, it's no different than when George Bush landed on the aircraft carrier with a big giant banner and said, mission accomplished. Right. Progress has been made. More progress has been claimed than has been made, I think. At this point in time, ISIS is lacking territory, but they're not lacking support. Uh, they're getting support through other countries like Syria and Iraq and Iran. So they're being funded by these countries, but they might not have the territory that they once had. Yeah, I think conflicts like this in this in this area of the world are always going to be this messy, and they have been since the U.S. began to get involved way back in what, the 70s and 80s. It's always been a, a difficult, uh, not war, but difficult conflict to manage, whether through proxy or for, through direct involvement from the U.S. And I think that this is no different. I think, and it's going to continue to be this way because we just, it's, it's too difficult of something for us to manage and certainly not fix. Sure. Yeah. And no, I agree a hundred percent. One of the things that I didn't put in here that, it, that was related to this was the drawdown on troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, which Donald Trump has made significant progress there. He had wanted to get us out of that area completely, but because of the sensitive nature of that territory, we couldn't pull out entirely. Yeah. Um, but the number of people, number of uh, troops that are in that area have been reduced. Ironically enough to the point that we had more people in Washington, more soldiers in Washington for the inauguration than we had in Afghanistan oh, really? and the Iraq. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's difficult because, I've, I'm obviously not like a general or anything, but it seems like we make the progress with the troops. And then the second the troops are gone, all that progress is lost, sometimes overnight. So it's a difficult call. It's easy to say we're going to get everybody out of here, but it's a sticky situation. And it's not that easy. Yeah. And when you think about it, you figure this is the longest war the United States has ever been involved in. You know, the only, the closest one to this was Vietnam, mm -hmm. which was roughly 10, 12 years, but. Figure we've been fighting this war in that territory, this war on terror since September 11th uh, attacks. Yeah, and we could we could probably do a whole show comparing that to Vietnam. I mean, they're somewhat similar in terms of uh, a difficult terrain, um, the language barriers, things like that, uh, guerrilla tactics, and all that. It's it's it is just a mess. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's some of the notable accomplishments that Trump had in office. Let's take a break. We'll come back and we'll talk about some of the failures that I think a lot of people have focused on. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Tomorrow. Today we are talking about. Uh, the legacy of Donald Trump. We just went over some of his notable accomplishments. I think it's prudent for us to t talk about some of his failures at this point in time. So the first one that I have here is the incident in Charlottesville uh, related to George Floyd. So during this entire process, Trump really blamed, quote, many sides for the violence uh, at the rally for George Floyd. And at the time he claimed that there were quote, very fine people on both sides. One side being you know, the black lives matter group who were protesting the death of George Floyd. The other side being made up largely of white supremacists and the KKK. This statement itself really stirred up a lot of a, a bit of a hornet's nest here when he was describing these white supremacists as very fine people. 
and he took criticism from both Democrats and Republicans, including traditionally staunch supporters like Lindsey Graham. What are your thoughts on on this particular failure of Trump's? I think it it's it seems like such a simple thing, right? You see white supremacists and KKK leaders on one side. You just have to condemn them, and he couldn't do it. And he was directly asked, I remember multiple times by reporters, to just condemn them, and he wouldn't do it. And it makes you wonder why that is and and what is going through his mind and, and his other – his uh, administration's mind, why they he simply would not come out and condemn them. And you saw that again recently with the ins, uh, insurrection at the Capitol, where he said, go home, we love you. Very kind words to people that were attempting to storm and succeeded in storming the Capitol building. And it's it's it just makes you wonder. <laughs> yeah, well, and the thing is that when this happened, there was a, a lot of research that came out about Trump's history and the Trump family history And information came out at this time that his father was a member of the KKK. He was arrested uh, in the early part of the 20th century at a KKK rally for crimes that were committed at the time. So it was very disturbing to see this side of a president come out where he was openly endorsing white supremacists. And that was a pattern of repeated alarmist type behavior that we've saw the last at least two years of his presidency where where we've had these issues. What was the next thing that that we're pointing out here? Uh, So we're taking a look at America's global image under the Trump presidency. Uh, America's global image has declined significantly under Trump. I think that anybody that reviews the last four years can probably put that together. Uh, Trump repeatedly insulted key U.S. allies while cozying up to dictators Um, Trump pulled the U.S. out of key international agreements, like the Paris Climate Accords. Uh, Surveys show the majority of citizens from 32 different countries have an overall lack of confidence in Trump to do the right thing on world affairs. Uh, And finally, Trump's handling of the coronavirus pandemic has left the U.S. embarrassed on the world stage and created a void in global leadership that China is rushing to fill in currently. Yeah, I mean, he left us really in a bit of a predicament. Yeah. So much so that immediately after the election, before the results were certified, you had uh, allied nations that were reaching out to to Joe Biden to congratulate him on the win before it was even official. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the long-term implications of that are because I think a lot of the damage that he did, at least as far as our allies go, are things that can be built back fairly quickly with him out of office. Mm -hmm. My concerns center around more the relationships that he had with the adversaries of the United States, like the the Putins and North Korea and, and so forth. You know, I mean, he really took the country in a direction that it never went in the past. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, there's multiple instances of him talking about how he admires Vladimir Putin and things like that. And it's not a great look, right? I mean, on paper, Americans are supposed to be like this bastion of freedom, which obviously in practice is not necessarily the case. But when you're on the world stage cozying up with known dictators, borderline admitted dictators who have, of course, never been proven, but have, you know, eliminated political rivals through, you know, various means or uh, subjugating their own people. When you see the leader of the free world being friendly with them, it, it sends a, a disturbing message to other countries, not to mention the people of America as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of scary when we get to that point. So the next thing we talk about is immigration, which was one of the things that Donald Trump had campaigned on. Um, his promise to build the wall, to stop illegal immigration coming in, to deport the people that were in the country already that shouldn't have been here, in his opinion. You know, Trump has been accused of human rights abuses and violating international law by the UN for his treatment of undocumented immigrants. I couldn't tell you the last time an American president was accused of human rights violations. Uh, Trump policies had led to the separation of at least 5,500 families and saw children placed in cages for the world to see, which was another embarrassing moment that the press really hammered him on. 445 of those children still are left separated from their parents. So it's a continuing problem where they can't find these parents for the children. 
The president of the American Academy for Pediatrics labeled Trump's policies nothing less than government-sanctioned child abuse. Yikes. <laughs> What are your thoughts on his immigration policy? I mean, we've got a lot of the wall done, yeah. right? So is that a good thing or a bad thing? I, I don't I don't think the wall was a great idea. I mean, it, it it for people that think that we should take a strong stance on immigration, I think it's a a very good physical thing to see. But I think in practice, I don't know that the wall really works. And not to mention, we speaking back to the ice situation, um, we were gonna we actually talked about doing a whole episode on ice, um, but Doing the research, we found it it would be better to just lump it in with this. Um, but the fact that 545 children don't have their parents or any real person to take care of them still, it, and for this long, is is horrifying. And the fact that it's just it's still happening. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, Trump tried to defend his actions by claiming that a lot of these children were not brought over by their parents; they were being brought over by criminals and and mules and you know, people that were trying to get into the country illegally and using the children as a means to get into the country. And there just wasn't any facts to back that, that claim up. As with a lot of the things that we deal with, with Trump, there's a, there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of what the Trump administration has labeled alternative facts. And I think you have, a difficulty in sifting through there's there there's so much misinformation thrown out about these things that it takes an effort to sift through that that you shouldn't have to make such an effort to do yeah i think that i mean we'll probably touch on it more later in our concluding thoughts but i think that's part of the plan is to put as much uh false things out there that you question what is real and what is true and then from there you can make your reality whatever you want right so what was the next thing that we're going to ding him on here? Uh, so the handling of Iran, Syria, and Afghanistan. We touched a little bit on this uh, with the troop withdrawals. Uh, Trump's decision to withdraw from the U.S. from the 2015 Iran nuclear deal induced chaos throughout the Middle East. Um, it remains one of Trump's most unpopular decisions in the global arena. Trump has failed to thwart Iran's aggressive behavior through his maximum pressure campaign. Uh, he exacerbated the situation by ordering the killing of Iran's top general, uh, another name I'm going to probably mispronounce, uh, Kasim Soleimani, uh, which was huge when it happened. I remember we talked about it on one of the previous shows yeah. um, about how insane that was. And it, it's almost like we forgot it happened. But here it is again, looking back at everything. Uh, Iran has since abandoned the nuclear deal and is actively working towards nuclear weapons. Uh, again, Trump pulled U.S. troops out of Syria, uh, abandoning U.S. allied Kurdish forces. I remember that was extremely controversial, too, uh, too. Especially with, I saw a lot of veterans on Twitter, like talking about that when that happened, about how that was wrong to do because you left these people hanging to dry. Uh, the withdrawal induced a humanitarian crisis in the region and the security vacuum that Russia, Iran, and accused war criminal Syrian President Bashir al-Assad benefited from. Uh, Trump started a massive pullout of U.S. troops from Afghanistan, essentially surrendering the country once again to the Taliban. And finally, Trump dismissed dismissed published reports that Russia paid bounties to Taliban-like militants to kill U.S. troops. So we're getting a little bit of the cozying up with dictators again in this in this section as well. And overall, it's, it's not a great look. <laughs> yeah, no. And if you look, you know, at the, at the big picture <clears throat> of weakening our position in the Middle East by all these troop pullouts, by pulling out of the, the Iran nuclear deal, which is just going to incite additional chaos, it's going to rile the Israelis uh, who won't withstand, who won't stand for Iraq having nuclear weapons. So they're going to act unilaterally on their own. If we do not maintain a coalition in the area, you're, you're basically lighting the fuse on a powder keg. And I, I look at what he did and I can't fathom why you would have done that. Uh, he claims that he doesn't want America tied up in these, long-term wars, but we're almost like the control rod in the nuclear reactor there. And if you pull that control rod out, the nuclear reactor is going to, going to melt down. Yeah. It's kind of like what we talked about before. Like it's, it's easy to say, well, I don't want America involved in these situations, but when you've got nuclear deals signed with these countries, that's more than just a war. There's, there's larger implications there on both the world stage and for that local area. And it's, uh, 
like you said, it's it's lighting a fuse that I guess the new administration is going to have to deal with. Yeah, and and it's a it's a headache, you know. I mean, not only is it weakening the U.S. position and our allies' position in the region, you're you're directly strengthening our adversaries' position in, at the same time, uh, which makes you wonder what team Trump was really playing for at the time. So the next big one that that Trump has been trying to de- de- take care of since day one was the repeal and the replacement of Obamacare. Uh, Trump lost the vote for a full congressional appeal uh, thanks to, at the time, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg? No, Senator McCain. Oh. That was that was like one of the great acts of defiance that Senator McCain had against Donald Trump was to to turn that vote down. Um, he's managed to dismantle parts of it, including the rollbacks on tax penalties for those that are not enrolled in health care. But in the meantime, he's failed to offer anything close to a replacement. He's been questioned several times on this, and his statement has been, oh, it's well, it's it's ready. We're going to roll it out in a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks never got here. He never rolled out a replacement for it. The Supreme Court, as a result of that, did not allow it to be repealed because there wasn't a replacement for it. But he's weakened it significantly, and it, this is another problem that he's generated that the current administration, the new administration, is going to have to deal with. Yeah, I'm not sure if if the Biden team has said what their plans are to deal with this, but you'd imagine they're probably just going to reinforce it and kind of build back up where it was. You, you have to. You have to at least put in the stuff that was that was pulled out yeah. at this point because it's kind of silly to not have these in. And it's unfortunate for people that – because this was one of his big things when he was running for president was that he was going to get rid of Obamacare and, put, and Obamacare and put something new into place. It's unfortunate that all these people were – that voted for him or promised that and unfortunately simply never got it. Well, and the, the ultimate irony is, is that he didn't want to get rid of Obamacare. He wanted to get rid of Obama's legacy mm-hmm. and Obamacare being a large part of that legacy was one of the things that he targeted. Right. What's the next thing we have? Uh, so we have the uh, twice impeachment. Uh, this has been obviously in the news recently. Uh, Trump is the first U.S. president to be impeached twice while in office. Uh, Trump's first impeachment was for abuse of power when he attempted to solicit outside foreign interference in a U.S. election. Uh, I believe that was Ukraine, correct? Correct. Uh, Trump withheld $400 million in congressionally approved military aid from the Ukraine to pressure them into investigating Joe Biden's son for corruption. His second impeachment revolved around his attempt to incite an insurrection of his supporters when they stormed and breached the U.S. Capitol in an attempt to stop the certification of the 2020 election. Yeah, we're not talking about flimsy things here. No. <laughs> we're literally talking about two treasonous acts that the president of the United States, who's sworn to uphold the Constitution, has been accused of. Now, that the first impeachment that we had, <clears throat> he was not found guilty. He was not convicted of the impeachment. But that was largely because the Senate was controlled, the majority of the Senate was controlled by the Republicans at the time who, for whatever reason, whether it was fear of repercussions or what, uh, would not go against Donald Trump despite the overwhelming evidence. You know, the the large accusation in that first impeachment was that he solicited outside interference in American elections. If that wasn't enough, based on this phone call that, that came out, During the whole process of this, when it came out, he later on public television, you know, on news networks, stood in the driveway of the White House and further solicited China to interfere in the election by investigating Joe Biden's son. So uh, you could throw out that first allegation where he was trying to hold money over the Ukraine's head. He's publicly inviting a, an aggressor nation to interfere with our election. How he didn't get correct uh, convicted of that is really just mind boggling. Yeah. It's uh stuff like that. We'll touch on most likely later, but it sets a dangerous precedent for future presidents. 
of, of what it means to be president and what you can do and what you can get away with. And this is another example of that. Yeah. And, and he, you know, is unique in that he's the first to be impeached twice. Mm -hmm. Not sure that's something I'd want to put on my resume. It's something I've been thinking about a lot, especially with going back and looking at this legacy that will certainly come up. But like my generation and generations around my generation is we're living through history for better or worse. And these are things that when, if I ever have kids and they go to school, the teachers are going to say, go home and ask your parents about when the Capitol was stormed and when the president was impeached twice, like things like that. And I don't know if I want to talk about that, you know, like it's, it's, it's interesting to think of these events, you know, you just see it on Twitter, you see it on the news and things like that, but it's documented history that is going to be in a book someday. Yeah. Yeah. And and we were there for it. And that's, it's scary. It really is. We were also there for the COVID-19 pandemic. We're still we're there. Still there. For it. You know, Trump's handling of COVID-19 will likely go down as one of the biggest disasters in U.S. history. By the time he left office, over 400,000 Americans have died. Trump admittedly downplayed the virus in an interview. He later ignored it completely as he struggled with the election. I mean, from the November election until the day he walked out of office, Trump ignored everything to do with the pandemic um, and ignored a lot of his responsibilities as, as president because I really think he just had a breakdown at that point. More U U.S. citizens have died of COVID than all U.S. soldiers killed in combat in every war since 1945. I saw that when I was looking over the notes. That is insane. Yeah. More, more are dead from COVID than from Vietnam. And Trump completely and repeatedly downplayed the virus. He contradicted top public health experts. He flouted recommendations from his science advisors uh, and his own White House coronavirus task force. Uh, he refused to accept responsibility for the pandemic, blaming it even up until his farewell speech on the 20th on China, calling it the China virus. He still won't accept responsibility for it. Yeah. I mean, at that point you might as, it's like, he's just got to commit, right? Like, right. Cause at that point, if you're going to admit that you had any fault, you, you, you admit the one thing you got to admit to it all. But I think, you know, every, and this is a discussion that's happened a bunch of times by now, but every president has like one or two really big crises in their administration. Right. Yeah. And this was definitely, one of his and his handling of it was poor <laughs> Yeah. At, regardless of how you fall in the political spectrum. You, you, it's hard to disagree with that, that his handling was terrible and lives were lost because of it. Well, and it's almost like had he done absolutely nothing, that would have been better than what he did because he contradicted medical professionals advice. He made fun of and mocked people who were taking advice from medical professionals to wear masks and social distance. He deliberately exposed his secret service detail when he himself contracted COVID so that he could have a publicity stunt driving around the block for the press. Then he returns to the white house still infected and makes a show out of taking his mask off and working in the white house with everybody else and exposing everyone else. Yeah. It's, um, and I don't know if we have it here, but also pulling out of the World Health Organization was really bad in the middle During of a, a pandemic. pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. It just, and I think we talked about that on another show as well. We're repeating ourselves, but like just the headline makes itself, right? Trump pulls out of World Health Organization in the middle of a pandemic. Like, why would you do that? Exactly. Exactly. Well, and he wasn't taking anyone's advice anyway, so it wouldn't have mattered if we stayed in there. So what's the next thing that, that we have? Because it sounds like we got a lot more bad than good here, but. Yeah, you this know, section is a little long it. in the tooth, but <laughs> I feel like we're we're I feel like we're doing our best here. Uh, so the next section is about the U.S. economy. Uh, Trump took credit for a robust economy that he inherited uh, when he took office and had shown nearly ten years of steady growth prior to his election. Uh, the U.S. now faces one of the worst economic crises crises in history, linked to his disastrous response to COVID nineteen, which we just talked about. Over twenty two million jobs were lost. Unemployment is at 7.9%, more than double the 3.4% of the pandemic. The national debt is at the highest level since World War II. 
uh, and the economic growth of the U.S. will average just above 0% for the first Trump term. Trump made a, a, quite a measure of success by citing the growth of the stock market throughout his, his presidency. And the funny thing is, is, if you look back over the last 10 years, if you look back over the last two administrations, the Bush and the uh, Obama administration, we had the recession that hit during President Bush's term. And then you had all the bailouts, you know, the controversy over corporations that were too big to fail and the government bailing them out and so forth. But then we went on a steady increase in the economy that grew at a pretty consistent pace year over year, despite what Trump did. Uh, you didn't see any spikes in growth under Trump that, that would mark something significant that he did. But what you did see was all the controversies that came out with Trump. The economy continued to grow. And it grew not because of Trump, but in spite of Trump. Because typically any other president who would have gotten tied up in some of the controversies that he did would have had a direct impact on the economy. And it was almost as though the economy and, and the world expected this sort of thing from Trump. So it, they sort of shook it off and it didn't affect the economy. But even then... What you had was the pandemic hit. Your unemployment soared. The country shut down for a period of time. And the country never fully recovered from that. Our unemployment today is more than twice what it was before the pandemic hit. So if there's a measure of success to look at here, it's what the recovery looked like after the, the crash. And after the last recession that we had, there was significant growth. We've yet to see that in this case here. So the economy, even though the Dow Jones and the stock market's up and that's all great, the economy itself, the jobs themselves that were promised, that Trump has touted over and over again, just haven't materialized. Yeah, and, and again, we go back to the, <clears throat> excuse me, we go back again to the incoming administration and how they're going to, you know, you still have all the negative impacts of the pandemic, which is still going on. And, and how they're going to deal with that and how they can come back from that. It's, it's, a, it's a complex thing that is not as easy as, oh, I was president for four years. Everything that happened in those four years is cut off from what was before me and what is after me. This is what I did. It doesn't work like that. Right. And especially when it comes to the economy, which is obviously one of those hot button issues that people love to talk about when they talk about who they're going to vote for or who is a successful president. Um but it's not as black and white as you know some people would like to think it is. Absolutely. So the last thing that we wanted to uh, kick Donald Trump for here <laughs> is damaging democracy. So Trump consistently eroded democratic norms during his tenure. Trump's constant attack on the media led UN experts to warn of raised risk of violence against journalists. He's threatened to deploy U.S. troops to American cities and demanded poll workers stop counting ballots to sway the election in his favor. Trump's constant dissemination of disinformation on the electoral process have led historians to draw parallels between him and Benito Mussolini. Trump has refused to accept the clear-cut results of the election and failed to provide any substantial proof to his claims for election fraud. The president is charged now with inciting insurrection at a rally and attempting to prevent a peaceful transfer of power. So now additional, even if we, since I wrote these notes up earlier in the week, additional information has come out that shows not only did Tr Donald Trump incite and encourage his supporters to storm the Capitol, he also has financial ties to several organizations that were part of that that shows he's financed those groups to do exactly that. I don't think democracy has ever been threatened like this since the civil war. What do you think? Yeah, no, I completely agree. And, and the difficult part is these are all facts, right? That we've just stated, but I can still guarantee you that there's somewhat half of the country that would disagree with this. And that's where 
the real damages, the the erosion of a common reality that we all have, right? Because, and I think that that is, and I, I mentioned it before, but I think that that's part of the tactic is to put so much information, false information out there and to do all these things that for any other president, any one of them would have got them out of office most likely or a terrible scandal, but to just keep doubling down and to keep, uh, you know, moving facts around, it has eroded just average people's way of thinking. And it's, it's, I've seen it in my own life personally, people I know that we can't even talk about it because we don't agree on the facts and what is real and what is not. And just because I have facts, it makes me, you know, I, I'm only saying that because I hate Trump, but it's not that that's not what is true. And I think that that is a thing that we're going to see in the coming years is this, this, uh, you know, difficulty of telling what is fact and fiction, even if Trump is no longer in office, I think that Mark, that stain is going to remain with the country for a while. Yeah, like, you know, you are you could have your own opinion. You're entitled to your own opinion, right. but you're not entitled to your own facts. The facts are the facts. And regardless of how much effort is put forth to disseminate misinformation, to skew those facts, the facts are still there. It's unfortunate that we have to go through the effort, almost like an archaeological dig, to get through all of the lies so we can get down to the facts themselves. And even then... The diehard supporters of someone like Trump still just simply refuse to accept the, the facts. Whether or not you choose to accept the truth doesn't make it any less true. And there are people out there that are having a very dif difficult time accepting that. Uh, one of the networks we stream on here, uh, we stream on uh, a network called Vaughn Live, and there's a lot of Trump supporters that, that, watch that particular service and there's been a couple of instances where people you know during our our replays there have directly questioned you know what are we talking about trump won the election in a landslide and it 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 makes me stop to wonder despite all of the information that's out there none of which points to a trump victory how could somebody possibly think that he won when not a shred of evidence has been produced, despite there being dozens of court cases that have been shot down by the Supreme Court, mind you, which has a majority of conservative justices that he put on the court, have shot down so many of these lawsuits that he's brought. How could people still think that he won just because that's what they want? Yeah. And I think... And it's something that I've noticed a lot too. There's a lack of accountability in that mindset where, especially when we had the insurrection at the Capitol, immediately people, the conspiracies from that side of the, of politics, uh, were trying to blaming on Antifa and things like that, where in reality, that's not the case. I don't think there was any evidence for that. It's just, it's a lack of accountability where it can't be me. It can't be my fault. And I think that's what you see a lot. And especially now. Trump has made himself out to be a martyr with, especially with the election results. And I think that that just feeds more into the cycle of a lack of accountability and, you know, Trump can do no wrong. And, you know, it was robbed, it was stolen from him, which none of that is true. Yeah. Yeah. I agree a hundred percent. Well, let's take another quick break. We'll come back and we'll, we'll have a kind of an open discussion about the lasting effects of Trump and what the future under Joe Biden is going to look like. <laughs> For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Thank you. 
Welcome back. We are talking about the legacy of Donald Trump. And and now we're going to talk about what the lasting effects of Donald Trump are on the world in general. And I'm going to throw a couple of these categories at you and I want to get your thoughts. So the first thing that I have here I'd like to hear about is what is the future of the judiciary and the Supreme Court thanks to Donald Trump? Well, like we've talked about, he had the three Supreme Court judges and what was it, 150? 250. Uh, other judges appointed. So that's definitely a lasting impact. Um, I think it's really going to come down to, which is what I said in, during that segment, was how these judges are going to come down on a lot of decisions. I mean, we saw um, they don't always just toe the party line like you'd expect with certain things that Trump was trying to get them to do. Um, we just talked about it. What, I forget what it was where they... they uh, well, for the election. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So something like that, you know, if the fear is that they would just follow his orders, that was proven to be false. So I think that that is that shows a somewhat of a hopeful thing where they are impartial, which is what you want from your judges. So hopefully we'll see that continue, uh, continued impartiality. The one thing that does concern me, though, is you have a man who appointed several hundred judges to lifetime appointments that will affect the judiciary moving forward. And this is the same man who was such a terrible judge of character appointing cabinet members that he had a revolving door on his cabinet and couldn't keep cabinet members. And he had positions where he had three and four replacements over the course of four years, which makes me wonder how competent and qualified is he to choose a justice that's there for life? Is that something that concerns you at all? Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a fair point. And, and hopefully, um, yeah, he has not been great at picking people, but based off their character. Uh, but hopefully out of those 250, we'll get like, you know, a third that are good at their jobs, like, you know, best, you know, for the hope. Um, but if not, then hopefully the system will do its job and, you know, the, they'll resign or we'll find replacements, hopefully. That's that's being very optimistic. Okay. <laughs> well, we're always so doom and gloom, you know, I <laughs> try to think positively. How about foreign affairs and our allies? What do you think the lasting effects are going to be on that? Well, I think initially it's it's probably going to be negative, but luckily we have the benefit of Joe Biden already having a working relationship with a lot of these people, most likely, because of his time as vice president. Um, so I think that that is going to help rebuild a lot of the ties that Trump might have severed or damaged or tried to sever. Um, and I think, yeah, having Joe Biden as the president might uh, – the rest of the world will see America sort of back on track, hopefully, as having a functional government, a more, not traditional, but a more um, professional government. And I think that that'll, that'll hopefully uh, be a good thing for, uh, you know, our allies. And I agree with you 100% on those points. About the economy and taxes, what do you think we can see long term for that? Uh, well, we talked about that, that corporate tax slash. Um, hopefully that is at least adjusted. I think that that's way too much of a slash for corporations. Um, I know you had mentioned that your company, things like that get benefits, but I think long, like big picture, I do think it negatively impacts the most amount of people. Um, for the economy, I think it's probably going to get worse before it gets better until we get coronavirus under control, which hopefully with the new administration, we will now that they're encouraging science and uh, vaccinations are rolling out and things like that. Hopefully, once the virus is stabilized, the economy will also in turn be. I think you're kind of you're on the mark there. It's really everything still centers around Corona. Yeah. What about immigration? Can we expect long term effects of his immigration policies? Um, I think that also kind of ties in with uh, foreign allies and and the world's perception of America. Uh, hopefully, Biden will be able to be a little bit more welcoming and to immigration. Now, I, I know people. Are some people are very against any kind of immigration, um, but I think that taking the stance that Donald Trump did of almost xenophobia, or not almost xenophobia, uh, is not the way to go about it. And I think even if Biden's going to come down strictly on it, I, I'm not sure he's going to be as uh, vocal about it. Sure, yeah. And what about you know? I specifically mentioned COVID here, but pandemics in general. Do you think? The next pandemic, hopefully, that won't be for at least another 100 years, do you think the country is going to respond differently than it did during Donald Trump's reign? I'd say most likely, um, especially because, you know, looking 100 years back with the Spanish flu, people have 
such a uh, you know, it's when you look in a history book and you see all the pictures in black and white. It's it's not as tangible. But with this in our modern age, <laughs> where you have you know social media and things that will most likely be able to be looked back on, I think it'll be a lot more real for people. And hopefully, if it's less than a hundred years, people like my age or younger um, will be alive still, and will say that you know this is not a joke. And hopefully, whatever administration is in power at that time will have learned from past mistakes and, you know, be able to have some sort of, um, pandemic like task force, you know, that's is designed for these things, especially as the world gets more and more globalized every day. Yeah. Here's the hope. And, and finally, what do you think the long-term impact on the presidency itself is going to be? I mean, we just had a president who challenged every norm and every, check that's been put in place on the power of the presidency. Do you think there's going to be a lasting effect on the presidency? Absolutely. And I think that Trump testing all of those limits is going to set a, like I said before, a dangerous precedent going forward. And I think that even the, you know, the Biden administration will probably take some liberties with that as well, with what a president can do with things like executive orders or uh, pardons and things like that. Um, Hopefully that, that extended power, will get reeled back, you know, checks and balances and all over time. But I think in the immediate future, it's, it's still going to be a little up in the air on, on how that, how the presidency is viewed. Okay. So the future, all right, let's, let's turn our attention to the future under Joe Biden. He's got four years. I don't think he's going to be up for, I don't think he's going to do for a second term. So he's got four years to accomplish what he wants. And the first thing really is to unify a nation that is more divided now than any other time in our history, save for the Civil War. Do you think Joe Biden has what it takes to unify the country, given the staunch support of 70 million people who voted for Donald Trump? Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> um, because it's it's just, you know, in his speech during the inauguration, he talked about it not being about parties, which I feel like every president says, but that doesn't work. It's not how that works. And I, like... In my experience, I don't think that that's possible. I just think that, and I don't know what it is, but I think people are much too focused on their political parties and, and that, that divides us so much. And I'm not really sure how you can fix that. I think the best way to go about fixing it would be, uh, in the government seeing, you know, handshakes from both parties agreeing on things. But if that's not going to change, then I don't see how that's going to change for the public either. I agree. Uh, handling of COVID. So there's been a number of things in the first couple of days of the Biden administration that he signed by executive order to address COVID. Do you feel more confident in Biden's ability to handle COVID than Trump's? Do you think we're going to get ahead of this? Do you, you know, where do you think we're going with this and are we going in the right direction? Now? Um, overall, I am more confident in Joe Biden. Um, my only fear is that so much damage has already been done. Um, by the Trump administration and, and how Biden is going to be able to like, if he wants to be effective, if he'd be able to be as effective as he can, given the the things that Trump has done, um, hopefully using those executive orders, like you said, um, he'll be able to reverse a lot of that and speed the process up and get vaccinations out um, and get the resources to people that need it. Um, again, a lot of hoping um, we'll see what actually happens. So foreign policy. So you, you had mentioned already that, that Joe Biden has an established working relationship with a lot of our allies. Um, over the four years that he was in office, Trump did a lot of damage to those through insults, through, you know, pulling out of treaties and, and military movements and various things. Do you think Joe Biden has it within him to rebuild those alliances in the short time that he's probably going to be in office? I think, yes, I do. And I, I think part of that comes be from, and it's one of the criticisms people might have of Joe Biden of being a career politician. But I think that when it comes to foreign policy and foreign affairs, being a career politician can be a good thing because, you know, you saw Trump, who's not an, as experienced of a political leader, how that worked out dealing with other um, world leaders. So I think having someone that was already vice president and has met all these people, but has also been in the quote unquote business for his entire life, I think that you pick up some skills along the way that make you a better diplomat, and hopefully that those skills are put to use. Very good point. So some of those executive orders that Joe Biden has signed in the, to law at this point dealt with undoing some of the things that Donald Trump did. 
Do you think that Biden should be focused on erasing the Trump legacy? Or do you think his efforts would be better focused elsewhere? Well, I think it's a, it's kind of a double-edged sword because erasing the Trump legacy will also benefit a lot of the American people, especially when it comes to things like the COVID-19 pandemic. Because part of Trump's legacy was hindering the process of getting people vaccinated and the resources, like I said, that they need. Um, so I think in, in those instances where erasing Trump's legacy would benefit the American people. I think that that is a good thing, but just turning it into a, you know, a contest of, you know, if I can erase this guy's name from the books of history, I don't think that's worth your time. So the last one that I wanted to talk about here is the chance of success. You know, you mentioned that Joe Biden is a career politician. He's been in the white house, you know, administration before as vice president, he's spent, you know, an eternity in, in the Senate and, and the legislative branch. Uh, so he comes to us with a wealth of experience, but he's also the oldest president to take office at this point in time at 78 years old. Do you think his age is going to contribute to his ability to be successful? And do you think he he'll have the support that he needs? Cause right now there's a small majority, but there is a majority of Democrats in the Senate and there's a majority of Democrats in the House. So the Democrats really hold the power right now, at least for the next two years. Will that help his success? Do you think he can be successful in his platform and what he wants to do for the next four years? Um, I've said it before, but I certainly hope so. Um, I do think his age is definitely going to be one of the main points of contention for people that criticize him. Um, I hope that in terms of his mental facilities, he seems like he's all there in his speeches and things like that. He speaks very eloquently, except for a few stutters occasionally, which, you know, people will harp on. But I think in terms of leading, I think he'll he'll do what he needs to do. And I think the people behind him will also be extremely helpful. Um, and, you know, the presidency is obviously a huge burden for someone to undertake. We've seen the before and after photos of, you know, when people come into office versus when they leave um, I think despite his age, I think he'll be able to, you know, fulfill his duties uh, to the best of his ability. And I would tend to agree with you largely because I think he's smart enough to turn his cabinet into an asset rather than a distraction. Mm -hmm. Much of the Trump presidency centered around controversy of cabinet members, cabinet turnover. Uh, he didn't trust his cabinet members. He didn't trust the people around him. Uh, he was more inclined to make unilateral decisions on his own rather than to trust the experts around him. And I think Joe Biden is smart enough, experienced enough, and wise enough to not fall into those same pitfalls. So I think the team that Joe Biden puts around him is really going to be what contributes to his success more than anything. So we'll take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll get any final thoughts that you have and finish up with the podcast business. Go for your final thoughts. Uh, so I think looking back at the Trump legacy, one of the biggest appeals he had when he went into office was people didn't want another career politician. They wanted something different. And they got that. And it overall, I don't think was a good thing. <laughs> uh, we looked, we've broken it down into various different topics, but I think overall, it had a negative impact on the country, right? And you ask yourself, that's a, I forget what president did this, but are you better off four years? Uh, well, hang on, I'm messing this up. <laughs> are you better off now than you were four years ago? And I think most people would say no, uh, whether it's for economic reasons or the impact the coronavirus had on them. And obviously you can't blame all these things just on Trump. However, he was the president and he's supposed to be the leader. And I think it's hard to disagree that he failed as a leader. And, uh, Hopefully, you know, there's obviously detriments to having a career politician in power, but I think now that is what the country most likely needs. Yeah, I think this was a case of we got what we asked for and what we asked for was not what we needed. It was a learning experience, I think. The country will continue to feel the effects of for years to come, but I think it's, it's a learning experience that we won't make that same mistake again. Um, that was all we had for today. Uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate you coming to talk uh, about this uh, volatile subject. 
Before we go, I do want to throw the plugs out there. You can get the audio version uh, of this podcast listed as Insights into Tomorrow. Video versions of all of our podcasts can be found if you look for Insights into Things. We are listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon, Pandora, and something else that I can't remember. <laughs> I, I really need to write all these down. Tune in? Remember. Tune in, sure. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, we'll tune in. That. Sorry about that. Uh, we would also invite you to reach out to us and give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We are on Twitter at insights underscore things. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, you can find us at insights into things where you can get links to all that and everything else on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Anything else? That is it. All right. Another one in the books. Bye. into teens a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth talking to real teens about real teen problems explore issues from braces to puberty social anxiety to financial responsibility each week we talk about the topics concerning today's youth we look at how the issues affect teens how to cope with these issues and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 111, Challenges of High School. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my compassionate and understanding co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. How about you? Doing okay. Another hot one today. Um, I guess weather's really starting to get crazy now. We were at what, 90 on the weekend, then we went to 60, now we're at 90 again, we're supposed to go to 60 tomorrow, this is just crazy weather. Yep. So how was your week so far? It's <clears> been <throat> alright, I've had a few quizzes so far, Um, nothing too crazy going on. Yeah, you're getting quizzes and tests like crazy, we're we coming up on the end of the marking period maybe? Yeah, that's probably it. Yeah, that's a good time for it. But that's not what we're talking about. Today, we're talking about the challenges of high school. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about the challenges our teens face when transitioning to high school. We'll take a look at some of the differences between middle school and high school. We'll talk about the higher expectations placed on our kids academically, socially, and personally. We'll look at a few specific areas to be aware of, including time management and study skills, self-advocacy, and the all-important school life balance. Finally, 
we'll discuss some suggestions on how to make the transition and their time in high school a success. Before we do that, though, I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of this podcast looking up Insights into Teens, or you can get video versions of the podcast and all podcasts on our network uh, listed as Insights into Things. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon, pretty much any place you can get a podcast these days. I would also invite folks to reach out to us, give us your feedback. We're always looking for uh, suggestions for show topics and feedback on how we're doing, what you want us to talk about, what you don't want us to talk about. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We are on Twitter at insights underscore things. On Facebook, we're at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, you can get us at www.instagram.com slash insights into things. Or you can get links to all those and direct email connections to us on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Are we ready to get started? I think we are. All right. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the new challenges that kids face in high school. And the research for this segment came from understood.org, a new site we haven't used in the past. They talk about high school and how high school places more emphasis on getting good grades and requires more homework than ever before. High schoolers need to manage their time well, stay organized, and take good notes. And in high school, self-advocacy becomes more important than ever for kids with learning and thinking differences, but for kids in general, self-advocacy is important. The transition from middle school to high school can be a stressful time for all teens. Academic expectations increase, and socializing and extracurricular activities become more important, especially if your child is heading to college. Some of these expectations can create unique obstacles for kids with learning and thinking differences, which we're very fortunate that uh, you don't fall into that category, but there are a lot of kids out there that, that do, so they might find some of this information helpful. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk about what some of the uh, issues with bigger school and age differences are. Why don't, you, why don't you start us off with that? So one challenge for high schoolers is adjusting to a new learning environment. The school itself is likely to be larger and have more students than middle school did. While your child may have had practice with switching classrooms between classes and middle school, navigating an even larger school can be tough. She won't only have to keep track of time and know the best path between classes, but she may have to plan a trip to get materials from her locker, too. And high schools can often use schedules that vary from day to day. So you've been exposed to a certain extent to the layout of the high school that you're going into, correct? Mm -hmm. Is it significantly larger than your middle school? How, how, is it, how does it differ from layout and size? I'd say it is extremely larger than my middle school. Its top floor is much larger. It has an auditorium that's larger than our lunchroom and gym room combined. They have two gym rooms. It's madness, to be honest. It's madness. <laughs> I have to be honest with that. So uh, do you feel any sense of anxiety trying to contemplate how you're going to navigate that environment? Yeah, definitely. Um, when we were doing the one tour, like I was surprised at how large the school was, and we only went through part of it. Honestly, I'm very terrified for switching the classes because in middle school, yes, the school was kind of big, but it's way smaller. It's way smaller than the middle school. And well, if I remember correctly, when you first went into middle school, you had a lot of anxiety about switching classes because you were afraid you'd get to your classes late. And after the first couple of days or a week or so, I think you, you kind of got the gist of it and you had it down to a system. Mm -hmm. um, do you fear that you're going to go through all that again in high school or do you think you'll be able to work it out? I probably 
I, I do fear that I'm going to go through that in high school because it's a much larger school and I don't know how much time I have to get to my classes. I'm guessing around two minutes, which isn't a lot of time when you're navigating a giant school. Well, and I'm sure that they'll arrange your classes in such a way that you won't have too much of a problem getting back and forth to, to your different classes. I hope so. The next thing they talk about is there's often a shift in your class makeup. So in middle school, your child had, a diff had different teachers for different subjects. But for the most part, she probably was in the same classes as other students in the same grade. In high school, her classes are more likely to have students from a variety of grade levels. And you'll probably see that more often as you progress through high school than at the lower, lower grades. Hmm. Uh, these age differences can be tricky for kids who struggle with school sk uh, social skills or who are less mature than their peers. Now, the one advantage you have right now uh, because you're joining marching band is you're getting some exposure to the students that are at the high school and, and are upperclassmen now. Do you have any particular anxiety about associating with upperclassmen if they wind up in some of your classes? Yeah, probably. Um, I'm that type of person who likes being the big fish in a little pond and doesn't really enjoy being a little fish in a big pond. Basically, I prefer being around younger people than people who are older than me. Like, if they're older than me to a point where I think they're an adult, then that's fine. But if they're older than me, yet they're still around the same age, I have diff like I get intimidated by them. Now, have you had situations where you've interacted with upperclassmen now through marching band that are that might be helping you get through those types of situations? I mean, a little bit. Um, um, the first two instances, the first two times I went into marching band practice, I was with some of the one. I was with some of them, and I've mainly been interacting with the uh, upperclassmen who play trumpets. Um, but um, actually, this yesterday when we had done um, the practice, they had actually separated all the new people from the people who were who were returning because one of the reasons was because the returning people were doing had to prepare for a parade. Right. Um, but it was also so that because we were pretty intimidated, but a lot of us were intimidated by the older kids. So we kind of, you know, just so say so they put us apart so that we would at least feel more comfortable doing the visuals. Right. And chances are your first year in high school, you're probably not going to have too many classes with people outside of your age group. It'll probably be Fairly straightforward. You might have a couple, especially extracurricular stuff like the band and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think you'll have a chance to get acclimated to the, uh, the differences in the class makeup. What's the, what's the last point that we have? So your child may be exposed to risky behaviors in a way she wasn't before and feel pressured to fit in. This can be especially difficult for kids with ADHD. And it can be hard to get used to... For and it can be hard to get used to for kids who have trouble following social cues or self-advocating. So, do you understand what they mean by self-advocating? Not really. So, when they talk about self-advocating, they basically mean speaking up for yourself. Okay. Um, there's different ways that you can do that. There are socially acceptable ways to do it. I think you're aware of some of the kids that self-advocate in a way that make them kind of annoying. You know, those kids that are attention hogs that always need to be the center of attention. Mm -hmm. Then you have those other kids who are the quiet ones and they don't speak up. They don't might not raise their hand. They might be shy. They might not be comfortable interacting in the classroom. Those are the ones that need to self-advocate more. And this is something where the high school is getting you prepared for moving on to college. And we've talked about this offline, you and I. High school itself is, is a dress rehearsal for college for the most part. Whether or not that's fair to the students or not is, is up for debate. Because not all the kids that are going to go to your high school are going to wind up going to college. 
And a lot of the coaching and the social norms that they try to instill are really there to, to get you prepared for college. So emphasizing self-advocacy will help you when you go to college because when you go to college, you're not going to have the same kind of one-on-one -on -one interaction with your teachers or your professors in college that you have in high school. A lot of times the, the teachers are basically there to lecture, hand out assignments, and grade the assignments that you hand back in. The idea is in college, you're learning to be a fully functional adult in the real world where you don't have somebody holding your hand or wiping your nose all the time for you and you have to learn to stand on your own. A lot of times high school is trying to do that for you. They're, they're trying to, to get you to the point where if you have a question, you're going to ask the question. You're not going to wait for the guy next to you to raise his hand and ask the question to get the answer. If you don't understand something, you need to speak up for yourself. If you're not, if you can't hear well where you're at, you need to speak up. It's basically you looking out for yourself and you doing what you need to do to, to provide for your education when you're in high school. That's what we talk about with self-advocacy. So they're talking about risky behaviors here in the sense of peer pressure. So if all of your friends are uh, smoking and you want to fit in and they're going to make you feel as though you need to take a cigarette and, and light it up and smoke too or you're not going to fit in. That's the kind of risky behavior they're talking about. Yeah, I was kind of figuring that. Right. You know, it's the stuff that mob mentality type stuff where if you have to go along with everybody in the group – you know, think about what you're doing and, and make the right choices. You you don't want to do something for the sake of fitting in that you know is wrong. So that's that's one of the things that they caution you here to look out for. Um, I think that was all we had for our introductory segment here. I think we kind of have a firm grasp on what we're looking at. Let's take a quick break and we'll come back and we're going to talk about time management and study skills when we come back. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, Guild Lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights in the Teens. Today we're talking about the challenges of going into high school. One of the biggest challenges, and we've talked about this numerous times, is time management and study skills. Staying organized enough to get everything done can also be a struggle in high school. Various learning and thinking differences can cause trouble with time management. In-class work can be hard for teens who struggle with taking notes. They may not be sure what they need to write down, or they may struggle to keep up with what the teacher is saying. Specific note-taking strategies can help, along with note-taking apps. Now, I, you know, I take notes constantly at work on conference calls and in meetings and and stuff like that. And I use OneNote. There's Evernote. There's various other note-taking applications. One of the other techniques <clears throat> that you'll find used more in in college, I think, than high school, is recording the uh, lectures that your teachers give. Uh, and you can get <clears throat> a fairly inexpensive digital recorder these days 
that will allow you to record, you know, the, the conversation that happens in the room there. You just probably want to make sure that the teacher is okay with that before you do it. Uh, what that will allow you to do is, is afterwards you can go back and replay certain parts of that to make sure that you did get everything that you needed there and go back and take notes and reinforce your notes based off of the recordings that you take. I used to do that uh, all the time. I do that in meetings now so I can go back and and uh, look at where my notes are. Uh, one of the advantages or one of the features in uh, OneNote is if you record the audio while you're um, taking notes, it will actually annotate the notes as you play through the audio so you can see where you were at the time. So it's very good to keep track of your thoughts that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, with with more work and tests, your child also needs to have strong study skills. She may have assignments in different classes with the same deadline. It may be helpful to learn strategies to study for tests and try studying in ways that complement her learning strengths. So that's one of the things we're probably going to have to do is change the way that, that you study. Uh, right now, when you have tests or quizzes coming up, you and I tend to, to go over the stuff and study it. And I try to challenge you in ways I don't I don't just read down the study material. I ask you questions in different manners. Instead of giving you the question, I'll give you the answer and you give me the question. These are all different study techniques that help you remember things better. If I can ask you the question and get the answer, then I should be able to give you the answer and get the question the same way. And after a couple of iterations, it works and it sticks in your mind that way. So We'll probably have to explore some of those different study techniques as, as we go through high school. Okay. What else do we have? Next up is self-advocacy. In high school, self-advocacy is a big focus for kids with learning and thinking differences, and not just with peers. As the, expe as the expectation to be an independent learner grows, your child will need to start pl playing a bigger role in her education. Asking questions, seeking help, and speaking up about her needs become increasingly important. She may be expected to understand and discuss her learning differences and start asking for the ac accommodation she needs, but that can feel overwhelming for some kids. It's important to find ways to self-advocate and let her feel comfortable. And what they're kind of referring to here is that if you do have certain learning needs that aren't being met. The The first one that comes to mind for me, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a learning disability, it could just be you might be sitting someplace where you can't hear the teacher talk. So you might need to have your seat move. You may not be able to see uh, the presentation or the whiteboard. You may need to move for that. So that's some of the things that, that everyday students can encounter. But there are students out there that need a little extra help. You could be dyslexic. Uh, I have a friend of mine whose son is dyslexic, and there's special learning techniques for the kids who are dyslexic. And, and when they look at letters, the letters themselves get jumbled. So there's different learning techniques they have. There's different tools that they have to help out uh, kids that are in that situation. We already mentioned uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. There's different learning techniques for that as well. You know, a lot of times ADHD is treated me uh, medically, but there are methodologies that teachers are aware of today that will help kids who suffer from ADHD to learn better without having to resort to, or in addition, maybe in addition to, you know, medical uh, treatment for it. So the self-advocacy is, is basically you making sure that, that you have the tools that you need and mommy and daddy can't help you with that because we're not in the classroom. We don't see these issues that you're running into. And a lot of times kids tend to think it's them. You know, oh, I don't understand what the teacher's saying. I'm dumb. Well, it's not that. Maybe it's not being explained in a way that you understand. A lot of times you'll find if you don't understand it, other kids don't understand it. And I think you've encountered that to a certain extent uh, this year with the remote learning where, you know, you've had situations where you were given an assignment, the teacher explained it, but you didn't understand it. And it turned out other kids. Why don't you give us an example of that? Um, 
Hmm. I think one happened in your math class at one point, didn't it? Yeah, I think so. Um, hmm. I can't think of a specific. Hmm. Hang on. Because I remember there was there was one instance where you came to me worried that you didn't understand, and there was a quiz coming up, and the teacher had a special session after that. Do you remember that one? Oh yeah, I remember. It was like. I remember that I was having difficulty um, with, like, I think, I don't know if it was, like, the, I think it was the test review because I'd kind of done poorly on it, and, like, I was, like, so scared, and I was so upset, and, like, I was, I just realized I did so bad, and, like, I had asked her if I could, like, if there was a way that I could, like, do, have, like, a stunt, a better study session and apparently so many other kids did poorly that she ended up having an entire day where we had a conference going over everything right and that's one of those situations where had you not spoken up or a couple other kids not spoken up everyone would have suffered from it so from a self-advocacy standpoint when there's a situation where you don't feel you're getting the instruction that you need or the way that you need it you speaking up not only helps you, but it has the potential for helping other students that are in the same boat who might not feel comfortable speaking up. So self-advocacy is very important. It's also very hard to say, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the next thing they talk about is the school life balance. After school activities or a job can make staying on top of things even more complicated. Both are great ways to make friends. They're also a great way for your child to explore her interests and find things she loves to do. But because they take, take up time, jobs and activities can make it hard to get everything else done. For some kids, it's also a reason for avoiding doing schoolwork that's challenging. If it seems like too much for her, she may want to volunteer instead. And I think by saying that, they're, they're saying that the expectations on you as a volunteer are much less than if it's a club you signed up for or a job that you actually take. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure she's ready for a job, you can begin by working on job readiness skills at home. So this is one of those things, and, and I can kind of speak from experience that when I was in high school, for several years in high school, I was working a job. I wasn't working full time, obviously. But I would work a retail job. I would start at, you know, 3 o'clock or whatever time I got done school. I got home. I got changed, went to work, and I would work until 9. And I would do that a few days a week. And it was a great way to learn because I was working in uh, a, an industry or in a field that I wanted to work in with electronics and computers. It was a good way to make money. I met a lot of people. It was fun. I enjoyed the work. But it put a lot of demands on me. I didn't do a lot of extracurricular stuff uh, from that point. I had already hurt my ankle, so I couldn't play football anymore. So that was kind of out the window. But academically, there were some challenges that I had to deal with. And I had to adjust my study schedules. Because if you're working from the time you leave school until 9 o'clock when it's almost time to go to bed, there's not a lot of time to study or do homework. Some of it was... Uh, working a uh, study hall into my my school schedule. So I wound up having a second period uh, study hall there so I could get assignments done during that or I could study for tests for that. Um, but there's different things, different compromises that you have to make in order to make that balance work. The idea of you know being in school and only doing academic stuff is really not what anyone's searching for. Oh, you're in marching band. So that's something that's going to take some time. What what kind of demands on your schedule do you think marching band is going to have? Well, on I think that until November on on Tuesdays at six to eight thirty, I'm PM, I'm doing marching band practice and more than likely I'm also going to have um, competitions that I'm going to and there's probably going to be a bunch of other stuff that I haven't encountered just yet so now your competitions are they during the week or are they on the weekend I think 
I believe they're supposed to be on the weekends. I don't really know too much. Um, okay, so that's one extracurricular activity that you're doing. Was there anything else that you were looking at uh, so far or just that? Um, I was also planning on doing concert band, hopefully. Um, so, and that's probably, I think, last all year. So, um, I'll probably do that. Well, well, because marching band only lasts until November. <clears throat> um, but I think concert band lasts all year. Now, is con does concert band have after school activities? I'm not entirely sure. I still have very little information. Okay, so you'll probably have at least two concerts that are after school. They may come with rehearsals. Uh, I know when I was in high school, I was in choir, and we did uh, after school rehearsals a few times. Uh, so that's that's certainly a potential. And there may be other clubs that you decide you want to get involved with. It's just a matter of making sure we we balance everything out and know what's a, what the priorities are, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're going to take another quick break. We'll come back and we're going to talk about ways to help your high schooler. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today we're talking about the challenges of high school. And, um... Now we're going to be talking about ways to help your high schooler. It may take some time for your child to get used to high school. It may also take some time for you to get used to having a child in high school. These, um, the staff may not try to get to know parents as much as you'd like or, or are used to. There are many different rules than there were at your child's middle school. And policies around tardiness, electronics, Electronics use and absences may be adhered to more strictly. That's why it's important to know how to contact your child's teachers. Download and fill out a contact sheet and see an example of an, of an effective email to a teacher. Um, explore conversation starters to use with teachers and find ways to talk to teachers about specific learning and thinking differences. High school can be an exciting but challenging time. By staying in the loop with your child and her teachers, you can help her overcome challenges and find success. Yeah, this this kind of points out a, another interesting aspect that we haven't talked about yet, and that's how does high school change for the parents? So high school is going to change because you're your teachers aren't as hands-on as they are now in, in middle school and the lower grades. Um, you know, I mean, we still keep in touch with uh, some of your teachers. And Mommy, fortunately, was was friends with one of them, but uh, there's one particular teacher that you talked to not that long ago from your grade school time. You're not going to get that kind of treatment probably in high school. And that's simply because of the volume of students that the teachers have to work with. Mm -hmm. Not only are the teachers trying to get you prepared for college, they deal with a lot of, lot of students, a lot more than, than most of your other teachers do. So for us to have direct contact with your teacher as your parents, we need to be a little bit more prepared for that. We need to understand that we're not going to be getting progress reports or, or personalized reports on you as often as we might now. Typically, we only get them if there's something wrong, which there usually never is. 
But even parents have to get used to this. You know, we're going to have to get used to your change in schedule, your change in your study habits. Maybe we need to have dinner a little bit later so that you can get homework done when you get home from school now. Uh, maybe we need to switch days that we do things on the weekends because you have projects that are that have to be done or you have extracurricular activity. So I assume being in marching band, you're probably going to be preoccupied a portion of the weekend at the football games where the marching band performs. Certainly you're going to be going to competitions, like you said. Is there anything else that you can think of that might impact mommy and daddy? Um, Probably the fact that you'll see me grow up in the next few years. That's certainly something to be aware of, yeah. Yeah, um, like being, like even being in my first few years of being a teenager, like a lot of times kids are kind of drifting away from their parents at that time, but, well, because of the pandemic and I guess just because of my um, connection to you guys, I really haven't started doing that. Um, but going into high school, that might be something that could end up happening, and I might not even know it. Sure, and even if you look at it from a, a socializing standpoint, you're going to spend more time with your friends as you get further along in high school. You're going to hang out with your friends. You're going to uh, go to the mall with your friends, for instance. You may go to the movies with your friends. There's more opportunities for you to be out of the house between your schedule with the high school, your extracurricular activities, and all the new friends that you're going to be meeting. Because, you know, you have a few friends that you have now. You have that core set of friends that you've grown up with now. But the one thing that you're going to find in high school is you're going to be introduced to a whole new slew of people, both older and younger than you as you go through high school, that you're going to wind up socializing with. So that's something that, you know, that empty nest syndrome that parents have to sort of get used to. Um, so parents have to definitely be, be on top of contact information for your teacher moving forward with that. Is there anything else that you think that parents need to be aware of as their kids transition into high school? Um, besides contacting teachers, uh, I guess trying to help you, um, I guess maybe helping your student meet their needs, but that would technically be also messaging the teacher. Sure. That's valid. Um, how about something like, um, costs? Is there any additional costs that parents need to be aware of? Um, maybe with certain things, there could be an additional cost. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know the specifics right now for certain things. Um, I think from a fashion standpoint, the, the cost of clothing will go up. Your cost of your school materials may go up. Uh, kids are nowadays, kids are more technology centric than they ever were before. So schools don't provide all of that stuff. So that's something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important for parents to be open minded about new friends that you might be meeting. Um, I would assume that you're probably going to be exposed to a more diverse group of students than you have in the past. Uh, the demands on your time from friends will go up. So parents need to sort of be aware of that and that the time that they spent with their kids might start to evaporate. Any other warning signs that uh, mommy and daddy should be aware of? Um, hmm. I guess maybe, um, hmm. I mean, yeah, the demand of friends will go up. The demand of time centered on work will probably go up. Um, How about privacy? Do you think you're going to need more privacy as you age into the higher grades? I would think that there would be instances where I'd probably want a bit more privacy um, and not want you guys to be on top of me. Um, but you're not really on top of me right now, for the most part. 
How about independence? Do you think you'll need to exert your independence a bit more? Probably, yeah. Especially, like, starting to get to the point where I'm about the age of an adult where I can actually do things that most adults do and that I won't legally be considered a child. So, yeah, probably independence will more than likely um, go up, especially since they're preparing you for college. And college, you kind of have to have the independence and do independent work a lot, so. Absolutely. So these are all things that, that really parents need to be aware of and keep in the back of their mind because it, your, your child going into high school isn't just a change for your child. It's a change for everyone, the whole family uh, gets to deal with high school years. Yep. Uh, so just some quick key takeaways um, before we go. Encourage your teen to have good study habits and help her keep track of when assignments are due. Kids in high school need to stay motivated, which, by the way, we'll be talking about in next week's podcast. Spoiler. Um, they need to get their work done on time, even if they're involved in extracurricular activities. Uh, learning how to speak up for themselves can build confidence and keep kids from feeling overwhelmed. How do you? How would you rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best? How would you rate your ability to speak up for yourself in school right now? 6.8. That's actually not bad. I, I was surprised to, to hear that you're rating it that high. I mean, I'm mainly doing that from the experience of being virtual because I was able. I it I feel as though it's much easier to ask questions when I'm virtual, but there are still certain instances where I'm like, mm, right. should I? Um, but when I was in school, I did have difficulty asking for help. Um, I would rarely raise my hand to answer questions because I'm like, what if I'm wrong? I'm more than likely wrong. Especially in math class, because there's always one to find answer. And, <laughs> like, in ELA, it was a little easier because there was no specific answer. In math, it really wasn't because there is a specific answer. So, I'd say I'm not horrible at asking questions. I can definitely ask questions, so I'm more than halfway. But I'm definitely not, like, I definitely don't ask um, every, I definitely can't ask all the questions that I have. So let me ask you this before we wrap things up. What are the three biggest fears that you have right now going into high school? Uh, the workload's probably one of the biggest ones. Um, pretty sure that's kind of an obvious one. Um, high school has actually, uh, middle school has actually been a lot easier than really anticipated and i mean this year has been pretty easy because it's all virtual like i've been all virtual um so that's been probably the easiest so going from a pretty easy year to high school high school freshman year is going to be scary um i'm gonna i feel very intimidated as well um intimidated by the size of the school and the fact that i'm around older kids like i said I don't like being a little fish in a big pond. I prefer being a big fish in a little pond. Um, I don't know. I just feel intimidated by people who are slightly older than me. Um, when I, if they're older than me to the point where I consider them adults, then it's fine. But people who are a couple years older than me, I get intimidated by them, especially going to school with them. Um, and the third fear I have. I guess having to manage both my social and my and my academics. Okay, and I think they are typical, well grounded fears to have going in. And I think most of those can be overcome in the first couple of weeks of high school. I hope so. So I'm sure you'll do fine. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll get your closing thoughts. Alrighty. Go for your closing remarks. So to everyone out there who is go who is more than likely going into high school, because I don't know if this would really apply to anyone else, um, 
I would say um, try to use the tips um, we mentioned in this video. I'll more than likely try to apply these to my life when I go into high school. And um, hopefully when I do go into high school, by the time I'm in high school and the first few weeks have passed, I'll be fine and we can make a video hopefully confirming that things are good um, because right now I'm actually pretty terrified. And I guess that's kind of normal for anyone going into high school. So for now, at least try these tips and hopefully when I do go into high school and we make a podcast on that, I'll be a lot more confident and be able to say that it's not as bad as it thinks. As it is, uh, you think. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, sage advice, as always. It's a it's a great unknown you're going into here, but like everything else you've dealt with, I'm sure you'll handle it fine. Before we do go, I would once again encourage folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of the podcast listed as Insights into Things. Video versions are lit. Um, no, sorry. Audio versions are listed as Insights into Teens. Video versions are listed on their insights into things on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and pretty much any place you can get a podcast. I will also encourage folks to contact us. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. High res versions of our videos are available on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. We do stream five days a week on Twitch. You can get us on twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, you do get a free monthly Twitch Prime subscription. We'd appreciate it if you threw it our way. Audio versions of the podcast can be found at podcast.insightsintoteens.com. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insightsintothings.com. Or you can get links to all those and more on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. And you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights into Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother Sam. Well done. I think that's it. Another one in the books. Uh, b- 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 uh, bye, we can everybody. wave anywhere at this bye, point. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs> into entertainment a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom we'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week we'll talk about theme park and pop culture news We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 111, Backstories, Buyouts, and Cancellations. 
I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my considerate and thoughtful co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, sweetheart? I am fabulous, and you? I am equally fabulous. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear it. So, how was your week this week? Long. Yes. And it's not over yet. Not over. We still got one more day. But hey, long weekend, right? Kind of, sort of, yeah, kinda for some. For some of us, yeah. For some of us. You don't have to put a full day in on Monday, though, right? Yeah, here's to hoping. There you go. Hope in one hand and, well, that's not for this podcast. <laughs> no, <laughs> that is not. That's not what we're talking about today. Today we're talking about What are we talking about today? We're talking entertainment. We always da, talk da, entertainment. Da, 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 da. Right. So today in our Disney Detective are more virtual queues coming to Disney parks. And get your wallets ready for another Disney auction. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, goodbye, Rangers. We hardly knew you. <laughs> and is Disney finally going to fix the Snoke problem? Nice. Then in our entertainment news, is Amazon taking over the world? They're trying to. Disney might have something to say about that. <laughs> they might. And we'll talk about the passing of a Disney legend. And then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. And we do have an afterthought this week from an event we attended on Saturday? Sunday. Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Uh, and then we'll talk about what we're doing this weekend, too, for those who might have tickets in the area or can get something like that. Sure. But anyway, are you ready to get started? Sure, let's do this. Well, before we get started, I do want to invite folks to subscribe to the podcast you can get video versions of all the network's podcasts listed as Insights into Things. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment. We are available on Google, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, any place you can get a podcast these days. Uh, I would also encourage folks to contact us, give us your feedback, tell us what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. On Twitter, we are at insights underscore things. On Facebook, we are at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we are at insights into things. We can get links to all those on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Ready? Sure. I love the enthusiasm. Here we go. <laughs> Go for Disney Detective. So it seems that there is a new Disney patent uh, that was just registered not that long ago. Um, and the patent is kind of a glimpse into how the company may be addressing what it sees as operational issues. So the patent application was published in May of 2021, and it addresses something theme park visitors dread, waiting in a standby queue. So what they're calling the dynamic management of virtual queues provides a possible solution. Um, obviously, one of the drawback of requiring guests to wait in a queue is the physiological and psychological toll that it actually takes on, you know, a prolonged wait time Um for most guests, as common experiences will testify, waiting in a line that is, you know, at best tedious and depending on the length of the wait and the environmental conditions might also be physically uncomfortable. Um, obviously, you know, other drawbacks of guests waiting in a queue for so long is that it keeps them from enjoying other attractions uh, that are, you know, possibly in the same venue or near the, the same area that they're in, and also potential revenue that uh, the park isn't making from those guests that are waiting, you know, in this very, very long line. So when you <laughs> read through this article, there are all these diagrams and flow charts and and everything, basically trying to explain what um, each of the patents kind of how they would work. Uh, in some cases, they're very similar to um, the FastPass 
program that they already have where you can only make, you know, so many fast passes within a certain amount of time. And once it expires, then you can make, you know, other arrangements. Um, the other talks about uh, being able to kind of pre-validate you so that it would have information about, you know, the age of your children. So if it's a ride that you have to be a certain height for, it might not let you get on the queue uh, for that. Um, so there's all these different variations of it that they that they have that they're proposing. Um, so one would be where, okay, you, you go to get on a line and the wait time is, say, 45 minutes. So it puts you in a queue where you, you're not physically waiting on that line for the 45 minutes. It'll notify you like 10 minutes beforehand that you have to start coming back. And then you could go off and do something else within that area. And then the way that the system from, you know, what I was reading about it, if you go and try and do something else, it knows that you already have a wait time within the next 45 minutes. So that might give you a wait time for an hour and a half, taking into account, oh, it's going to, you know, take you, you know, f you have 45 minutes to, to do the other ride and then your travel time or, or what else. So it, 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 again, it sounds like it's a little bit more advanced than the fast pass system, which as far as I know, they're not utilizing right now, uh, but they're probably going to be starting it back up because they're opening up capacity in the different parks. Um, now, the only thing as of right now that they're using the virtual queue for is rise of the resistance, but with that, when it first started, you had to physically be in the park by a certain time to try and get the queue. Then they kind of opened it up and you didn't have to necessarily be in the park, but you had to already have your reservation for that day to get it. But then they were doing like multiple um, releases of tickets. So they were doing like a 7 a.m. They were doing like a 10 a.m. and like a 2 p.m., you know, so that if you didn't necessarily get the first batch, you had a second. So this doesn't talk about, like, the time of anything, but it does mention, you know, you would need to have some sort of smartphone uh, device to be able to access it. Um, and again, it, it's kind of like a, a melding of the current FastPass system and the virtual queue that they already use. But in some cases, it also kind of reminded me of if you remember when we went to Disneyland and you had the scooter and we went to go to the Haunted Mansion and they didn't have, you know, a handicap entrance, they gave you a, a handy or um, I don't remember what they called it, a guest with disabilities pass or something. And they gave us a specific time to come back. So it, it kind of sounds like that where it would be on a bigger scale. It wouldn't just be for certain guests. It would be for every guest. This way, they don't have all these people waiting online. You could go and do other things to, you know, be able to do more during right. your day. Well, I have to say, as someone who goes to Disney probably more than is healthy, <laughs> and what somebody to say? who hates waiting... Mm -hmm. It's about freaking time they decided to throw some technology at this. Mm -hmm. uh, what they did for Rise of the Resistance worked out exceedingly well, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. Even though you had to be in the park at the time to do it. But they've been throwing technology at ride queues for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. And the whole purpose was to keep you occupied in right. the queue. So they so in typical Disney fashion, they turned waiting in line into an attraction. Right. And to me, you're still waiting in line. Right. I don't care if there's stuff that I can push and, and screens that entertain me and whatever. Right. I don't want to have to wait in line if I don't mm -hmm. have to. So the concept of this, where we had found out quite some time ago that they were tracking where you were going with your fast, your uh, your magic, magic bands. Magic bands. Because they were using it for, for photos on rides and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So experimenting with that technology early on to track users in the park. 
seems to this seems to be the next logical mm-hmm. step to that where they can manage queues now. Mm-hmm. So instead of making the queues longer and giving you buttons to push to keep you occupied, let's reduce the size of queues. Mm-hmm. Let's give you the ability to schedule yourself around these queues and let's throw technology at it. Mm-hmm. Let's finally use technology to manage the queues, mm-hmm. not manage the the right. guests. Right. Um, and I think this is a brilliant idea. I hope they roll this out. I can't imagine they're going to roll it out on all rides. Right. I could definitely see them opening it up on the e-ticket your rides. Your e-ticket rides. Yeah. You know, your your big... Your premier rides. Your premier rides. And then you have your lower levels where you have to wait. Okay, so if I'm waiting 10, 15 minutes on a, a smaller ride, at least I can go do that knowing and that my the place... Thing. The advantage that you right. have with that is now that you can reserve a place in line through the virtual queues, mm-hmm. it will likely lessen the queues at the secondary rides right. as well because mm-hmm. now you're scheduling yourself around them. Right. So now those secondary queues become your line. Mm-hmm. Those, those secondary rides become your queue. Right. You know, that's where you're being entertained is in these other ones until it's your turn to get on. Right. And I could see them also, you know, once things kind of start opening back up. Offering more shows, offering yep. more magical things to do to fill your time, you know, uh, while you're waiting for, oh, we got 10 more minutes. What do we want to do? Oh, let's just, let's go get an ice cream or let's go get And I can see them giving you, putting the stage shows on in in a manner, you know, on based on locations and times. Mm-hmm tied to those cues. Right. So it allows them to be more organized in how they're having their talent out there in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think this is a great idea. I, I, I commend them for it. I mm-hmm. hope to see how it works in practice and, and I think it's going to work out very yeah. well. Yeah. I think you're going to find a lot more satisfied guests in your parks now because of this. Oh, absolutely. So what else do we have? So this was a story that had popped up uh, from the ocregister.com, uh, and it seems that there is a Disney collection that is going to be auctioned as the collector is selling his home and moving to the beach. So Disney collector Scott Rummel sold his four-bedroom home in California that he and his wife Terry had spent the last 23 years transforming into their own happiest place on Earth. There are assorted ride vehicles hand silk screened attraction posters and other objects from his uh, 25,000 piece Disneyland and Walt Disney World Magic Kingdom collection, which has infused almost every corner of the 4,500 square foot house. Um, but <laughs> unfortunately, the house being sold, none of the Disney stuff was being sold with. <laughs> um, the house actually fetched $2.24 million with multiple offers six, six days after its listing and actually closed at 12% over the asking price. So again, buy, you know, buyer's market. Um, he had said, I didn't want to make it so kitschy that a family couldn't move in or whatever their own spin on the house is. Um, Rummel, who is a Hollywood voiceover talent, plans to relocate to Dana's Point and is auctioning most of his collection. Um, he said the biggest auction where a guy like me sold off his whole house full of Disney stuff got about $7 million in two days. If I do half of that, I'd be very happy. Um, going to auction is all of his big stuff, including four vintage ride vehicles, um, which include a rocket jet rocket, an auto autotopia car, a car from Mr. Toad's wild ride from magic kingdom with the two row seat versus the, the Disneyland version. Um, another is a skyway gondola, which a similar one had actually sold at auction for $600,000 once before. Um, so the gondola actually anchors the upstairs bonus room where it shares space with a 700, I'm sorry, a 70 pound monstro, the whale tooth. Um, there's a Pirates of the Caribbean pinball machine, hand painted attraction signs that once uh, were attached to the inside of Disneyland, uh, the Disneyland omnibus. He also has a 1955 Disneyland opening day pennant that hangs among hundreds of narrow pointed signs. 
Um, you know, just looking at pictures of his house, like every room, it's so tastefully done. It's not, you know, overcrowded. Um, his one bathroom is like tiki room themed. He has a brick hallway going to his kitchen that he has a haunted mansion plaque. It, just tons and tons of stuff. Um, you know, one of the other things was that it seems that his grandfather actually helped build the Columbia ship. So he has some artifacts, you know, from that as well. Um, and then one of the areas, he has a Club 33 sign, which was actually a, an original from the park. Um He's spent time at Club 33 as well. Um, so he had said that he had had his dad's 75th birthday at Club 33. They had their wedding anniversary, their 33rd wedding anniversary at Club 33, and knew uh, the one of the sign makers who actually had one of the original signs because they had swapped uh, some signs out and the guy kept it and he knew that he was a collector, so they made a trade, you know, for it. So that was one of the things. Unfortunately, that's something that's going with him. So there are things he's actually taking to his house, but a lot of the stuff they are selling. Um, but what's interesting is they're moving, I guess, closer to the beach, and their new home is going to be Caribbean Beach themed from the Caribbean beach resort down nice. in Orlando. So very cool. Um, you know, and it was just interesting looking at all of, uh, you know, his collectibles. Cause it's, you know, obviously some very unique stuff. He actually, um, was also the voice of Disneyland during the nineties as well. Uh, so obviously he has a, a connection and, and got, you know, some good stuff probably, you know, from that as well. So it'll be interesting to see how much, you know, the collection uh, goes for. So, so what of his haunted mansion stuff are you going to bid on? The only thing that he had or that they talked about was just the plaque. He didn't, you know, have anything else. Cause like the one room is all uh train theme. Um, you know, like I said, the one was uh tiki room theme. So, you know, now are they doing this as an online auction as well? There was no information um actually about when uh, or where it was. So, I'll have to kind of do some searching to to say uh, you know, what pops up. So, I have to I have to wonder how much of the collection he's taken with him to the new house. Right, because you figure, you know, maybe downsizing. Oh, the other thing too was he actually had kind of hidden behind uh, a wall, he had like his own little theater and it kind of looked like the Main Street Cinema. Oh, it had that yeah, Main Street yeah, Cinema yeah. look to it with, you know, a couple of movie row seats and stuff. So that looked, I was like, well, that's really cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Yeah, so. Oh, well. Oh, well. So that's it for our Disney detective. Mm -hmm. We'll be back in a minute with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. So it seems that one of the new Star Wars series has already been canceled. Wah, 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 wah. So it seems that Dave Filoni, the man who made Star Wars The Clone Wars immersive enough to qualify as canon, recently was given a raise at Lucasfilms, courtesy of Kathleen Kennedy herself. 
Um, so a purist in his own right, Filoni was granted the Herculean task of overseeing overseeing Kennedy's slate of Star Wars projects, ensuring each project remains connected to a larger, more overarching narrative, and in the process, eventually completed. But one of the shows has already been left behind. Bye-bye. Um, and that seems to be the Mandalorian spinoff, Rangers of the New Republic. Um, so the article kind of goes on to say, you know, is it something that because he, they were trying to say, oh, well, because he got the, he got a raise, he's trying to, you know, not do so much and kind of, um, you know, handpick the, the projects that are, you know, the ones that everybody's looking forward to versus, you know, oversaturating. And, you know, the article does go on to, to talk about how, you know, there's just so much that have, you know, had been announced that was going to be coming out. More than likely, something wasn't going to eventually make the roster. You know, they had all these great ideas. And then once they started moving with them, OK, what are what are what's the top ones? What can we kind of put to the bottom? Um Star Wars Rangers of the New Republic was originally going to be the Cara Dune uh, you know, uh, storyline, and she was going to take the reins as the protagonist of the show. Um, obviously, with everything that kind of, you know, went on, is it because of, you know, the downfall of, of everything in her character? Is that why? You know, did they just maybe not see it going in a, a different direction? Not really sure. Um, so, you know, basically, you know, it got canceled or it's on hold, depending on, you know, who you, you're asking. Um, but obviously they have other things that they're working on. Uh, you have the book of Boba Fett, which is the next thing that's going to be, uh, streaming. Um, and then obviously, uh, the new season of the Mandalorian, the cast is already filming in Los Angeles. And then you have Ahsoka, uh, and Obi-Wan, which are in pre-production, um, and obviously the Bad Batch, which is currently on uh, Disney Plus uh, right now, and Book of Boba Fett is supposed to be coming out in December. So, oh well. Well, and you know, when they had announced all those projects, I, I kind of, my first reaction was, they're flooding it. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to do too much. Right. I think of all the projects... The one that was probably the least in demand just from a character richness standpoint was this show. Right. And and that's probably, you know, I think it was kind of, hey, let's put a whole bunch of different ideas, throw some darts and see what sticks. Right. And then the, the dissolution of the relationship with the actress that was going to be playing Cara Dune in mm -hmm. the series probably was really... What put it over the top that this had to be the one that had to go? Right. Now, that's not to say they're not going to do it at some point in time. Right. They certainly have, you know, concept work done on it. They've mm -hmm. got some script work done on it. So it may just be one of those things that we're going to put this one on the shelf. We're going to do the 50 that we have already. Right. You know, we'll see which, you know, which right. ones of those stick around. Because, right. you know, you figure out we want a, a, a mini series, basically. Right. So right. that's not going to be a long term one. Right. Um, and, you know, we'll see if we've got resources, you know, later on, then there's a demand for it. I think that's the problem is right. that they had they had very ambitious goals with all these projects. I don't know if the demand was there. I think they struck gold. And this is what's happened with with Star Wars under the the Disney mantra is they've there was a glut for Star Wars right. for a while. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Disney buys it. They come out with a couple of movies in the Star Wars, the Skywalker franchise. We won't get into whether they were good movies or not, but they tried to branch out from there. Mm -hmm. So you have Rogue One, which was excellent. Mm -hmm. Then you had Solo. Then there wasn't a demand for Star Wars movies anymore. <laughs> um, so... Then they decided to move to TV. Right. So they finished the Clone Wars series, which they Disney had still boggles the mind that they immediately canceled it as soon as they acquired the property. So they finished that. 
Then they gave you Rebels. Then they gave you whatever the one that came after that that nobody watched. Then they gave you the first live action one with Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. And they knocked it out of the park. Right. So what's the first thing they do? What does Disney always do when they get something that's a great thing? We need to do more of it. They Right. <laughs> <laughs> More of a good thing is a better thing, right? Right. And you wind up with three spinoffs that came off of this one show. It's like, whoa, guys, hang on. You're only in your second season of this show at this point in time. Right. How about we get some character development in? How about we do a spinoff? Everybody loved Boba Fett. They brought him back into the series, and all of a sudden, he got this, He has his own he spinoff. He gets his own spinoff now. It's almost like every guest star that shows up gets their own spinoff because Disney thinks they can make money off of it. It's like, you, you got to stop. You're saturating it again. Right. You tried to do the same thing with the movies. You need to back off a little bit. You need to let the, you know, it's like wine, okay? You need to give the wine a chance to age here <laughs> before you, you start, you know, slopping it around everywhere. And, you know, I think this is a sign of that. I think what you're seeing is they've got a couple of very talented individuals that are working there. Um, I, I think we're very fortunate that we have... Filoni and Favreau who are working right. on these projects at this point in time, but there's only so much they can do. And I think that's the other thing too, is that they don't want to fail either. So probably, you know, it's like, all right, now that I'm in charge of a little bit more, let's kind of look at things and go, where do we want to focus our energy in the, the right place that makes the most sense? Right. And that's probably and part of the problem they ran into is they painted themselves into a corner. Mm-hmm. So you you take this thirty five year time jump from Re- Return of the Jedi to Force Awakens. You offer almost no backstory in between those thirty five years, mm-hmm. and then you play out the rest of the Skywalker saga. Well, then they want to go back and they want to fill in those those right. blanks, and the problem that you have. And we'll talk about it in the next story. Is the the three movies that they put out to sum up the Skywalker saga were a, a disorganized jumble of right. random thoughts that like it was almost like fifteen people wrote the scripts mm-hmm. and everyone got part of their idea in there, but you didn't right. have a coherent story anywhere. Right. So now they're coming out with all these other TV shows that are supposed to fill that gap. But you don't know what that gap is because you didn't have a coherent story in the first place. Mm -hmm. So now these are all kind of going off in their own direction here. And at some point in time, you hope that they lead to where these, you know, sequel movies showed up. Mm -hmm. Um, And right now they're not because they're going off in their own directions. Right. So, you know, Rangers of the New Republic was supposed to kind of take you in that direction. But I don't know if that's necessary given... What we're seeing in Mandalorian now mm-hmm. and what we're seeing with the other spinoffs with the Book of Boba, with Ahsoka, you know, there's all kinds. What we talked about last week with mm-hmm. Mara Jade coming in. And that's the thing is it might be one of those, you know, aspects that they were going to put into this can be sprinkled among all the others right. to kind of. And that's Get exactly it, that because all the Rangers together. of the New Republic show up in small quantities, in small doses, in The Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. Well, they still can show up in all these other shows. Right, because everybody's all linked right. together. And you probably don't didn't have enough for an actual series of them. Right. But you, these can be those things that tie the threads of the other shows together. Or you could even do... If each of these other shows are all within the same timeline, you could even do a Rangers themed show in Book of Boba. You can do a Rangers theme. So, like, you could almost have, like, all the same characters show up and here's them interacting with Boba. Here's with Ahsoka. Here's with the Mandalorian. And and kind of have, like, that tie in. Yeah. When you spin so many shows off of one show. Right. Having an element that can cross between all of those to tie them together makes sense. Mm -hmm. Not having it as its own show, but having it as recurring characters that you see. Mm -hmm. Like, who wouldn't want to see Dave Filoni in an X-Wing pilot suit again? He would love to do that again. That was so awesome. You know, have him go around as one of the Rangers of the Republic and have him show up in all the other shows. 
Taika Waititi you know? should, you know, Absolutely. show up. You know, too. and that yeah. that would be like your golden opportunity because mm-hmm. they want everybody wants to do cameos. That would be a great way to do yeah. cameos in all the shows. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're a ranger now, so you get to be in all the shows. Right. You know that type of thing. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I, I don't know. I'm not disappointed at this. I'm kind of glad they're pulling the reins back a little mm-hmm. bit. And I think they, they might be correcting some of the overambitious ideas that they had with this. Yeah, yeah. So what else do we have? All right. So hopefully this will make sense. So it seems that Dave Filoni is now trying to erase the Star Wars sequels Snoke problem. So the Star Wars sequel trilogy has some plot holes at best. At worst, it completely ruined the Star Wars universe George Lucas spent decades upon decades of his life building. So no matter which Star Wars camp you fall into, we can all agree upon the fact that Supreme Leader Snoke was far from the best villain in the Star Wars franchise had ever seen. So Snoke really didn't serve, you know, much of a purpose in any of these movies. Um, his original story was never really fully explained, and his primary purpose kind of seemed, um, you know, to basically allow Kylo Ren to ultimately take over as Supreme Leader. Uh, as he was basically a placeholder um, for, you know, Ben Solo without a real story of his own. So it seems that during The Mandalorian Season 2, showrunner John Favreau and Dave Filoni had already started explaining Snoke's origin better than the Star Wars sequels ever did when they introduced Dr. Persing uh, and his clone experiments to Moff Gideon. So now Filoni is kind of picking up where he left off in his latest Star Wars animated series, The Bad Batch. Now, I haven't watched any of that. I know you've watched a little bit of it. Two episodes behind right now. Okay. So I guess they kind of talk about this a little bit more in The Bad Batch with the various clones and. You know, that uh, it starts off with, um, you know, that there are a bunch of clones that when Palpatine is executing Order 66, they kind of don't understand what's going on. So they kind of go and do their own thing, I guess. They become the Bad Batch. Um, so now a couple of different Star Wars fans have sounds kind like of... A, sounds like burnt cookies. <laughs> bad Batch. <laughs> Some sometimes burnt cookies aren't so bad. <laughs> um, so now, you know, a couple of different Star Wars fans have kind of theorized that, you know, the um, Kaminoans, Kam- Kaminoans, Kaminoans, that they're, you know, kind of toast, uh, closely tied to Snoke, so the and that with the long necks. Oh, okay, gotcha. And that the Mandalorians, Doctor uh, Persing's experiments on Grogu and even Ray were kind of part of that whole thing kind of meshed together. So, so again, most, you know, and obviously if we, you know, go through and, and watch more of the Bad Batch, there's probably a little bit more that kind of explains, you know, and kind of tries to fix it, I guess, to better understand, you know, where Snoke came from and how he, you know, came to, to power and, and kind of why... Um, you know, other things happened later on in, in the series. So again, we haven't, you know, you've watched more than I have, um, but I haven't watched any of it. So again, all these different kind of theories coming in, um, you know, to kind of, I guess, better answer who this guy was and how he he came to, to power. So, so. so one of the things that, that's probably worth mentioning is in the expanded universe, the concept of cloning existed. Mm -hmm. And even in the prequels, when we had the clones show up for the clone wars, Mm -hmm. the understanding was, is that they could not, the technology at the time could not clone force users. Right. So they could clone regular people. They could make armies at them and so forth. And it wasn't until in the later books, the Thrawn books, as a matter mm-hmm. of fact, where you start to see them experimenting with Force users being cloned. Right. And one of the key ones there was a Jedi that was cloned. His name was Jorah Sabath. And he was cloned successfully, but the cloning process and the way that the Force works, he goes insane. Mm. So there was numerous experiments that 
Palpatine was trying to go through in the expanded universe to generate a clone that he could transfer his essence into. So they allude to this in a few other um, canon mediums, one being uh, one of the Star Wars games uh, that you could you can play, and, and the storyline itself goes along with this um, operation that he's that Palpatine had planned, so that if he dies, this operation goes into effect, and part of it has to do with them putting these cloning cylinders in hiding. Um, then you have a few of the novels deal with this, where uh, he's cloning his body. And his essence survives the Death Star Mm -hmm. and his essence transfers into the bodies. But because of the power of the force, the bodies, he's basically burning through the bodies. Mm, Okay. So he he can't sustain himself in a clone body for Mm -hmm. long. So then we fast forward to uh, Rise of Skywalker and you have that really weird scene where Palpatine's introduced and you see a clone that looks like Snoke in this tube somewhere. Right. And that's supposed to represent the fact that these are his clones that he has been trying to trying to, to do for so long. Exactly. And, right. Um, and then the scenes that we see in the, the Mandalorian, Mandalorian right. are the same thing where they're trying to, to take, you know, Groku's cells or blood or whatever mm-hmm. and use that to clone a force sensitive body that Palpatine. So that's sort of the, that's the, their expansion. Right. Their, Trying to their move explanation along. of the expanded universe version of the cloning. And it's supposed to ultimately wind up with Snoke where they couldn't keep cloning the body. So there's speculation that the Palpatine that you see in uh, Rise of Skywalker is Palpatine in his original body because they could not come up with a viable mm. clone. After trying after for... All, right. So Snoke was put in place to run the Empire while they tried to perfect this. Gotcha. In the process. So he was a placeholder, really. Right. You know. But none of that's explained in the movies. Right. So you get this person who is, you know... All-powerful Literally ish. larger than life when you first see him, because you see him as this giant hologram. Right. And then when he finally shows up, he's this frail... You know, shadow of a being who ironically looks very much like the species that Palpatine's master was supposed to be. Mm. So there was always speculation about okay. him being uh, Darth Plagueis, but obviously he wasn't. Uh, there was speculation that he was a resurrected version of Darth Vader because of some of the wounds on his face, but he wasn't. So there was all these false cues that mm-hmm. they put in the movies and then they chopped them in half in the second movie and there's no explanation whatsoever. Right. So this goes back to what I was saying earlier that the sequels were just a jumbled mess of different ideas that they like everybody wrote down a story plot, they threw it all in a hat and they put 10 Pulled out them. and that became a movie. <laughs> Here's our movie. <laughs> um, so it's a mess. It really is. And force awakens started the mess but it was, it, you know, he played to f- the fans with a lot of what he did there. Mm. And then Ryan Johnson came in and decided, that, well, we're just going to throw out all those ideas right. and come up with a whole new set of bad I'm ideas. Start it all over again. And he decided to start a trilogy all over again with one movie. And then Abrams came in and had it kind of. And said, oh, great, now i got to clean up this place. Right. So he's, <laughs> Abrams gets right. into this steaming pile of trash and has to sort of pick out the pieces that he can use and try to put some kind of story together. Right. And in the meantime, from from Force Awakens to Rise of Skywalker, you don't have a coherent story. Right. And now all these other shows are trying to trying to clean that mess up. And really, you should just throw out the sequels. Just pre- give, give me give me what J.J. Abrams did with Star Trek. Okay. Give me a time travel alternate universe and all that happened in an alternate universe. That would be interesting. And then here's the real movies that that should have been made. That this is the real universe. Yeah. You know, let let Luke wake up. You know, give me give me a, a sitcom finale and have Luke wake <laughs> up and it was all a dream. And really, here's the real movies. So, 
I don't know. We'll, that would be we'll see. It's like yeah. they went down the rabbit hole with Force Awakens and they continue to just scratch at a festering wound there and make it worse. Mm. Um, and I don't know how you heal it. I just, I really don't without throwing out everything from the last three movies. Yeah, that's kind of. And you can't really go back. And they're trying to retcon a lot of this stuff with, yeah. with the TV shows now. And right, you can't because right. it's 35 years ago. Right, right. You know, there's only so much cleanup that you can do to try to explain the steaming mess that you have. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but, you know, thank God for the Mythbusters who proved you really can shine a turd, though. <laughs> and that's what Disney's trying to do here. They're trying to shine a turd. Nice. <laughs> uh, so that was all we had for our... What was that? Tales, Tales from, from the, the edge, edge of, of the, the galaxy. Tales from the edge of my sanity. <laughs> I uh, like that. <laughs> that should be a podcast. <laughs> we'll be we'll be right back with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. So it seems that MGM soul has now been sold to Amazon for eight point four five billion dollars. Billion dollars. <laughs> I was waiting for that. So the tech giant will add a big collection of Hollywood classics and potential franchises to its prime membership mix. In a landmark mega deal, Amazon is acquiring MGM Holdings, whose storied studios boast one of the largest film and TV libraries in a bid to super turbocharge its prime membership offerings to customers and potentially get uh, mine intellectual properties of franchises such as James Bond and Rocky. Uh, the deal, which is still pending some regulatory approval, is uh, valued at $8.45 billion. Um, obviously, it's a treasure trove of, you know, a deep catalog. Um, and the uh, senior VP of uh, Prime Video had said, you know, it's a very exciting and provides for so many opportunities for high quality storytelling. Um, so the acquisition, which was revealed just days after AT&T announced a $43 billion plan on May 17th to spin off its Warner Media division, including HBO and Warner Brothers, to Discovery marks the latest major consolidation to rattle the entertainment industry. Um, so Amazon, who is led by Andy Jassy and Jeff Bezos, uh, they've been, you know, trying to push further into the Hollywood uh, realm of things. Um, so Amazon, uh, which disclosed uh, in April, that it's uh, 175 million do million not dollar million uh, prime members have viewed movies on TV shows uh, on its platform in the last year is battling with Netflix, who has uh, 207 million global subscriptions, and Disney has 103 million uh, subscriptions, and they're basically trying to, you know, be on top of, of both of those, too. Um, obviously, Amazon is known for some of its unscript, uh, some of its, uh, scripted original content. One of the new series that's coming out is The Underground Railroad. 
Um, obviously, the Mar- uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is a perennial Emmy nominee. Um, and then it seems they're going to be coming out with the uh, uh, Lord of the Rings series coming out. Um, Amazon also just earned Oscar nominations this year with The Sound of Metal, One Night in Miami, um, and the Borat uh, sequel, uh, which all came under the Amazon uh, heading. Um, and then it also seems that now they're looking to try and get some live NFL rights, uh, including Thursday Night Football and pulling it from Fox beginning in 2022. So, you know, they're trying, again, trying to take over the world. Um, obviously, there are, you know, the, the MGM title goes back, you know, basically as, as far as, you know, movie history, really, when, when you think about it. So you have, you know, over 4,000 titles, 17,000 hours of TV programming. Um, so you have Bond movies, you have the Rocky movies, the Hobbit films. Um, then, you know, you also have, um, you know, the classics like Raging Bull and Moonstruck, Thelma and Louise, Silence of the Lambs. But there's also MGM also produces a lot of um, television as well. So you have the MGM uh, TV, which produces Hulu's The Handmaid's Tale, FX uh, Fargo, uh, the History Channel's Viking Show, And then, of course, uh, they also do unscripted stuff like The Voice and Shark Tank. So they're all over the place. Um, You know, so this is kind of a big deal, um, especially for Amazon, because it's going to add, again, so much more content that really hasn't been, uh, you know, anywhere. Because, again, it's all kind of over the place, but has never been in, in one location. So... You know, it'll be interesting to to see how this affects other things. Uh, you know, moving forward. This is a this is a pretty bold move for Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, Sam and I had talked on the the last insights into uh, tomorrow podcast about modern monopolies mm-hmm. and how Amazon really is in the crosshairs of the Justice Department right now and the federal government for how much control they have over so many different industries Mm -hmm. and to orchestrate a deal like this and expect it to, to pass muster with the government, I think is very bold. Mm. Um, this is, this is huge. They already control a huge portion of the entertainment industry as it is. Mm -hmm. This is a, a huge leap towards that monopolistic standing there. But I think it's also a sign of the times of the consolidation that we're seeing through various uh, companies that are taking over the entire entertainment industry. Mm-hmm. Disney being, you know, probably chief among those. Right. You know, you've got Disney, you've got Netflix, you've got Amazon, um, Google to a, to a lesser extent with some of their streaming stuff. But the problem that you're running into is you've got all these big major multi-billion dollar companies that are gobbling up everything Mm -hmm. and you're going to have three choices. You know, we're going to be back to three networks again like we were 30 years ago. Right. Um, I don't know if that's good for the market. I don't know if that's good for the consumer. Well, I don't know because now everything, you know, every time you turn on, you know, it's, hey, this show is coming and it's now moving to... Paramount Plus. Right. Or, hey, this one, and it's Discovery Plus, and it's, you know, like, nothing's on regular TV anymore, Um, you know, or they'll do the first season on regular TV, and then everything else moves to a premium channel. So if you want to watch it, now you have to... And the streaming model works because... Mm -hmm. It's not dependent on advertising, obviously, and that's right. that's the model that's driven uh, the entertainment industry for you know almost a hundred years now was advertising, mm-hmm. and with advertising, even with Nielsen ratings, when Nielsen would put you know technology in people's houses to right, see what, to they, watch were what watching, they were watching, or right. they would send their surveys out, mm-hmm. you would base your advertising revenue on what that information was, and at best, it was an educated guess. Mm-hmm. 
With streaming, you don't have that problem. Right, with streaming, because you know. You know who your customer is. You know what they're buying. You know where they mm -hmm. live. You know what their ethnicity is. You know so much about your customer now with streaming mm -hmm. that the streaming model works. Mm -hmm. Not only are they paying a subscription, but these subscriptions that you're paying for aren't all ad-free. Right. You're seeing different tiers in your subscriptions mm -hmm. now. So for Hulu, for 5 bucks a month, you get it with ads. For... I don't know, 30 bucks a month, you get it without ads. So it's like they're still making money off of you, but they're mm -hmm. making money with such targeted advertising that it makes sense. That's not where my concern is. My concern is all these networks that are streaming now are going to be owned by three big companies. Mm -hmm. And when they're owned by three big companies, the cost to subscribe to these things is going to be astronomical. Mm -hmm. As soon as they own all the content and there's no other content, no other independent content out there to go after, then they can jack the rates up. That's how monopolies work. Right. And you're going to find that Amazon and Disney and all the big players in it are going to collude to own the market, to set their own rates. Um, they may not be doing it now. It right. may be competition now, which it is. Mm -hmm. But this is how big industry has worked traditionally for 200 years in this country is you have all these independents or all these individuals that get gobbled up into consortiums. Those consortiums become mega, you know, billion dollar companies and a few companies own everything. And once that happens, then they can fix prices. And whenever that happens, the consumers lose out on it. And, and this is another sign of that happening. So... Good for Amazon. I'm a prime <laughs> subscriber, so I'm going to get to take advantage of all this mm -hmm. stuff. But I guarantee you that my you know, they're paying billions of dollars for this deal. Your Amazon Prime subscription is going mm -hmm. to go up significantly in the next few years. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. What else did we have? So we had... You know, a little bit of sad news that that happened the other day. Uh, so it seems that Samuel E. Wright, who was the voice of the Little Mermaid, Sebastian the Crab, and also Broadway's Mufasa, passed away at 74. Uh, the news was actually posted on uh, the Facebook page of the town of Montgomery, New York. Uh, they had said, Sam was an inspiration to all of us and his family established the Hudson Valley Conservatory. Sam and his family have impacted countless Hudson Valley youth, always inspiring them to reach higher and dig deeper to become the best version of themselves. On top of his passion for the arts and his love of his family, Sam was most known for walking into a room and simply providing pure joy to those who interacted with him. He loved to entertain, he loved to make people smile, and he laughed, and he loved to love. Obviously, the majority of people know him as the voice of the Jamaican crab who served as King Triton's advisor and sings one of the most beloved songs in Disney canon. Um, but he also was an accomplished Broadway actor, um, beginning uh, in the original 1971 production of Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, in 1974, he actually replaced Ben Vereen as the lead in Pippin. Uh, in the 90s, he appeared uh, on Broadway in Over Here, The Tap Dance Kid, uh, Welcome to the Club. Um, and then in 1997, he originated the role of Mufasa in the Broadway production of The Lion King, and that actually earned his second Tony uh, nomination. He did television as well. Um, he did, you know, various guest starring roles on All My Children, The Cosby Show, Spencer for Hire. Um, and in 1988, he actually played jazz great Dizzy Gillespie in Clint Eastwood's Charlie Parker biopic Bird. Um, but obviously the role of Sebastian is what most people know him for. And the song, 
Kiss the Girl, which was uh, best song Oscar nominee uh, for the movie as well. Um, he did other things with Disney um, as Sebastian. There was the Sebastian's Caribbean Jamboree, uh, Disney's The Little Mermaid 2, House of Mouse. Uh, and in 2008, he reprised the role of Sebastian as uh, in The Little Mermaid, Ariel's Beginnings. Um, he had also done uh, voiceover work uh, in the computer animated uh, movie Dinosaur. Um, he is survived by his wife and his three children. Sad news. We Our sympathies go out to the family and friends, but... Uh, Quite a distinguished career. Mm -hmm. And he will live on, obviously, you know, as most Disney characters do. And nothing like uh, Disney to make you immortal, right? Absolutely. So that was all we had for our entertainment news. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick is a comedy that is actually on the Peacock Network. So again, talking about all those obscure <laughs> streaming uh, channels. Uh, and it the name of the show is called Girls 5 Eva. Um, and so what it is is when a one-hit wonder uh, group from the golden era of girl groups get sampled by a young rapper, the members reunite to give their pop star dreams one more shot. This time, Dawn, Wiki, Gloria, and Summer must navigate the intricacies of a new, more socially conscious society, realizing that their m old music wasn't all that uplifting to young women. So it kind of toggles between 1999 and 2021, and the story kind of sheds some light on the fall from stardom and their return to relevance as the women balance spouses, kids, jobs, debt, aging parents, and shoulder pain. Um, so it, it, it's kind of a interesting take, um, you know, to kind of see, you know, all these musicians who had these one hits and kind of faded, you know, from existence and how, you know, do they manage these days? So, you know, the one person works in her brother's restaurant. Uh, the other one supposedly, you know, is this glamorous jet setter when you find out really that she actually just works for an airport and all of her photos that she posts on Instagram are all fake, you know, that she's pretending to still have this high lifestyle, you know, th this big lifestyle that she doesn't even have anymore. Um, and the one is now a dentist. She got a regular job after, you know, the fact. Um, and then the, the other one who married a boy band uh, singer Basically, they don't even, uh, you know, really live together anymore. Everything's kind of fake. And so at one point, she's on a f FaceTime with him, but it's actually a cameo. So she paid to have this message <laughs> recorded from her husband. So really kind of quirky. It's a really fun cast. Um, you know, so if you're, you know, somebody that remembers the, the girl groups of the late 90s, you know, it's kind of nostalgic to see, you know, oh, this is what happens when, you know, you're in your 40s now and, you know, trying to relive uh, your youth, I guess, in, in some ways. So re really kind of funny. Nice. Good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week, much like last week, I'm digging into the archives here. This time it's uh, digging deep with Hulu. And I pulled out Star Trek Enterprise. So this was a series that originally aired for four seasons from 2001 to 2005. It was the last Star Trek series in what's considered the next generation era that included Star Trek The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and the Star Trek motion pictures with the Next Generation cast. So set in the 22nd century, a century before Captain Kirk's five-year mission, Jonathan Archer captains the United Earth ship Enterprise during the early years of Starfleet, leading up to the Earth-Romulan War and the formation of the United Federation of Planets. 
The show takes place during the early pioneering days of deep space exploration when interstellar travel is in its infancy and the United Federation of Planets is still decades away. Captain Jonathan Arthur Archer is the prototype for a Starfleet captain to come. He's bold, intensely curious, and eager to venture where no man has gone before. Unlike the seasoned, sometimes unflappable officers of the 24th century, the crew of Enterprise exhibits a sense of wonder and excitement, as well as a little trepidation about the strange things they'll encounter. With their star charts mostly empty, they'll have to prove they're ready for life among the stars. This was a bold attempt to transition from the post-apocalyptic world seen in the movie Star Trek First Contact to the technologically and socially advanced world from the original 1960s version of the show onward. At times, the show struggles to present itself as technologically inferior to what we saw in the other franchises. Character development through the season through season one is rough, but by the second season, you settle in nicely with the familiar crew and their idiosyncrasies. The cavalcade of alien appearance, appearances is in line with what you'd expect. Some familiar faces, some not so much. Modern prosthetics and CGI bring to life some of the campier aliens familiar to us from the original series. The Andorians, for instance, are more animated, especially their antenna. The Gorn now looks as intimidating as we were led to believe when we faced a single actor in a poorly fitting rubber suit. <laughs> For the most part, the Vulcans are seen as the overbearing parents to humans rather than the staunch, if logical, allies we know them to be later in history. And there's a whole host of new and interesting aliens. It is worth noting that uh, 2021 is the 55th anniversary of Star Trek. Wow. Which... You know, makes me feel what I, I can honestly say I wasn't there for the original series <laughs> right, hearings. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm not that old. Um, you'll find numerous conventions. When I was doing my research, there was tons of conventions going around marking it and various virtual panels and appearances around the world. Uh, one of the biggest ones that's being held uh, is being held August 11th to the 15th. It was originally supposed to be held in December at the Rio All Suites Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. The parade of uh, former Star Trek stars appearing at the convention is huge, including Connor Trenier, uh, Dominic Keating. Connor Trenier was the uh, uh, engineer from Enterprise. Dominic Keating was the tactical officer. Uh, Gary Graham, who played the Vulcan ambassador, who made numerous appearances in Enterprise. And John Billingsley, who was uh, Dr. Phlox on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's tons of stars from every incarnation uh, out there. We'll put a link in the show notes to uh, the actual convention itself. I'd love to go, but I can't imagine we're going to be out in Vegas in August. Probably That's not. That's just not humanly possible for me. So anyway, uh, Golden Oldie here. I'm on season three at this point in time, binging the, the four seasons of Star Trek Enterprise on Hulu, and we'll be right back. So that was it for the show today, but before we go, we did uh, have an event that we went to this weekend. Yes, Why don't you tell we did. Us, tell the audience about that. So one of the events that we kind of look forward to during convention season is Monster Mania. Uh, it's one that's usually held twice a year, uh, in two different locations, one in the South Jersey area in Cherry Hill, and then another in Maryland. Um, obviously, with everything being shut down, they haven't been able to, to do any conventions. So back in March, they came up with an idea to do Monster Mania Mini Mall. Uh, basically, this was going to be an outside event. Uh, where they would be able to actually have more vendors than they normally would be able to hold uh, in at least Cherry Hill. I don't know what the, the Maryland location uh, yeah, we've never is been like. We've one. never been to that one. So I don't know if it's a bigger or smaller or, or whatnot. So they were going to be able to, to offer more. The other thing, too, is they were going to have celebrities as well. Uh, that's usually one of the big draws of most of the conventions as well. Um, it was going to be cheaper as well because it wasn't going to be a full blown convention like they normally do. Uh, it was 
held at the convention Philadelphia uh, Greater Philadelphia Greater Expo Philadelphia Center. Expo Center in Oaks, which we've been to many times, and they actually have an outside area that's fenced off. We had never been to anything that was like that. So you had to go through one gate. They scanned your tickets. You you had to purchase your tickets in advance. They weren't doing anything at the door. Um, it was just two days uh, where normally Monster Mania is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Again, more vendor-centric, you know, than than anything else. But again, most of these vendors haven't been able to to sell their stuff to the public, uh, you know, in, in any sort of event. So this was great for them to, to have an opportunity. Uh, they had a couple of different food trucks. Um, they had music playing. Everything, for the most part, was very well spread out. The only issue was that it was hot. Yes. Um, Painfully, like and, 94 degrees. And it, and it was funny because one of the, the things they had posted, I guess it was... Saturday night before Sunday, they were like, you know, when we picked these dates, we were figuring, oh, we don't want to do it during the summer because it'll be too hot. Yeah, and ironically. here, the weekend that we hit, it's 85 on Saturday and 95 on Sunday. Uh, and unfortunately, at least one of the vendors um, who was there on Saturday wasn't able to be there on Sunday because they had they got heat stroke. Yeah. Um, so they were you know, walking around selling bottles of water, you know, when we even checked in, they said, make sure you have, you know, that you're drinking plenty of water and that you're staying cool. Uh, a couple of the vendors that were selling umbrellas sold out. <laughs> we brought our own umbrellas. We brought our own waters. We we were trying to stay as hydrated as we could. I think the only negative, which again, you know, wasn't really that bad of a negative would have been if they would have had some tents set up for relaxation right areas but there's no way for them to anticipate right the exactly when they were planning this in march uh, you know it could have been raining and then if it was raining you probably would have had a bunch of vendors not show up because all of their goods would have gotten destroyed in it so, so so while we were there we did take some footage we mm -hmm. put uh some clips together for the uh enjoyment of our viewing audience that we will show you now
For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into things. A podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow. This is episode 12, the Cryptocurrency Conundrum. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my co-host, Sam Whalen, today. Hello, everybody. How you doing today, Sam? I'm doing okay. So today we're going to be talking about crypto. Do you own any crypto? I did for a little bit. I had Dogecoin when that was like a joke. Yeah, um, it still is, by the way. Yeah, but it's kind of settled out because I was using, I mean, we'll talk about it, but I was using Robinhood to get it. Yeah. And I think... My friends and I all started doing it as a joke. Um, but yeah, I had a little bit of Doge for a while. Not anymore, though. Okay. Doge actually is uh, not that difficult to generate. It's not like uh, your Bitcoin and stuff like that where it's uh, finite and crypto complicated. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how any of it works, though. That's the point of this show. You'll uh, explain it to all of us <laughs> in uh, great detail. <laughs> yes, I will, hopefully, in, in terms that we can all understand. Uh, but before we do that, I would... Uh, uh, suggest folks subscribe to the podcast itself so you get it first thing on uh, Monday morning at 8 o'clock when they come out. You can subscribe to the audio version of the podcast by looking us up as Insights into Tomorrow. The video versions of the podcast and all of our network podcasts are listed as Insights into Things. You can get us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, pretty much any place you can get a podcast these days. I would also invite folks to uh, give us your feedback email us at comments at insights into things.com. Let us know how we're doing on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can give us feedback on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. Shoot us a note on Instagram at insights into things, or you can reach out to us on our website at www.insights into things.com. So today what we're going to be doing is we're going to take a look at what cryptocurrency is We'll understand a little, a little bit about what blockchain technology is. Then we're going to take a look at some of the real-time or real-world impacts that cryptocurrency is having on today's economy and whether it's worth investing in. And then finally, we'll wrap up by looking at how cryptocurrency is changing the world and what the future of crypto looks like. And we'll talk a little bit about a new phenomenon in crypto called NFTs. So hopefully by the time we get done here, we'll all have a good understanding of what crypto is. And we'll be dumping money into the market to buy some. <laughs> Shall we get started? Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. 
So what is crypto? So this definition of crypto comes from NerdWallet. Figure that was kind of a safe place to go to. So cryptocurrency or crypto is a digital currency that can be used to buy goods and services, but uses an online ledger with a strong cryptography to secure online transactions. So when you, unlike a, 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 a nationalized currency, there's no borders to crypto at this point. It exists entirely online and it's basically tied up inside of a cryptographic algorithm. Much of the interest in these unregulated currencies is to trade for profit with speculators at times driving prices skyward, as we've seen recently with uh, Bitcoin. Many companies have issued their own currencies, often called tokens, and these can be traded specifically for goods or services that company provides. Uh, everyone's familiar with microtransactions, and nowadays you can buy um, currency with a company that you then use to buy things inside that company. It's no different than when you used to go to the arcade and the arcade machines didn't take quarters, they took tokens. So you put a dollar bill in a machine and got four tokens out instead of four coins. And that kind of kept that money tied up inside of that, uh, that establishment. So cryptocurrencies also use technology called blockchain. So we'll talk about blockchain in a second. That's really the driving technology behind blockchain. But part of the appeal of cryptocurrency is the security of it. A lot of people feel the anonymity that uh, cryptocurrency offers is a selling point uh, because you can go out and make a transaction, a purchase online somewhere and not have that traced back to you through a PayPal account or a credit card or something else. But what people don't realize is it's not as untraceable as they think it is because there is a digital footprint. There's a digital trail that goes along with it that can be traced back to your wallet because you have to have a digital wallet that you apply these coins to. So with that in mind, questions, statements, inquiries? <laughs> no, I think uh, I think that, that all makes sense. I mean, my familiarity with Bitcoin is mostly from um, – the last season of Mr. Robot, actually, which ended a while ago. Um, but in that show, the economy basically tanks. And this one company, um, <clears throat> E-Corp, comes up with E-Coin, which is basically takes the place of physical money. So everybody has their E-Coin wallet on their phone. So I kind of got the concept a little bit from that. I mean, it's a fictionalized portrayal, but they did their research in terms of, you know, using Bitcoin as a replacement for physical money. Sure. And, and really, I mean, money is... Currency itself is anything that has a value associated with it that you can trade for things, whether it's paper money that we have, <clears throat> whether it's gold coins because the uh, material that it's made from has a value associated with it, or nowadays with U.S. currency where there isn't a, a backing to it, there's no silver or gold backing to it, there's an intrinsic value based on the current economic state. So as a result, the dollar goes up and down depending on what our trade state is and, and other factors in the world. Cryptocurrency is the same sort of scenario, but it's affected by things very differently. Like one of the things that we're seeing nowadays is um, Bitcoin is soaring right now. And one of the reasons it, it took a recent jump was Tesla, Elon Musk's company, uh, decided that they're going to take Bitcoin payment for cars and they invested more than a billion dollars to acquire Bitcoin. Well, anytime uh, a commodity is purchased in volumes like that, the cost of it goes up just because of the perceived value of it at that point. So you have, you have speculative investment like that that's causing uh, a rise in value. Yeah, that happened with, uh, we talked about Dogecoin earlier too. Elon Musk would like make a tweet about Dogecoin and it would shoot up like 20 cents or something like that. Sure, sure. So like, and you get that with regular stocks too, but with crypto, it's even more volatile like that. 
Well, and Elon Musk is a great person to pick on because he's the type of person who stock in Tesla goes up significantly and then he tweets and says, Oh, well, that's over that's that's overvalued, and then the stock plummets. Mm-hmm. And you know, when you're the second richest man in the world, you can stand to lose forty billion dollars and it doesn't really put a dent in your bank account, but your other investors can't afford that kind of recklessness and that volatility in a stock that they're investing in. And and we'll talk later about the investment angle of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but we're going to find that's the same type of thing with, with crypto. So the technology that it is based on is blockchain. <clears throat> now, this information comes from another website, Investopedia.com. Blockchain is a decentralized technology spread across many computers that manages and records transactions. Blockchain is a specific type of database. It differs from a typical database in the way it stores information. Blockchains store data in blocks that are then chained together. Blockchain. I get it. (laughs) Blockchain. Once a block is filled with data, it's chained onto the previous block, which makes the data chained together in a chronological order. So one of the problems that you have with this is that as you continue to mine coin in a blockchain, the blockchain gets larger and larger and larger which requires more storage capacity, requires more bandwidth to handle, requires more computing power as that as it gets progressively larger. Different types of information can be stored on a blockchain, but the most common use so far has been as a ledger for these transactions. In Bitcoin's case, blockchain is used in a decentralized way so that no single person or group has control. Rather, all users collectively retain control. So when you're going to mine Bitcoin, you download whatever the current version of that blockchain is, the entire thing. And as you're churning through it and you fill up the block itself, you're sending that data back out to this collection of computers. So when we're talking about downloading it, is this like terabytes, pentabytes? I don't know how big does it get. Uh, I don't know what the last count was, but you're talking a massive amount of data right now. Like, like it would take, I, th- I think I was looking at numbers earlier and it took eight hours or so over a gigabit line to download the current one. Um, once you have it though, you're getting incremental updates yeah. to it, but that's just a sign of how large this is. And the larger it is, the more computations have to be done. <clears throat> so the problem a lot of people are running into is that in order to mine Bitcoin now, people are using very sophisticated hardware. In fact, NVIDIA just came out with their latest line of video cards, and they cryptographically crippled them through a driver update so they couldn't be used for blockchain. Because what's happening is you're actually burning more energy in computational power and cooling to run these machines then you're generating an actual funds. Um, so it's environmentally. Environmentally, it's not a good thing. I mean, we're not drilling another hole in the ozone or anything, <laughs> but this is not going down the right path. Um, so Bitcoin, in Bitcoin's case, the blockchain is used to, as, a, as a way to store the, the ledger on here and the decentralized blockchains are themselves immutable, which means that once the data is entered, it can't be changed. And for Bitcoin, this means that transactions are permanently recorded and viewable to anyone. And that's where that lack of anonymity comes from. Because in order for this whole system to work, you have to use a shared database for these transactions. Now, your existence in here is probably some, you know, 64 character long random GUID number, not, you know, Sam. So there's that level of anonymity, but it also records origins of these. So it can tell geographically by your IP address where it's coming from. So when you process something on the blockchain, it knows 
what your ID is, it might not know who you are, but it can see where you're at. So a lot of cyber forensic analysis is going into some of these because a lot of people in the criminal underworld are using Bitcoin to fund their terrorist organizations and criminal organizations because of that level of security. So as a result, federal authorities and, and government authorities around the world are developing new tools to try to de-anonymize some of these transactions to, to track it down so that they can they can generate evidence against criminals. So that's really what blockchain is. It's the technology behind, it's the database behind cryptocurrency. Questions, comments? No, I mean, it seems relatively straightforward so far. Um, yeah, so how do, my only thing is like, how does this translate into actual value? Because like, I, I understand how you get it and how it's made, but like, is it just because it's, there's so much of it that it gives it value? It's it's not that there's so much, it's that there's so little. Um, so for instance, if you look at Bitcoin, the way that you you compute the um, or the way that you mine Bitcoin computationally, there's a finite number of Bitcoins that are out there. And the more that are found, the fewer that can be found. So it's almost like, think of it like a baseball card. You know, 10 Ricky Henderson rookies are made. That's all that will ever be made. And they're all in packages that are sitting in stores. So when the first one gets purchased, it's worth, say, $1,000. But when the second one gets purchased, you know that there's only eight more out there. So the value of the ones that are found go up until all 10 are found. And then there's a fixed value because they exist. They're the only ones that are going to exist. So that's why you have Tesla getting a bunch of it. Exactly. And it skyrockets. The problem that you run into is as people trade it and buy and sell and, and companies start to adopt it as a actual currency, it gets more precious because you have a finite pool of resources now that are now being traded mm. on, in large blocks. So people fight over it. and then Exactly. Get, yeah. Then you have, organi- you have governments. Like, for instance, Russia has outlawed Bitcoin. So you can't use Bitcoin in Russia to do anything. Where in the United States, I could spend Bitcoin to buy a pizza. You know, it's it's literally that simple. And in the early days of Bitcoin, it was used very frivolously. It was generated a lot on colleges because a lot of college students would use uh, computers on campus because of the computational power to generate these. So you'd have students that would have 10 Bitcoins that would generate overnight. Then they'd want to order pizza. Well, they didn't have any cash, so the local pizzeria would accept Bitcoin. So you'd spend two Bitcoin to buy a pizza. And one Bitcoin now is worth like $10,000 or something like that. Right. So you have people that spent over $20,000 on pizzas when they were in college. So that's why the volatility of it kind of makes for opportunities but it also makes for misuse of the currency as yeah. well. So we're going to take a quick break, uh, and we'll come back and we'll talk about what the impact of cryptocurrency is on today's society. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Today on Insights Into Tomorrow, I find the button on the board to actually hit the right <laughs> scene. 
<laughs> Today we're talking about cryptocurrency, and we're going to talk a little bit about the impact of cryptocurrency on today's economy. So we've talked about Bitcoin. We've talked about Dogecoin a little bit. There's actually more than 6,700 different cryptocurrencies that are traded publicly today. And this is according, according to coinmarketcap.com. Cryptocurrencies continue to proliferate, raising money through initial coin offerings. You've heard of IPOs, initial public offerings for stocks. ICOs are what crypto coins actually use to generate their funds. The total value of, of all cryptocurrencies as of February 18th, 2021 was more than $1.6 trillion, according to CoinMarketCap. And the total value of all Bitcoins, the most popular digital currency, was pegged at about $969 billion. Now, you can't have that much market cap and not have a huge influence over the economy. I mean, I, I can't, it's hard for me to imagine another segment of the economy other than like Apple, that's a trillion dollar company that has that kind of influence over it. Um, so just that, that value alone gives you a footprint and a, and a place at the table that countries, I mean, that's, that's more value than most countries in the world actually have as far as value goes. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, that's an astounding amount of wealth <laughs> and yeah. like going back to the pizza analogy from earlier, like to think that it's come from that, you know, using it to get a, a pizza to $969 billion in what, 20 years? Yeah. Not uh, even that. Yeah, yeah. Less than that. Um, it's just interesting and, and stocks in general or the market, how that works, it all kind of mystifies me. It seems like it's gambling with extra steps and like, um, how things get value. And, and in this case, how things can skyrocket in value over time. It uh, it fascinates me, but it's not something I <laughs> have an idea how to get involved in. Well, and that's one of the things. That's one of the real distinguishing factors between a cryptocurrency and a stock. A stock is a piece of something. It's a piece of a company, and its value is based on the value of that company, its revenue, its its profit, and how that company is being run. And all that information, when you're a publicly traded company is publicly available. So if you want to go do the research on Intel and see how much Intel is worth, you can see what their assets are, what their liabilities are, what their profits are, what contracts they've landed over the last 12 months. You can do all that research and find all that information. And, and largely that's what you know analysts and stockbrokers do for you. They, they do all that work for you and come back and say, okay, buy Intel because they're worth it. <clears throat> but you have the freedom to go get that information yourself and do it. You lack that information for the most part when it comes to crypto. I mean, crypto isn't representative of anything substantial. It's literally data that's being passed around. And a lot of people have a very difficult time wrapping their heads around that. It's hard to understand why you would need something like that. Granted, you, you can have a currency that doesn't have borders. So, for instance, you know, you have the euro versus the dollar. And the euro traditionally trends a few cents higher in value than the dollar does, depending on what's going on from a political, geopolitical standpoint. But that currency itself is based on gross domestic product. It's based on manufacturing output. It, there's a measurable metric that you can look at for it. So you can kind of predict, okay, well, you know, we know that everyone's being hit by the pandemic right now. And Europe, sections of Europe are being hit worse than others. So the chances are they're, they're, uh, economy is going to be impacted by that further. So maybe now is not a good time. And I'm saying this strictly from a theoretical standpoint. I am not an investment broker or am I qualified to comment on any of this stuff. But you can see these signs, these trends, and determine that 
that might not be the investment that you want because the euro may go down as their economy is impacted. You can't do that with Bitcoin. Tomorrow, Bitcoin could lose 30% for no apparent reason. Or it could gain 30% for equally no reason. It's volatile. That is, that is <laughs> incredibly, the, the word, yeah. incredibly volatile. So why do people like cryptocurrency? Why don't you, why don't you tell us, you know, why people, what, what the appeal of cryptocurrency is? Yeah. So supporters see cryptocurrency, uh, things like Bitcoin as a currency of the future. Uh, and they're racing to buy them now before they become more valuable, which we've already seen that with going from buying pizzas to being worth, you know, 900 some billion dollars. Uh, some supporters like the fact that crypto removes central banks, uh, from managing the money supply since over time, these banks tend to reduce the value of money through inflation. So Bitcoin can't be inflated the way you, uh, normal money can. Other supporters like the technology behind crypto, uh, like the blockchain, which we talked about earlier, uh, because it's decentralized processing and recording system and can be more secure uh, than usual payment options. And then finally, some speculators like crypto because they're going up in value and have no interest in the currency's long-term acceptance as a way to move money. And that's a very good point, is that if you look at it from a long-term standpoint, it's so volatile and traded so frequently that people aren't looking at it as a long term. Like people buy Disney stock and they hold on the Disney stock for 30 years <clears throat> and they continue to, to improve, increase in value. They may get dividends from it, but ultimately it's a long term thing that someday you'll sell that and it's an investment. Whereas cryptocurrency is almost like day trading. Yeah, I'm buying it this morning because I know this afternoon, chances are it's going to be 30% higher and I'm going to make a fortune that's, off of it. That's essentially what I was doing. Me and my friends, when I talked about Dogecoin, oh, that's what we would do. We bought it and then for like a week straight, we would check every day to see what the value was. And if and you could set in the app we were using, you could set, um, I think it was called a limit order. So like if, if Dogecoin went up to 80 cents, you could have it sell then. Right. So like if we thought like, you know, Elon Musk was going to tweet about it and it would make it go up in value, which happened. A lot of people made a lot of money when Dogecoin, like when that phenomenon was happening. Sure. It's kind of stabled out now, but like it was like day trading and, and, you know, Robinhood, I know got a lot of flack for that because so much money was being dumped in that they couldn't keep up with it. And yeah. I think those, that finding came out a couple of days ago where the way Robinhood works is they, when you go into uh, and for those that don't know, Robinhood is an app where you can, you know, trade stocks and trade crypto. Um, they, when you go to buy something through them, they actually wait and basically give you an IOU so that if they can get a better value for it, they can then take that. And then you also get the stock. They take the off the top. Right. But when <laughs> the things with Dogecoin was happening, so many people were buying in and with GameStop as well, the GameStop stock situation, they didn't have enough money to keep up. <laughs> so it's like, you know, when, when the trend hits the whole world and everybody's doing it like day trading, it can cripple something like Robinhood that's just, you know, the app to the middle sure. man almost. Yeah, their 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 business model was not capable of keeping no. up with that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but one of the other things about crypto that we talk about here is that it it doesn't use a centralized bank, which mean it means it can't be influenced by governments or government regulation. So you look at how some of the economy works in the United States and you've got Federal Trade Commission that makes sure that there's no insider training and, and that uh, things are done on the up and up. You have uh, the Federal Reserve that sets interest rates. So with a traditional economy, you have a lot of outside influence. It's not just the market value. Um, a lot of it is the government trying to control the money. Part of that's inflation. You know, when the economy is bad, the government puts more currency into circulation, which devalues the currency but increases spending. And with a cryptocurrency, they don't have that control, which is one of the reasons why Russia had banned Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin could really come in and take over an economy because the government has no control over it. So... A lot of governments don't understand crypto yet, and those that do and have kind of a good understanding of it are kind of afraid of it, and with good reason. Yeah. One of the other things that we talk about here is the encryption associated with it. Well, that encryption allows you to hide transactions. So right now, we've got a big push in, in the United States 
where the federal government wants to have access to encrypted data on your phone, in your email, through your social media, uh, because they claim that without that, then they can't do their job from a law enforcement perspective. So the federal government wants access to your encrypted information on your phone. So if they get a warrant for a search warrant, they can execute it where they can't do that now. Well, they'll never be able to do that with cryptocurrency. They can't go to a manufacturer like Apple or Google and say, put a back door in or we're going to put you out of business. There's no central authority for Bitcoin. So they, they can't exercise that control. And as a result, it's very appealing to a lot of people who want to do international transactions. You know, when we do transactions with a company overseas, there's a conversion rate that happens. And that conversion makes money for someone. Some money broker somewhere skims off the top, like you talked about with Robinhood. <clears throat> with Bitcoin, it's traded at face value. Nobody skims off the top. Nobody makes a profit off of it. And generally, when no one's making a profit off of a transaction, people have a problem with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you can't have that man in the middle who's doing things. Um, but again, cryptocurrencies are speculative. There's, no, there's nothing tangible about a cryptocurrency that says, okay, well, I see that Tesla put out uh, twenty percent more cars this year than they had forecast, so their value is going to go up. There's nothing like that with crypto. It's literally just made up as it goes along, and that's something that scares off investors. So what you get is a completely different class of investors that go after cryptocurrencies. Um, as an investor myself, I'm very risk averse. You know, I will invest money in an eight percent, a guaranteed eight percent return any day over the possibility of a 15% return with a 50% chance of loss. That's just the way I am. I'll always go for the sure thing. I mean, like I've been investing a little bit. Like I don't, as you've have I've made clear by this show, I don't really understand how a lot of this stuff works. So I've been using Robinhood and, and they got in trouble for kind of gamifying it. But I like that personally, because it makes it a lot easier to understand. Um, <clears throat> and the way I've been treating it is it's, it is like gambling where you, if you're putting money in like, you have to be okay to lose it if you mess something up or like you're, you're okay having it sit there for a long time. Cause you know, a lot of stocks are like you talked about with the Disney example, a long term thing. So it's, I don't, I haven't been doing it enough to understand my, like how I do it. Um, but at least with the crypto stuff, I was doing it daily, trying to get like just the smallest amount of value out of it. Um, where it's, it's not, it's not a set 8%, you know, a guaranteed 8% return like you were talking about. So it's, it is weird seeing the comparison of, you know, play it safe, long term, long term, but with crypto, it's play it now and yeah. hope for the best. Absolutely. So I guess the real overriding question is, are cryptocurrencies a good investment? So like we said, cryptocurrencies may go up in value, but many investors see them as more speculations and not real investments. And the reason for that is it just like real currencies, cryptocurrencies generate no cash flow. So for you to profit, someone has to pay more for the currency than you did, which is called the greater fool principle. Yeah, I love that one. That's a funny name. Uh, and it's a legitimate theory for, for investing. Um, but if you contrast that to a well-managed business, which increases its value over time by growing the profitability and cash flow of an operation, ex experts note that cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin may not be that safe. And some notable voices in the investment community have advised would-be investors to steer clear of them because it's gambling. Yeah, it's I mean, just you, gambling. You hit the nail on the head. You're probably better off going to Vegas yeah. and betting, you know, five thousand dollars on black at the roulette than you aren't putting it in to cryptocurrency. Of a particular note, uh, Warren Buffett compared Bitcoin to paper checks, saying, "Quote: It's it's a very effective way of transmitting money." And you can do it anonymously and all that. A check is a way of transmitting money too. Are checks worth a lot of money just because they can transmit money? And I think that really boils it down because in order to do anything with Bitcoin, you either have to generate them through 
very complex, very costly uh, computational uh, efforts, or you need to buy them. So if you invest the money to buy them, you've paid somebody money for money. Really, yeah. it, and you're paying that conversion rate. Mm-hmm. If you generate it, then you're paying the money to actually – it's not free. Like a lot of people think that, and that's that's part of the problem is that people think that, oh, well, cryptocurrency, I can generate that. Can, I can quote, unquote, mine that on my computer. Well, I already own the computer, so it's costing me nothing. If I can mine three Bitcoin, that's a fortune. Well, you're not mining for nothing. You're paying the electric bill. You're paying to cool it because it's it generates so much heat to to do these computations. People have actually turned mining uh, computers into heaters for their homes. Oh wow! <laughs> you know what they've done is they built a computer with five or six uh, graphic processor units, high grade graphics processor units, and they channel that heat into their house, and that's how they heat their house. That's insane. I saw I saw one person who lived out in Colorado or something like that, and he actually funneled the heat from his cryptocurrency computer to a chicken coop, and that heats the chicken coop outside. Well, there you go. <laughs> but that's no different than because you're still paying yeah. to to use that power. One of the latest trends now is they're putting a lot of crypto mining farms in Alaska, so they don't have to pay for the cooling costs. So they're just pulling. Put you know, them in the ice. <laughs> yeah, they're they're pulling outdoor air in, and that's cooling these machines off. Yeah, I know there was a. This was a while ago, probably like a year ago. But the N- Nintendo Switch had a thing, the gaming console, where uh, people couldn't figure out why when they played this one game, it was like some cooking game. Why their switches kept overheating, and it was because they were using it to mine Bitcoin in the background for the game. So people's switches would overheat and turn off, and they couldn't figure out why because it's not like you know the switch is like that big. It's not like it's a you know a PS5 or something. Yeah. So people were like, "What's going on here?" And they looked into it, and it was they were mining. Bitcoin in the background when you played the game. It was insane. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary. It really is. Yeah. For those who uh, see cryptocurrency uh, such as Bitcoin as the currency of the future, it should be noted that a currency needs stability so that merchants and consumers can determine what a fair price for goods is. So let's take the instance of Tesla. So they're going to be selling a car and they're going to price the cost in Bitcoin out to what the equivalent dollar value would be. So let's say, for instance, you buy a a Tesla for $80,000. Let's say that's, for the sake of easy math, that's eight Bitcoin, all right? Say Bitcoin's at $10,000 each. Well, if Bitcoin drops in value at any point in time while you're still paying for that car, then you just got, like if it drops to 5,000, Per Bitcoin. You just paid half price for that car. What merchant is going to deal with a currency that's that volatile and that prone to have them lose money? Like it just for for Tesla to to go that route, I think, puzzled a lot of people. Do you think that it's going to end up becoming regulated if enough businesses get involved? Do you think it's just going to sidestep the government and they're just going to regulate it themselves? Especially if they have the majority of it, like a Tesla or another big corporation. Well, and uh, that's that's actually a very interesting proposition. You can't regulate it. You can't because of its decentralized nature. So even if you own the majority of it, like owning the majority of a company, you control that company. If you own the majority of Bitcoin, you can't dictate the price of Bitcoin because Bitcoin is only worth what the market will bear. So if Tesla owned 60% of the available Bitcoin out there, they could ask whatever they want. But if nobody wants to pay that value, then it's not worth that, right? Like think of selling on eBay. Oh, you know, I can put my Star Wars figures up on eBay and ask $5,000 for them. Doesn't mean they're worth 5,000 if nobody's going to buy them. <clears throat> And that's what you're looking at with Bitcoin is that you you can't derig it. So I don't know why at this point in time someone like Elon Musk would get into it if for no other reason than just for publicity. I'm pretty sure he had an SEC filing the other day where they have to call him like Crypto King now or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> Which one of my friends, it was half joking. 
But he was like, well, that's so they don't have to say he's a CEO. So when he does dumb stuff like this, he can say, well, I'm not CEO. I'm the crypto king. Right. <laughs> it's different. Right. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I, I, he does <clears throat> things like, I mean, this is the man who sold flamethrowers to to promote his boring company, his, yep. you know, his mining company. So we could do a whole show on him if we wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> he's I, like I, Tony Stark, but not <laughs> as cool. <laughs> But as we said, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have been anything but stable through much of their history. For example, while Bitcoin traded close to $20,000 in December 2017, by 2020, it was trading at record levels. Uh, I'm sorry. It uh, dropped as low as 3200 later that year. Well, that's that's 70% of your value. That's ridiculous. <laughs> To, to have a drop like that. And then by 2020, it was back at record levels again. So the price volatility creates a conundrum. Hence the title to the show. Hey, oh, See, you made circle. funny for the title. I did make Gregor. It was funny. <laughs> if Bitcoins might be worth a lot more in the future, people are less likely to spend and circulate them today. So I'm going to stop buying pizzas with my Bitcoin. I'm going <laughs> to hold on to them. <laughs> making them less viable as a currency. So think of it almost like a commodity, like gold. So gold rarely drops in, in value. And what happens is a lot of people buy gold and they hold on to it because it's a good investment because it doesn't drop in value. Nobody deals in gold as a currency anymore. It's not practical to deal in it. But because it's stable, people are going to hold on to that and use that to back other ventures. Because this is volatile and could drop or increase dramatically, people don't want to spend that because they don't want to spend $20,000 on a pizza. Even though it may only be $20 today, to, you know, a year from now it could be $20,000. So it doesn't lend itself to being used to transmit money. And finally, they say, why spend a Bitcoin when it would be worth three times that value next year? And that's exactly what they're saying. It's more an investment gimmick, I think, than it is a, a real currency. So then do you think it will go by the wayside eventually? If once if people adopt this line of thinking that it's it's, you know, not worth the effort to spend it? I think Bitcoin has a very limited lifetime to it. I think cryptocurrency in general does. I think blockchain has other practical applications that can be used for more realistic things. Uh, I think what we're seeing right now with crypto is probably a fad because it's just too unstable. Yeah. You know, people, investors don't like instability. Um, so you're going to find that it's going to, it's, it's going to probably lose its widespread adoption pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But let's take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll look at what we do think of what the future of uh, cryptocurrency is and how it's changing the world. <laughs> Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights Into Tomorrow. We're talking cryptocurrency. And as we said earlier, uh, cryptocurrency is not new. It's been around since roughly 2009 when Bitcoin was first created. Uh, but in recent years, it started to have a more significant impact on the world. Cryptocurrency has done this by changing the way various industries operate and opening up new opportunities for individuals and businesses alike. 
The creation of cryptocurrency also introduced blockchain technology to the world, which is, I think, the most significant contribution that we get from crypto. According to Statista, revenues from the technology are expected to reach more than $39 billion U.S. dollars by 2025. From these figures, it's clear that cryptocurrencies and the technology that surround them are having a major impact. Here are some of the examples of how cryptocurrencies change in the world. Why don't you tell us about these? Sure. Uh, so alternative international financial transactions, which we kind of talked about earlier with it being a borderless currency. Uh, businesses are always keen to find a way to complete international transactions in the most secure way possible. So cryptocurrency-based solutions like Ripple can help with this. Ripple operates on an open source platform and it enables the seamless transfer of both cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Litecoin and fiat money like USD and yen. I don't know what fiat money is. <laughs> fiat money is is national currency. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that was a term for it. Uh, and then finally, the main process of Ripple is payment settlement and remittance that is similar to the traditional SWIFT system, which is used by financial institutions. What is the SWIFT system also? Well, the SWIFT system we're not going to go into okay. today. That's a lot more complicated. Okay. Yeah. We'll get an economist next time to break that down for yes. us. Yes. Uh, second, more options for secure online payments. Cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology can make it easier for people to make online payments. Blockchain wallets store private and public keys that enable payments to be made securely and quickly. Also, many sites in various industries accept cryptocurrencies as a safe way for people to send and deposit money. So, for example, online gambling sites that accept cryptocurrencies are popular among young adults and in general with players due to the added security that is provided. The worldwide online payment system PayPal has also recently announced that it is going to start allowing customers to buy, sell, and hold cryptocurrencies uh, in its online wallets. PayPal was Elon Musk, right? He invented that? I believe that's where he started. That. So, yes. yeah, another Elon, he's back. <laughs> another uh, mention of him. Uh, revolutionizing supply chains. So, Bitcoin, the global economy, is reliant on secure and efficient supply chains. This makes supply chain security a major concern. The blockchain technology that enables the use of crypto can also be used to improve the security of supply chains thanks to its transparency and decentralized nature. Certain currencies like Walton Chain and V Chain, or V Chain, are specifically aimed at improving the safety and speed of supply chain operation. Providing a platform for creatives, it can often be difficult for professionals like musicians to sell content without interference from middlemen like producers. So they can use crypto like XRP uh, to allow them to sell content directly to consumers. This is because consumers can access the content and pay for it using a real-world payment solution. That's an interesting note. I never thought of that, of, of of how it can be used to actually help uh, people that might be, you know, yeah. uh, scammed by a producer or something like that. Changing the way NGOs deal with money, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, engage with crypto as a way of getting currency to underprivileged areas of the world. During the current crisis, the Red Cross in Italy has also started accepting Bitcoin donations from people in order to boost its fund and help it provide the support that people need. Uh, so using it uh, for more humanitarian efforts. Sure. And and the other thing we kind of have to make note of here is that we talk a lot about Bitcoin because that's in the in the news a lot. And Bitcoin's a form of crypto, but it's obviously not the only version. Crypto in general can be used for other different things depending on how it's generated. Like, for instance, we talked how Bitcoin has a finite number of Bitcoins that you can ever get out of the blockchain. But other currencies like Dogecoin, it's unlimited. So you can continue to generate Dogecoin, which is why the value never really soars, because there's an infinite amount of it out there. But it's also a legitimate form of, of currency because it is digitally signed through a very strong encryption. So something like that, you can easily use that to do electronic transactions back and forth online or to transfer large sums of money or, you know, things like that where you want to have secure borderless uh, transactions. That's not to say that Bitcoin's the best crypto for that, but crypto can be used for these things. It, it does away with that decentralized bank. It does away with these conversions. It does away with the regulations that you get bogged down in. One example, which is probably not a good example, is North Korea. Okay, so North Korea is under all kinds of sanctions. They can't trade, you know, tea at this point in time 
without having some kind of sanction slapped on them. But they can trade crypto mm. because it's unregulated. Yeah. There's no way to stop that. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> now, that's a bad example of that. But the good example of that is if you're in a oppressive third world regime that you're trying to fight for the freedom of the people there and the government is oppressing you. You can fund those operations through cryptocurrencies and still manage to get the funds that you need. Yeah, it sort of cuts out the the red tape and the middleman and all that to just get the, the currency where it needs to be. Exactly. I, I think personally moving forward, cryptocurrencies themselves are going to be more of a medium than they are an asset or an investment. Uh, they're going to be used for transactions. Like a lot of tra business transactions use uh, EFT fund transactions now. And you get a lot of hands touching that type of stuff through the banking industries. And I think cryptocurrencies eliminate a lot of that stuff. So I, I think the future, there's a future for cryptocurrencies. I think it's very different than what we see today. I think we're going to see them take on a different role. I think we're going to see them be used by different people for different reasons. I don't think they're going to be a viable investment anytime in the, in the near future just because of the volatility. But one of the things that we are seeing crypto use for, and again, this is, this is a different use of blockchain, is something called an NFT or a non-fungible token. And these are a type of cryptocurrency created on smart contract platforms such as Ethereum. And they're unique digital objects that can be cool to own or even profitable to trade. Like it's a World of Warcraft or something? <laughs> similar to that. Not, I mean, you joke, really? but it's similar yeah. to that. But, for instance, Elon Musk's girlfriend was just in the news because she put up $8 million in artwork as NFTs. Uh, the NBA is involved in this. You can purchase a, a non an NFT, a non fungible token of an NBA highlight, and you own that highlight, like the footage. No, just oh. the rights to the highlight. Okay, this is where it gets confusing. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of lost. Think of it as let's go back to the analogy of baseball cards. All right, so as a kid, I would buy baseball cards. You'd go out to the store, you'd buy a pack of them. You'd open them up and you see what card you got. And if you got a rookie card of somebody that you knew was good, you held on to it and it had value. I could take that to a trading card store somewhere and sell it. This is sort of the same type of thing, but you never get the card. <coughs> so, for instance, you pay for an NFT and that NFT happens to be for, I, I say Ricky Henderson because that's the only valuable baseball card I ever owned. <laughs> so. You pay for a token, a digital token for Ricky Henderson's rookie card. And that card stays in the store in the window and everyone can come by and they can look at that and, and they can gawk at it and they can ooh and on everything, but nobody can have it. They can just see it. You own it. Now you can trade it to someone else. You can sell it to someone else. You can sell that right to it, but you never actually own it. That sounds lame. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> Especially if it's like Grimes' artwork. Wouldn't you want to hang artwork like in your house? You just have a thing that says you own the artwork. You don't own the art. Well, and that's like you can have copies of it, but you own the right to that item itself. So no one else can own the right to it. It seems like a pyramid scheme or something. <laughs> and that's how it's been described. You own the a lot idea of, of art. <laughs> that's how it's been described. So, so what is fungible and non fungible? You're asking me. Yes. Oh, uh, well, conveniently enough, we have a very well produced <laughs> show notes. Cryptocurrencies can be fungible, meaning all the currencies unit, i.e., tokens, are the same and equal, like grains of rice or dollars. Non fungible tokens are the opposite. Every cryptocurrency unit or token is unique and cannot be replicated. This quote, non fungible property, can be used for many things, even certain types of currencies. But the current NFT craze is mostly fueled by digital art and collectibles, kind of like we talked about. Uh, people have figured out that a unique digital object can be interesting, cool, and even have a significant monetary value. It's why the space has recently blossomed, encompassing thousands of projects involving artworks, gaming, and sports. So how do NFTs work? So it really depends on the platform, right? So given the vast majority of NFTs that are created and traded on Ethereum, 
let's focus on that. So NFTs created on Ethereum's blockchain, which is immutable, meaning it can't be altered like we've talked about all blockchains. Mm -hmm. No one can undo your ownership of an NFT or recreate the same one. They're also, quote, permissionless. So anyone can create, buy, or sell an NFT without asking for permission. So if you are an artist, you can create your own NFTs. You don't have to license it through someone else. So how does that work with, like, the uh, NBA? So the NBA creates their NFTs oh, for okay. these highlights. Okay. And they're the only ones that can create their NFTs. Right. Gotcha. They're the authority for it. NF every NFT is unique and can be viewed by anyone, just like that card in the window. Anyone can walk by the window. So, again, it's like, a, a you know, the analogy I gave you with having a card that's forever available for people to use. I don't know why people would do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, people are doing it. There's a huge budding industry, which is why I threw it in at the end of the notes here because it kind of was an afterthought in, in my research and doing this. But I wanted to put it in here as another example of how blockchain itself is being used without it being technically a cryptocurrency. Um, and, and I guess, you know, let's take a step back and talk about um, where we think it's going to go. So we're going to take a quick break. Our last break, we'll come back and we'll talk about what the future of cryptocurrency is going to look like. <laughs> For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Investopedia.com says that the economic analysts predict a big change in crypto is forthcoming as institutional money enters the market. There's the possibility of crypto uh, will be floated on the NASDAQ, which would further add credibility to blockchain and its uses as an alternative to conventional currencies. Some predict that all crypto needs to be a verified exchange traded fund, an ETF. An ETF would definitely make it easier for people to invest in Bitcoin, but there still needs to be the demand to want to invest in crypto, which might not automatically be generated with a fund. What do you think? Where do you think we're going to go with crypto based on the discussion that we had here? What do you think its future is? Um, well, I didn't know a whole lot about it going in, and I've definitely learned a lot today. Um, so I said I'd probably agree with a lot of what you're saying is that it seems like it's the blockchain element of it seems like it's useful and can be used for lots of other things. Um, but breaking it down in terms of the actual reasons to invest in it and there not really being that many and the volatility of it too, I think unless there's a change in that and how that works, which I don't know how you do that. It seems like, you know, the, the best thing we're getting out of this is the blockchain technology. Right. Yeah, and Investopedia looks specifically at, at the outlook for Bitcoin, and they say the future outlook for Bitcoin is, the is you know, it's subject to much debate, which we kind of agreed on here. While the financial media is proliferated by so-called crypto evangelists, Harvard University professor in econom of economics and public policy, Kenneth Rogoff, suggests the, quote, overwhelming sentiment among crypto advocates is that the total market capitalization of cryptocurrencies could explode over the next five years, rising to five to ten trillion dollars, which is, you know, astronomical. 
The historic volatility of the asset class is uh, no reason to panic, he says. Still, he tempered his optimism with that of the crypto evangelist's view of Bitcoin as digital gold, calling it, quote, nutty. Yeah, that's the official economist term. <laughs> that is the official term, yeah, uh, stating its long-term value is more likely to be $100 than $100,000. Rogoff argues that unlike physical gold, Bitcoin's use is limited to transactions, which makes it more vulnerable to the bubble-like to a bubble-like collapse. Additionally, the cryptocurrency's energy-intensive verification process is vastly less efficient than systems that rely on a trusted central authority like a central bank. And I think that's that's really a great place to make that distinction: is that the value or the the Viability of a Bitcoin is in its computational authority, whereas the value of a traditional currency or stock is in its institutional authority. And being decentralized with no institutional authority, you have to rely on that encryption to to know what the value is and to know that it's a legitimate transaction. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, even this guy that we just quoted... He, he starts off with the, towards the more optimistic side saying, you know, it could be trillions of dollars in the next couple of years. But then once he thinks about it, it seems like he tempers it being like, well, it's also very volatile. And, you know, he, he say the word bubble and that kind of got me thinking of like, maybe, maybe this is a bubble. Maybe it will, maybe it has the chance to collapse. And especially with it being like, uh, so nebulous too, that it might even lend itself further to a collapse. Like, uh, you know, dot com and things like that back in, what was it, the 90s, right, when that happened? Late 90s, yeah. Yeah, so maybe, I mean, I hope that doesn't happen because it seems like it's, you know, it's it's interesting technology. I hope that it doesn't completely collapse. And if it does collapse, maybe it can come back in some way. Um, but, yeah, it just seems like overall it's better to just be safe than sorry. Sure, yeah. Um, I think, you know, we both agree that there's probably a lot more scrutiny to, yeah. be, to be paid to this. Bitcoin's main benefits of... Decentralization uh, and transaction anonymity have also made it a favorite currency for a host of illegal activities, including money laundering, drug peddling, smuggling, and weapons procurement. This has attracted the attention of powerful regulatory and other government agencies, such as the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, the SEC, and even the FBI and Department of Homeland Security. In March of 2013, when this was an infant state, here, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network issued rules that defined virtual currency exchanges and administrators as money service businesses, bringing them within the jurisdiction of government regulation. In May of that year, the Department of Homeland Security froze an account of Mt. Gox, the largest Bitcoin exchange at the time, that was held at Wells Fargo, alleging that it broke anti-money laundering laws. Um, New York's Department of Financial Services issued a, uh, subpoenas to 22 emerging payment companies, many of which handled Bitcoin, asking about their measures to prevent money laundering and ensure consumer protection. Um, so these are very real cases out there that the government fearing what you can do with this cryptocurrency, and, and they're fearing it under the guise of illegal activity. Um which is legitimate, but their fear goes a lot deeper than just illegal activity. Um, their fear goes to a lack of control, a lack of regulation. I mean, the federal government does not like things it can't regulate. Yeah, and it seems like they're, they're most likely going to use the crime angle to get their foot in the door, right, for increased regulation. And they were doing the same exact thing with encryption on your personal phones. And and even the encryption on your phones, they're taking it even a step further and they're they're hammering home this whole idea of uh, child pornography and child exploitation. And that's why, you know, let's do it for the children. Think of the children, yeah. Right. And that's that's really what they're hammering home to try to, to crack your encryption. But we're looking at the same type of thing here. So I think unregulated currencies like Bitcoin that are speculative and have a potential for high value are – much more likely to come under the scrutiny of the government than a transactional thing like Dogecoin where people are using it for legitimate things and it doesn't it doesn't have enough 
power behind it to really warrant being used for illegal activity. But again, in the end, I think it's really the technology that comes out of this that's going to be the, the winner overall. Uh, I think cryptocurrencies, are, I don't think they're going to go away anytime soon, but they're not changing the economy anytime soon. Governments just aren't going to allow them. Yeah, that's, I mean, it seems like it would be that simple, right? They could just say no. <laughs> yeah. So what are, you, what are your final thoughts on cryptocurrency? Um, well, I definitely learned a lot about it today. That was kind of nice. Um, and I hope that our viewers learned something too, if they were as clueless as I was. Um, but yeah, I mean, it seems like that it's, it's not as <clears throat> future proof as, you know, some of the jokes about it might make it seem like. Um, but you know, blockchain seems like it could be used for a lot of really good things and hopefully good things. Um, and I'm curious to see where governments take it in the next five to 10 years. If we do end up getting, you know, that trillion dollar level that that economist was talking about, how governments are going to respond to that and, and how they're going to take it seriously or, you know, try to outlaw it or ban it and, you know, around the world and, and how that's going to affect it. Um, all that is interesting to me. Um, so yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, see where it goes. Yeah. And I agree. I think, I think a wait and see attitude is probably the best. Uh, I think we should not let Elon Musk you know, people of Elon Musk's nature lead the charge on this. Um, I mean, between selling flamethrowers and launching his sportster into space for for political for uh, media gimmicks and stuff like that, uh, I don't really think he's the authority that we want to use uh, in this case here. I think it's it's probably best to, if you're interested in investing in it, I would suggest you do so very cautiously. Uh, I would not liquidate your 401k and dump it into Bitcoin. That's for sure. Um, but you know, it's speculative. Uh, there's a chance that you can make some money off of it today. Why not get in on it? Like everyone else does. If you do it smartly. So, but that's all we had today. Did you have anything else you wanted to discuss? No, I think we did it. All right. I think that is it. Uh, before we go, I would ask folks once again, to subscribe to the podcast. Audio versions can be found as Insights into Tomorrow. Video versions as Insights into Things. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, and any place you get your podcast feeds from. I would also ask you to give us your feedback. Let us know how we're doing. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We stream six days a week on Twitch when I don't have technical difficulties like this week. On Twitch, we are at twitch.tv slash insights into things. Uh, if you have a Amazon Prime membership, you do get a free Twitch Prime monthly. We would love it if you sent that our way. Helps us to uh, keep the lights on around here. And we have a lot of really bright, hot lights around here we have to keep on. Uh, we don't use it to mine Bitcoin. I promise you that. Um, you can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. We're on Instagram at insights into things. Or you can get us on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. And that's it. We're done. Another one in the books. into teens a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth talking to real teens about real teen problems explore issues from braces to puberty social anxiety to financial responsibility each week we talk about the topics concerning today's youth we look at how the issues affect teens how to cope with these issues and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com 
or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 112, Motivating Teens. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my ambitious and energetic co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. How about you? I'm, I'm doing all right. Short week this week. We had Monday off. Yep. Uh, how's your week going so far? It's going all right. Nothing too crazy going on. Oh, you had a big test today. Did you do good on that? Yep. Awesome. Uh, so today we're talking about motivating teens. Uh, in today's episode, we're going to discuss the challenges involved in motivating and keeping teens motivated. We'll look at some of the challenges of motivation for teens, and we'll talk about some of the long-term implications of a lack of motivation. And we'll take a look at a few motivational strategies that might prove effective in inspiring your teen. And finally, we'll talk about the seven secrets to motivating teens before we hear Madison's closing remarks on the subject. But before we do that, I do want to invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Teens, or you can get video versions of all the network's podcasts listed as Insights into Things. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon, and pretty much any place you can get a podcast. I would also invite folks to give us your feedback. We'd love to uh, hear how we're doing. We're looking for show suggestions, topics. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at insights underscore things. On Facebook, you can find us at facebook.com slash podcast. On Instagram, we're at instagram.com slash insights into things. Or you can get links to all these on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Ready to get started? I think I am. All righty. <clears throat> so, the challenges of motivating teens. Uh, the research for the first segment here comes from publicschoolreview.com. They say teens today are confronted with new and unfamiliar issues when compared with teenagers in any recent or long-term long past. Many parents struggle to identify the catalyst or strategies to stimulate and motivate their teens. Many parents struggle to connect with their kids because their experiences are so far from most adults' uh, frame of reference. Today's teens are faced with choices and circumstances their parents didn't face. They live in a world where it requires a security badge to enter a high school in some cases, where we never face that as, as kids, mm -hmm. where they compete scholastically with uh, other students with a 4.9 GPA, where classmates cheat using cell phone technology and where world events and economic issues make it scary to comp contemplate the future. A loss or lack of motivation in teens is often symptomatic of far greater issues, such as a lack of self-confidence, a lack of self-esteem, and so forth. Parents are challenged to boost teens' feelings of enthusiasm and drive in an ever-evolving environment of challenges where there are long-term consequences to a lack of motivation. So with that broad opening statement and the challenges both teens and parents face, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the greatest, how would you measure your motivation 
scholastically at this point in time? Um, I'd say probably 9.5. That's pretty motivated. Yeah, um, a lot of that is more or less the self-pressure that I put on myself for it. Um, and other times it's the my creative side, and other times it's just wanting to get a good grade or the influence you guys have on me. What do you think are some of the key demotivational factors that teens face today? Um... Probably the feeling of laziness, procrastination being the main thing, because that's pretty much the opposite. Pretty much, if you have procrastination, you're not entirely motivated during. Why that do time. today what I can put off until tomorrow? Yeah, that's basically yeah. kind of what I'm pretty sure is one of the main causes, along with the ones you mentioned. Um, cause teens to lack motivation. Now, is that something that you yourself experience from time to time, despite the fact that you are as motivated as you are? I definitely say I don't think I suffer from it scholastically. There are maybe some instances that I, that might happen. Um, uh, but I definitely suffer from it in pretty much most other facets except my academics, which, like, we had, like... It was kind of funny. We had a journal entry for ELA where we talked about procrastination and how we feel about how we procrastinate and things we procrastinated on. And when I, fi when I finally looked at it, I realized I pretty much procrastinate on almost everything else besides school, and that's probably kind of the opposite to most teens. Well, and that's a good thing, but what are some of the things that you tend to procrastinate on? Um... Probably my own self-projects that I like to make. Um, I've mentioned before how I like doing art and movie making and writing stories. A lot of that is sometimes the things I procrastinate on. Other times it's my chores. Um, especially can, especially laundry um, because you're kind of waiting for it. And right. a lot of times I might not be motivated to flip the laundry, but I still try to keep a con as it as consistent as I can. So in these instances where you do get demotivated, it sounds mostly like it's chore based or, or, you know, hobby based demotivation. Do you f suffer any consequences from being demotivated in those situations? Um, I mean, for chores, I probably get a talk from you guys or laundry misses you because I mean, you haven't done that in a little while, but you really, you always mention to me, hey, maybe you should check the laundry. And it used to be the phrase, laundry misses you, and honestly, that was kind of um, what, you know, you would say. Um, well, and to help that along, we did wind up buying new uh, washing, a new washer and dryer that actually, like, notifies you. <laughs> You know, when yeah. when laundry needs to be flipped. So it's I kinda had to stop doing that at that point. Yeah, true. Um, for the creative aspect, I guess the consequences is just the fact that I'm not putting out as much of the content I would have and I'm really kind of losing track on projects and like I start new projects when I haven't finished older ones. So I kinda get this self the consequence of, hey, maybe you should finish this, and without that motivation to finish it, it will never be finished, and thus I will never be able to see it completed. Gotcha. Well, that makes sense. So let's talk a little bit about what it, what happens when you lack motivation and what some of the long-term implications are. Why don't you tell us about that? So experts suggest most of the problems of education are problems of motivation. When a child is self-motivated, the teacher cannot keep them from learning. Students who lack motivation often display a gap between their abilities and their academic output and effort. While this can appear at a very young age, including many elementary grades and ages, the lack of motivation is most strongly evident as students transition from middle school to from middle and high school. As students lose motivation at a young age, their inability to perform and their desire to achieve becomes a learning behavior, a learned behavior. 
Uh, these students are often labeled as underachievers, resulting in a student's loss of self-esteem and confidence. A highly intelligent teen may be denied entrance into honor classes and urged to take either general or vo vocational vocational classes because of la of a lackluster middle school performance. Such a situation easily becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. When an adolescent lacks motivation, the end result is often a teen lacking self-confidence, a teen with a bad attitude, or, per or perhaps even a teen with behavioral problems. With behavior problems. When parents are confronted with issues relating to teens' behavior and motivation, there's a variety of expert suggested strategies to help boost students' performance and attitude. So... It's interesting that they talk about this largely in the form of scholastic consequences. Uh, when I was in high school, my last two years in high school, uh, I had been labeled as uh, an underachiever myself. And I was scholastically, but there were a number of factors that went into that that caused that. One being the fact that I, my father was sick with cancer and, and I spent a number of days out of school taking him to uh, doctor's appointments and so forth. Uh, the other one was the classes that I enjoyed, like my business classes and such, and my computer classes, I was very motivated and I excelled in those. It was the other classes, you know, English wasn't really a strong subject for me and the math classes weren't strong subjects for me. So I kind of backed off on those somewhat. Um, and sort of dedicated myself towards the stuff that I knew was going to be career path type of things for me. Um, with this in mind, are there subjects that you have that you don't feel you're particularly motivated in where there are other subjects that you're more motivated in? Um, um I'd probably say that, hmm. Hmm. I've never really thought about it like that. Um, because you're in all honors classes going into high school, pretty much all the ones you could be in. Yeah. So you're obviously motivated to a certain extent to to be in all of those. But is there a particular subject that you're not that motivated in that you take because you have to? Maybe. Um. That's what French class was for me. French, I had to, I had to, you had to take a year of foreign language. And I didn't want to take any foreign language because I didn't think I was going to need it. But you had to pick one. And ironically enough, I picked French not because I had any type of affinity for it, but because there was this girl that I liked who was in French class. And I had hoped to get in her class. But so many people had taken French class the year I took it that they split it into two groups and she wasn't in my group. So hmm. <laughs> kind of. That plan kind of backfired on me. Um, I guess maybe, um, I'm not, see, I really don't know. Like, it would, it's between, I guess, ELA and math somewhat. Okay. Like, I feel as though I'm slightly more motivated in math than I am in ELA. Not to say that I'm not motivated in ELA, it's just... Technically, it's the only class I have right now that's not an advanced, for 8th grade at least. Um, so I'd probably maybe go with ELA because there are definite, there are, like, mm, maybe not. I, I really don't know. So you're equally motivated in all your classes, then you're saying? F for the most part, maybe like... Even gym class? Well, I mean... <laughs> I could pick that one right out of a hat. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I still, you know, do the work for gym class. Right. I guess maybe because I don't actually really enjoy physical activity. I can probably, s and that is not really one of my most important classes. Like, I still make sure I get the assignments turned in and I get motivated to do the exercises that um, they need us to do. But really, I'm guessing at this point i'm kind of just doing the bare minimum and and that's that's really what demotivated people do they get the job 
done at the at the at the bottom of the the requirement level. So let's take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll talk about the motivational strategies that teens can try. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today we're talking teen motivation. So there's four basic, uh, I don't know what you call them, strategies, philosophies for motivation that the article talks about. The first is self-motivate. Many experts assert that teens are most strongly encouraged and supported when they are forced to motivate themselves. Teens can learn how to motivate themselves by engaging in student clubs, groups, or organizations that foster positive peer influence solutions. For example, some clubs focus on interests that may connect with a teen's desired future career. In this case, students can determine their interests and goals and then can simultaneously encounter clearer catalysts that drive their motivation and focus. If a student realizes he or she needs to attend college in order to achieve his or her dream, then the teen may encounter a new self-motivation to strive and succeed in school. Now, this is clearly the, the field or the category that you're in with self-motivation. Would you agree? I would think so. Now, do you feel that you're motivating yourself with long-term goals in mind or just to be as good as you can right now in your, in your classes? I think it should, it's kind of a combination of both. A lot of it is definitely like, hey, you should really make sure that you get all A's um, in school because you need to keep up the record and such. But another part is that, hey, you're going to be going into high school and higher grades. You're probably going to be going into college. Academics is important. You need to keep up the good work. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and I would assume that it would be a kind of a multifaceted approach the fact that you are looking at the long-term goals i think is a, a testament to your planning skill at this point what's the next thing that we have the next thing we have is camps and courses in addition to teens engaging in clubs and activities that stimulate a self-motivated self-motivation process, there are also many summer camps and teen-based courses. These may focus on teaching teens the basics of independence, of independent living, such as budgeting, handling a checkbook, uh, obtaining a car loan, finding and maintaining an apartment, using credit wisely, and community participation. By teaching teens the more important and complex lessons of life after high school, many teens are able to realize how their current choices impact their long-term success. As a result, teens are again able to learn how to self-motivate with the guidance of expert sources and opportunities. And one of the things that I've heard high school kind of criticized about, and a lot of parents you know, I've talked to have, have had the same criticism, and that's the fact that high school doesn't get you ready to live in the real world. And, and by that, I mean these um, basic things like this, like, like keeping a budget or managing a checkbook or going to get a car loan. You know, how do you go get an apartment? How do you sign a lease on an apartment? Like these things aren't really dealt with in high school. So when teens encounter these things in um 
camps and courses and stuff like that that don't normally cover the stuff in high school, it then they can then see what that end goal looks like. So when you go through and you learn how to balance a checkbook, it teaches you so many different things about budgeting and what it's like to pay bills and, and knowing that if you only have X number of dollars coming in, you can't spend more than that, you know, or else the budget's not going to work out. Mm -hmm. um, so camps like that. Now, you've done camps, but your camps, your your summer camps have been more along the lines of recreational, except for last year, though. Last year, you did a couple of online camps that were... They were recreational, but there was an educational aspect to them. How did those camps work out for you? They worked out kind of, they actually worked out pretty well. There was this one science camp that was a, that I was a part of where they were doing various science experiments that you could do at home. And they not only did the cool science experiments, but they also taught you the physics of it and how exactly the experiment was able to go. Now, was that something being was that being a part of that was that something that helped to motivate you more in the science side of things when you went back to school i mean it definitely gave me um an appreciation for science and i'd always kind of been a science nerd in a way um i always did find science quite fascinating um and um I did enjoy, and doing science now and doing it at the start of the year, I did enjoy science and I've tried to um, take in all the information I can. And, you know, a lot of that, I definitely think it did give me a bigger appreciation for science. So it sounds like that probably helped to keep the motivation going over the summer where, you know, we wouldn't normally be doing science-y type things unless we go to museums or something. Yeah. So the next thing that they talk about is mentor programs. Many public high schools have implemented mentor programs for students where high-achieving students volunteer to support students who are struggling. Oftentimes, these mentors can help fellow teens with homework or can just serve as a troubled teen's friend and companion as a mentor can. Uh, as a, I'm sorry, as a mentor can help a teen to constructively work through problems, discuss issues, and pressure that students discuss issues and pressures that students encounter in an out. Boy, I'm having a hard time reading this script today. <sighs> a mentor can help a teen to constructively work through problems, discuss issues and pressures that students encounter in and outside of school and so forth. This avenue is a positive alternative to forcing students to deal with struggles on their own, especially when parents are finding it difficult to connect with your teen. Now, given your scholastic achievement at this point in time, I would expect under this system, you would probably be more of a mentor rather than someone who would be mentored. What do you think? I definitely actually would probably agree with that. Um... I have younger friends, and a lot of times whenever they were having issues, whether it be scholastically or emotionally, like they got into a fight, I would normally be the one who would help them with a problem they didn't understand or help them resolve a conflict. Um, I also remember that in sixth grade, um, that we act there could actually... Um, I've definitely... There was actually a certain mentor role that you could take, and I took it a couple of times, and I definitely feel as though I would make a good mentor. Now, do you, in your experience in, in mentoring other kids, do you find that they were more motivated through the process itself? Um, I definitely made sure to try and motivate um, anyone that I helped. I wouldn't, like... It was kind of how you would sometimes help me, like if I had a, there was a problem I didn't understand. You'd help me work through it, not directly give me the answer, and then I'd let them be motivated and use that to at least hopefully motivate them to find the answer on their own. That's a very good point. The old adage of teach a man to fish and don't just give him the fish, right? Yep. What's the last one that we have? The last one we have is honoring and encouraging. Parents can also support. Uh, 
parents. Apparently, I'm not the only one today. <laughs> yeah, I'm also having a pretty hard time with the script. <clears throat> Parents can also support unmotivated teens by helping their teenager identify their strengths and abilities. In doing so, parents should sim- simultaneously simultaneously encourage their teens' in- achievements while supporting their teenager with enthusiasm and optimism. If we if we are to motivate adolescents to learn what it is the what is in the uh, curriculum what is in the curriculum. We must honor their learning styles, help them discover their unique abilities, and give them an appro- a <laughs> <laughs> and give them appropriate tools for successful achievement. You know, I'm glad I'm not the only one who's struggling with this script today. I don't know what it is. Maybe I wrote it up wrong. Maybe it's the format or what. <laughs> Usually we're we're much better than this. Yes. So yes, honoring and encouraging. So if we want to motivate our teens, you have to you have to do it in a manner in which there is recognition. Um, you know, when you do something well, like for instance, you bring home A's in, in, in all of your subjects uh, at the end of a marking period, you get a reward for that. Do you find that reward motivating? Definitely. Um, not only, like, of course... The main motivating factor is me pushing myself, but the smaller reward of you guys congratulating me is definitely something that encourages me to keep going. And it's important to be to be nurturing in how you motivate people. It's not just a matter of patting people on the back when they do something good, but if they fail to achieve one of their goals. Like, for instance, if you don't get an A on a test, you know, it's a, I we don't come down on you we don't yell at you we don't punish you if you don't do well what we try to do is figure out why you didn't do well and focus on that and improve that so it's a it's a manner of yes you did great here's a pat on the back keep up the good work or you didn't do well you fell short of the goal let's okay this is why it happened Let's go back and restudy. Let's let's go over what the material was. Let's figure out why we failed. And let's prepare you so that the next time that you encounter this, not only will you know that material, but the next set of material that you're introduced to, you'll know how to study better. Because as you continue to grow, your, your brain is changing. And your ability to re- retain knowledge and how you retain knowledge is evolving. So how you learned five years ago is very different than how you're going to learn today or five years from now. So as parents, it's important for us to help you recognize those changes and how to learn how to learn when it comes to scholastics. Mm -hmm. Do you find that mommy and daddy are encouraging when it comes to motivational things like that? Yeah, you guys are definitely one of the larger motivating factors. Um, You always say, try your best, and usually my best is bringing out A's. Of course, you don't, like, force me to get A's, and you don't get upset entirely if I get B's. Um, So, I definitely say that you guys are very motivating, and a lot of what, um, why I try bringing home A's is thanks to you guys. So, I definitely think you guys are pretty big motivating factors. Now, are there any areas where mommy and daddy can improve how we motivate you? Um, I don't really think so. Um, like I said, a lot of the motivation comes from what I, my expectations of me are. Your expectations are actually significantly lower than mine. Um, so... And your motivation tactics are fine. I don't think you really need to improve too much on them. So there's one facet you really don't need to worry about. Okay. Well, good. I'll stop worrying about it then. (laughs) We're going to take another break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about the seven secrets of motivating teens. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our 
husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights in the Teens. Today we're talking about motivation. And now we're going to be discussing the seven secrets to motivating teens. And this information comes from a website called understandingteenagers.com. Um, so the first one we have is what, what's in it for me? This is the most important motivation learning... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. This is the most important motivational... <sighs> this is the most important motivational ingredient of them all. If your teen does not understand what the task has to do with them or their well-being, then it will be a struggle for them to find the desire to carry it out. Teenagers long to feel significant. They want to demonstrate to themselves and the world that they matter and are capable of making a difference. Many of the problems teens encounter today is because their desire to be significant is ignored or, dis or diminished. If your teenager understands the value of them... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> if your teenager understands the value to them of the task, you will have, uh, you will have little problem motivating them to do it. It's important to note that making their parents' life easier is typically not a high-value motiv high motivator for teens. Your teenager might not see how vacuuming the carpet makes any difference to their life. So maybe this wasn't the best chore for them if you can't help them find value in it. Give your teen chores that they will see the value in doing. So, all right, let me ask you, how important on a scale of 1 to 10 is... What's in it for you and your motivation? I would definitely say, um, for my motivation, I kind of keep it around a five, six ish range. All right, so it's not dominating, but it's significant, right? Yeah, like a lot of it isn't entirely like what's in it for me. Part of it is, and part of it's just like either. The well-being of it, the fact that it'll make you guys happy, um, or just the fact that I feel like doing it. Okay, I'll buy that. So the second thing that we have is let them have a say. If your teenager feels like all they're being asked to do is to fit into your agenda, your timetable, and conform to your way of doing things, they're not going to be terribly motivated. When parents give the reason, because I told you so... They create a demotivating environment. Developmentally, teenagers are seeking to establish themselves as their own person, independent from their parents. Give your teenager a say in what and how things are done. If your teenager has had a say in setting the agenda and the timetable, they will be much more motivated to participate. Is this true? Do you feel more motivated to participate if you have a say in what you're doing? I mean, yeah, probably um, in certain things when I'm given a say, I'm a lot more motivated in um, doing something because I get the chance to pipe in about it. Um, and I definitely think that could be for other teens as well because they get to um, pick what they want to be motivated in and basically having a say in doing something definitely gives them the motivation that they really want to do that one particular uh, one particular thing makes sense 
So the next one we have is let them learn from failure. When parents constantly step in step in and rescue their teens from failing, they undermine their teenager's ability to grow up. No parent wants to see their kids fail. But it, it but it's but it is through failure that we grow and learn it to improve. The, what gives a task significance is the consequences or what it or what is at stake if it doesn't get done. When parents pre- prevent teens from experiencing the consequences of failure, they rob a task of its significance and hence their teenager's motivation to do better next time. If your teen is responsible for taking the trash out every week and they don't get it done, then they become responsible for managing the mess and overflowing bins for the following week. They will learn more from this than by a parent repeatedly nagging them at 11 p.m. the night before or doing it for them. Similarly, if your teen chooses not to study for an exam and fails, they are more likely to be motivated next time. Parents can maximize these opportunities by asking questions rather than giving lectures. Discuss with your teen how they feel about the outcome, what they might do differently next time, and ask if there is anything they need from you to help them. So what is our family philosophy on failure? Mistakes are... It's okay to make mistakes as long as you learn from them. Right. And you'll learn more from your mistakes than you will from your successes. So with that in mind, how do do mommy and I handle failures with you? you, Are we there as a safety net to prevent you from failing? Or do we kind of let you go down that path and figure it out yourself and then help you along the way? You definitely help me to at least prevent me not to fail, but when I do end up failing, you do definitely um, chime in and make sure you ask me questions on how will I prevent this in the future. So Yeah, and and there aren't that many failures that you have that you can learn from, so (laughs) there's not too many instances to, to really educate yourself and motivate from there. Yeah. But that's a good thing, though, right? Yep. So number four is to help them to remember, which I'm really the least qualified person in the world for that because my memory is terrible. It's not always the case that teenagers don't do things because they're not motivated. Often they fail to follow through simply because they forget. I'm guilty of that on a regular basis myself. (laughs) The reality is teenagers, particularly younger ones, are hardwired to forget. Their brains are reforming and haven't yet got all the bits joined up. With all the stuff going on in their life, it's very easy for teenagers to get distracted and forget. They need help to remember what they committed to do and to get organized. It's important to point out that constant verbal reminders for parents, also referred to as nagging, is not the solution. If you nag your teenager, you make it about your agenda and about keeping you happy. This does not help your teenager's motivation. In fact, nagging is a great demotivator. Teaching your teens to be organized and remember is part of what parents need to do. Work with your teen to develop methods of remembering that don't require you to be involved. Use visual aids, uh, such as charts, color-coded rosters, or timetables, and place them in obvious places. Help your teen create routines in their weeks that help them to establish patterns. Leave little hints around the house about a task that needs to be completed. Get them to use an app or a program on their computer, phone, or tablet as part of the reminding process. Now, being guilty of having a terrible memory myself, I'll tell you that I am always looking for new things to help me remember. Usually, mommy is... You know, my phone is my first secondary memory, and then mommy helps to reinforce all that stuff because mommy doesn't forget anything. Um, so she usually tends to keep keep me in line with the things that I need to do when I forget about things. How are we with you and remembering? First of all, how are you at remembering things? And then how are mommy and daddy at helping you to remember? So for remembering things... I don't think I'm as bad as you, but I'm not as good as mommy. 90-year-old senile 
men are not as bad as me. So I think you're okay there. I mean, I still have problems with remembering. Um, there are many instances where I forget things um, or, you know, just lose them over time and I don't really remember them until they're brought up again and I have to try and remember them. Um, so with you guys and helping me remember... Um, Kind of like you hinted at, mommy is more or less where I go if I need to remember something. Yeah, mom, mommy is really the, the the supplemental brain that we all need here. Now, do we do we nag you, or is it more helpful than nagging? I'd say you don't nag me anymore. I would kind of consider laundry misses you being nagging, and. While I still did it, it definitely did not put me in a good mood whenever you said it. You're absolutely right. But I was doing that deliberately, too, just to yeah. you know, poke, poke a stick, stick in, in your cage. cage. Yep, that's what I do. Yeah. You'd be surprised how motivational it can be having a stick poked in your cage. Mm. Try doing that to a lion sometime and see how that works out for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the next thing we've got? The next thing we have is make it achievable. Sometimes it's the size of the task that teenagers find hard. It isn't that they don't want to do it, but rather that they don't know where to start and it all looks too hard. If your teen is putting off getting started, it can sometimes be helpful to sit down with them and to find out how they are feeling about getting it done. Do they know where to start? Do they feel like they will never be able to do it? so they can't but so they can't be bothered starting maybe they feel scared about failing whatever the reason offering to help your teen think through a process for giving for, eh, for getting the job done could be just the thing they need break the task up into a series of smaller achievable tasks with shorter deadlines teenagers often struggle with long-term planning but respond well to more in, intimate ta- immediate, immediate. Immediate time horizons. By helping your teen come up with a series of small steps, you empower you empower them to work their way through the task. Now, this sounds very much in line with our philosophy around here. You know, break a big task into smaller tasks. Go for the low hanging fruit first, and get all the stuff done that you can get done quickly. And then we'll go back and we'll figure out how we're going to do everything else. It's about organization, right? Mm-hmm. How organized do you think you are, and how do, how do you think that level of organization helps to motivate you to get things done? I'd say I'm decently organized, and I would say that the organization can definitely be a good motivating factor, especially in projects. Um, I take it one step at a time with projects, um, and I... And if there is something I'm somewhat struggling on, I skip it and go to the next part that I need to work on, kind of similar with quizzes and tests. Right. Um, I try to keep an organized balance between them all. That's good. That's, uh, that's the best way to do it. So number six is provide incentives. We kind of talked about this. We touched on it a little bit earlier. This is a more specific example of what's in it for me philosophy, but it's worth spelling out separately. As mentioned earlier, not all tasks have an obvious intrinsic consequence that can be used as motivation. Some school assignments are just there to be done, and some chores don't seem to make a great deal of difference to the immediate quality of life. Even more importantly, some tasks can't be linked to larger outcomes in a way that motivates a teenager. For teenagers who lack confidence and or natural ability, The motivation to do better in certain subjects at school can be very hard to find. Likewise, for the teen who is not naturally coordinated or athletic, the motivation to participate in physical activity can be hard to find. I feel targeted. (laughs) (laughs) For these types of instances, providing an additional incentive can help generate motivation when otherwise there would be none. By offering rewards for effort, improvement, or participation, you reinforce in your teenager the values of trying and perseverance rather than rewarding the act of giving up or resigning. Learning what your teenager's love language, which we'll talk about in a future podcast, learning what your teenager's love language is can be a great help in this regard. 
We'll discuss the concepts and principles of love language in a future podcast, but basically knowing what your team best responds to is important. Does your team respond well to encouraging words, gifts, quality time, physical affection, or some other form of affirmation? Knowing what type of incentive your team will respond to best will increase their motivation and responsiveness. What motivates you the most that we, what reward that we give you? Um. Cold, hard cash? <laughs> um, I guess it would be a mixture of encouraging words, uh, quality time in some instances, um, and, you know, maybe actually. And money. Yeah, and money. Cash is definitely in there somewhere. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's a there's a tangible reward. When you, if that motivates you to do as well as you do, then it's entirely worth it. Because you, you, you do excellent in school. I, we don't have any complaints about you as a student at this point. If that's because you get paid for every A you bring home every marking period, then so be it. You know, that's there to motivate you, and it seems to be working. What's the last one that we have? The last one we have is make it fun. This motivational principle applies to people of all ages, not just teens. Most people are more motivated to do something fun rather than something boring. Fun is the key ingredient to getting teens active and motivated to participate in social activities. If you want your teen to get out of the house, get active, and make new friends, then explore with them what activities it is they enjoy doing and encourage them to do it. Remember, what you enjoy may not be what your teen enjoys. Make sure, uh, be sure to, f to show interest and value whatever it is that your teen considers interesting and fun. Teenagers, particularly boys, respond to competition. No matter how men... Mental, the task. Menial. Menial. Uh, the task could be mental, too, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> No matter how menial the task, any job can be transferred into a passion-filled activity if there is a competitive aspect involved. Competition doesn't always require having others to compete against. Something, sometimes young people respond to the challenge to do better, to better their own previous efforts. If your teenager can learn something by playing games, watching a movie, or searching the internet, then encourage them to do it. Using technology as a part of any task makes it instantly more appealing to young people today. Yeah, and I think you kind of have to be careful with the competitive aspect of things because a lot of times when teens get involved in competitive things, most competitions have a winner and a loser, and being the loser can be a very demotivational thing. And that drives over competitiveness. So instead of it being a fun exercise, it becomes a vicious cutthroat, I have to win at all costs type of exercise. And then you're getting into teaching the wrong values to, to teens at that point. Don't you agree? Mm -hmm. So how important is it for you for activities to be fun? Do you find fun activities more appealing or motivating for you to get involved in? Yeah, and I've noticed that with certain projects, particularly the ones that where I do art in, I definitely feel a lot more motivated than something where I have to study like 186 flashcards that's for a, a test. That's a very good point there. If it's something that you enjoy, there's a natural motivation there for you to do it at that point in time until you run into the situation where you're doing too many fun projects and some of them are falling by the wayside and you're not following up on them, then you need to motivate yourself to organize those projects a little more cohesively. Yeah. So that was all we had as far as the research went. We're going to take a quick break, come back, and we'll get your closing remarks. Okay. Go for your closing remarks. Alright, so to everyone out there, I wanted to say that teen motivation is very important. Having your, teams be, eh, having your teens be motivated is one of the most important assets to them. And it will and there are definitely some difficulties and challenges that will come from trying to motivate your teens. It will, not all of the things we listed will apply to your teen, 
So you might want to just try out some of them. If they work, great. If they don't work, try something else. Um, I would definitely say that it is very important to keep teens motivated because there are definitely instances where demotivation can have very big consequences. Sage words as always. I thank you. Do you find yourself any more motivated now than before this podcast started? Um. Not really, huh? <laughs> No, it's okay. It wasn't meant to motivate you. It's okay. It was for the audience's sake. <laughs> Um, that's all we had today. Before we go, uh, I do want to uh, invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. Audio versions are available as Insights into Teens. Video versions of all the network's podcasts are listed as Insights into Things on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, any place you can get a podcast. Uh, also, uh, if you can, email us. Give us some show, some, uh, show suggestions. We're looking for new topics. Tell us how we're doing. Give us some feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get high-res versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. We do stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you are a Amazon Prime subscriber, you do get a free Twitch Prime monthly subscription. We'd appreciate it if you threw that our way. Audio versions of the podcast can be found online at podcast.insightsintoteens.com. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash insightsintothingspodcast and Instagram at instagram.com slash insightsintothings or you can get links to all those in all of our podcasts at our website at www.insightsintothings.com and you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights into Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother, Sam. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye. into entertainment a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom we'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week we'll talk about theme park and pop culture news We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights and Entertainment. This is episode 112, Star Wars Return of... George Lucas. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my cosmopolitan and sophisticated co host, Michelle Whalen. Where's my drink? <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing today, dear? I'm doing fantastic.
long, short week. Oh my God. I hate them. Yeah. I really do. Still got the same amount of work you're going to get done in one less day. Yeah, exactly. So Friday Eve, we're, yep. we're getting there. There we're you go. We're getting there. So in today's episode, <clears throat> in our Disney Detective, we're going to talk about Disney World having a massive sinkhole where all my money goes. <laughs> right. And Disney World opts out for a 50th anniversary celebration with zero nostalgia. Mm-hmm. That should be interesting. Yeah. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, Fox Memo Surface from 1976. And could George Lucas be returning to Star Wars? Dun, dun, dun. In our entertainment <laughs> news, Taika Waititi and Tessa Thompson wind up in some hot water. And good night, my captain. Then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. But before we do that, I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of the podcast listed, listed as insights into entertainment. You can also get video versions of all the network's podcasts listed as insights into things. Both are listed on Google, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, Pandora, etc., etc. I would also invite folks to contact us, give us your feedback, tell us how we're doing. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. On Twitter, we are at insights underscore things. You can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. We are on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things, or you can get links to all those on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. But no Ginsu knives. No Ginsu knives. Not no, this week. No Ginsu Maybe knives. Maybe next time. You never know. Are we ready? Sure. So before we get started. Right. I was right. I was wondering. We, I didn't put it in the show notes. I, I was waiting. <laughs> I was going to be like, right. So why don't you <laughs> why don't you introduce what we're about to show? So this was something that we had talked about a couple of weeks ago that was going to be returning, um, and that is the New Jersey Renaissance Fair uh, that is held in is that Bordentown? Yeah, I think it's Bordentown. Yeah, yeah. I think it's Bordentown. Um, it's been at the same location for about eleven years, I think. 10 or 11 wow, that years? Long, really? I think so. Wow. I think it's been um, been there. Because um, we've been going since it started. Right. Because <clears throat> we had gone that one 